36. We jumped a bit over a thousand light years, Nellie reported. The Sisu is 400,000 kilometers ahead of us, accelerating at 2.1. No, make that 2.0. Correction, she's down to 1.9 G's acceleration, the Musashi chief reported from sensors. Someone's engines are hot, Senior Chief Benny Retired reported. Hold it three G's, Captain Drago ordered. We'll overtake her carefully. Wouldn't do to be too close if she blows her reactors. Captain Admiral... Chief Benny said, his voice even, careful but intent. I have radio traffic in system. I think it's coming from a planet closer to the sun, but I've also got reactors, thermonuclear reactors with an alien radar signature. Where? Came in two-part harmony from Chris and Captain Drago. The alien-type reactors are all the way on the other side of the system. There's a gas giant with a major moon and ring system. The reactors are orbiting that giant. Any make on the reactors? Chris asked. They appear to be like the first batch you tangled with, the ones my son fought. That made it personal. We'll handle those other situations when we finish with Samson, Chris said, running all the complications that had suddenly appeared through in her mind. She had a subordinate who had mutinied against her and stolen a ship. She had a newfound world with a civilization at least at the early electromagnetic stage, and she had bug-eyed monsters. Dear God, Chris almost prayed, do I deserve all of this on the same plate? God did not answer her question, smart of her, no doubt. Hurriedly, Chris filed the new alien and the old alien away in an ever-growing box marked to be opened later and fixed her sights ahead on the ship well out of range. It fled from them. They pursued faster. The range closed inexorably. Sisu, cease your acceleration or you will be fired upon, Chris ordered, as the renegade came into extreme range. You wouldn't dare fire on a neutral flag, Samson shot back. Skanda isn't part of your old man's bunch of political patsies. The Skanda ships are under my command, Chris said. However, I don't think you're up to date on my latest wild goings-on. I fired on a Helvetican flag freighter at M688, I have yet to add a Scandian to my collection. Don't mind if I do, though. You're crazy, Samson shot back. You are in violation of orders. Cease acceleration and surrender your ship. You're a fine one to talk about violating orders. Tell me, Carolyn, which engine do you want me to shoot out? Both your reactors are running in the red. Which one can better take a hit? I really don't want to kill anyone, but I will not have you running away. Do you know there were aliens in this system? Aliens came in a several-part harmony from voices not heard from before on net. Yeah, I know we've got a mud ball down there with low-tech stuff. And a dozen alien raiders, too. They're on the far side of the system, but no doubt they'll be headed this way as soon as they get a good look at you. You said we wouldn't have to worry about those bloodthirsty-type aliens, came through the net hookup. And we won't. They can't catch us, Samson's voice cracked as she spoke. Their acceleration just fell off to 1.8 Gs, Chief Benny announced. How are you going to outrun the aliens when your reactors are going down on you, Carolyn? Chris asked. She's right. We can't keep this up, said a very scared voice. She wouldn't dare fire on us. <laughs> now Samson sounded frantic. We are overtaking the Sisu, the navigator said. We will soon be in range of those 18-inch pulse lasers. Did you hear that? Chris said. My navigator is warning me that you're slowing down so much that I'm at risk of overtaking you, even passing you. If I do that, Samson will get a shot at our stern. I can't allow that. I'll have to shoot out your reactors before then. Damn it, Samson, came in a tense voice on net. You swore those guns would make us invulnerable. Now that long knife dame says she's going to blow out our reactors because of them. Shut up! Samson shrieked. Shut up yourself, came right back at her. Drago grinned. And we thought we had a leadership challenge from that gal, he said softly. Listen, Long Knife, you let us go. No can do, Samson. Even if I were crazy enough to consider that for a moment, there's the minor matter of the aliens on the other side of this system. I'm told they're already getting underway and are headed this way. 
You think you can get out of this system before they get to you? You think with your red-hot engines you can outrun them? Chief Benny looked rather startled to hear that the aliens were headed this way when he hadn't announced it. Still, he reported, They've fallen off to 1.7 G's acceleration. Slow to 1 G, Captain Drago ordered. With the momentum already on the boat, the wasp continued to close, but not at the eye-blinking speed it had been. I will fire in five, Chris began. Four, three, two. There was noise of a scuffle on the Sisu's comlink. Don't shoot. We've got Samson under control. Take all acceleration off the boat, Chris ordered. Kill the engines? Someone over there demanded incredulously. We better before they kill us, someone else answered. The wasp flipped ship and went to 3G's deceleration. Strung out behind the wasp were the other ships of the squadron. Most had not put on the high acceleration needed to catch up so quickly. Now they closed even as they flipped ship and began to decelerate. All these ships matching velocity vectors would no doubt be fun to watch. Chris, never actually having had command of a ship, could watch it with fascination. But she didn't miss when Jack began to head his egg off the bridge. She followed him. Where are you going, General? I've got a ship to board, he said. Can't you delegate it? After all, you are a brigadier general. When was the last time anyone boarded a ship making 800,000 clicks an hour? Chris made a face. Never, I think. You don't delegate that kind of job. I'll be careful, trust me. The entire crew of the Pinnace and my marine company will be careful. The Musashi company got to land at the pyramid. My team gets this land, and fair is fair. You'll be careful? That's what I said. No, I mean you, be careful. Of course. That's wife to husband, you know. Yes, I know, hun, he said, smiling. In the eggs, you couldn't give a goodbye hug and kiss. Damn the things anyway. The pinnace pulled away from the wasp, taking a third of the ship's reactors with it. It matched speed with the sisu, and two sailors maneuvered a connecting tube between the ship's main hatches. Ten minutes later, the two ships pulled well apart and began decelerating, breaking toward the closest gas giant. The squadron followed. Captain, can the wasp keep this deceleration up? Chris asked. He winced. I don't think so, at least not for long. My engines aren't as large as the big frigates. Hornet, could you please have your pinnace replace the wasp's riding herd on the sisu? Chris asked of Captain Tausig. If the freighter's reactors failed, someone would need to be close to evacuate the crew. We'll be glad to, Admiral. While that evolution proceeded, Chris turned her egg to face sensors. Okay, folks, you have my undivided attention. What can you tell me about our competing alien finds? The planet that's the source of all the radio and TV is down system toward the sun, Chief Benny said. Its orbit has it presently on our side of the sun, Besides all the electronic emitters, there are quite a few nuclear reactors, though they are of the obsolete fission type. Any presence in space? There appear to be quite a few orbiting satellites, but nothing that looks large enough to be occupied. So it appears that they are tough enough to give our alien raiders a bloody nose, Captain Drago asked. Normally no, sir, the chief said. However, what we're looking at on the other side of the system is not a normal alien horde. I really do mean the reactors I'm looking at are the kind you first ran into, Your Highness. I'm reading about two dozen ships, large, but the kind we whipped real good. Are they headed for us? Drago wanted to know. But we've got a speed of light problem, sir. That's over a day as the electron flies. But then they may not be all that interested into running into us. Explain that, Chief. I'm making out four large reactors— you know, the kind that you get on the huge motherships. Usually there are a couple of hundred of them on one of their moon-sized mothers, Chris pointed out. Yes, Admiral, exactly. If these little beggars' last mothership is the Hulk we left rolling in space, then they might be starting to build another one. Or maybe a tiny, huge mothership. I don't know, ma'am. I'm guessing. And I know that's usually reserved for officers. Feel free to take a swing, Chief. 
Chris said. That's reasonable, Captain Drago said. The survivors either have to join another horde or rebuild. If they evacuated any of their women and children who survived our messing up their original mothership, they'd have to find some place for them. But why not just take a planet? The navigator asked. Maybe not this one if it's too tough, but another one. Captain Drago shook his head. Why mess with a major gravity well if you don't have to? What with that big gas bag system of moons and the asteroid belt? They have all the resources they need to rebuild. No, a planet is the last place they'd go to lick their wounds. It's always bothered me, Chris said, that they slaughtered life on planets. Now I understand. They do it because they're afraid, but you're right, Captain. If they need to build another ship for their women and children, space is the place to do it. Chris paused for a moment to think. My main question is how many survived the wreck we made of the mothership and who? Did the Enlightened One live through all that? How many black hats did they get off? Are the people over there still enthralled to one man, or have they gone through the process of having someone else step into the top slot? Captain Drago asked. And how smoothly did that process go? Chris asked, smiling, no doubt, with plenty of teeth. This could get interesting. We know some of their warships were with the last horde that attacked us. Why did they, but not these people, change allegiance? Now Captain Drago was grinning big. Who changed allegiances to whom may be the sticking point? Division is a hell of a reality when you've been used to all for one and one for himself alone. So, Chris said slowly, is there any chance I could cut some more of them out? Maybe get my hands on a dissident ship or three? I hope that doesn't mean you're going to let them get in close range, Drago said, his grin gone. I'll try not to, Chris said. No promises, though. Long knives. The skipper made it sound like a cuss word. 37. They hadn't slowed quite enough to make orbit around the intended gas giant. They swung wide around it and did manage to aim toward its largest moon. A swing around it, and they were headed back to the giant. This time, they were slow enough to be captured by its gravity well. They went into orbit, and the squadron anchored ship to ship. While the pinnaces went cloud dancing to refuel the squadron, Chris had Samson hauled before her. Since she wanted her entire gang to see this, Chris arranged the drop bay as a formal court-martial venue. The aliens got herded off to the forward lounge. Penny modified a portion of it into something more to their liking, complete with fake fire and steaks to roast, which left Chris free to arrange a roasting of her own. Longboats brought the crew of the Sisu aboard. As the odd ship out, the Sisu had not had false gravity, and the crew showed it as they stumbled aboard, adapting to normal weight again. There were low murmurs when they caught sight of Chris and starched white seated behind a table with Captain Drago on her right, General Montoya on her left. Gunny saw to it that the Marines herded the mutineers forward. When one held back, a nod from Gunny and a rifle butt hurried that one along. Captain Tausig had been brought aboard to serve as prosecutor. He stood at his own table. He was still gaunt from his stay on what they now called Arsenic Island, but he had color back in his cheeks. If anything, he was showing an angry red. He and his crew had almost died to keep information about humanity away from the aliens, and this bunch had almost given it to them on a silver platter. He'd asked for the job of prosecutor. Chris would not have denied him for anything. Finding someone to stand a fence for them had not been easy. Penny had finally volunteered. My dad was a cop, but he believed that even the most hard-hearted criminal deserved a fair trial. When the rebellious crew were huddled before them, Chris brought down a gavel. This court is in session. Captain Tausig will read the charges. You've got no right to try us, Commander Sampson shouted. In truth, we have every right to try you, Tausig snapped. You and your civilians have mutinied against your lawful authority. You have also recklessly endangered the entire human race by your actions, presenting hostile aliens with not only the directions to human space, but also making them a gift of our technology. 
technology that is critical to the survival of the entire human race. As for you, Lieutenant Commander Sampson, in addition to the first charges, you have abandoned your assigned post in the face of the enemy. I won't even bother with actions unbecoming of an officer and the rest of the book I could throw at you. Running away when your fellow officers are in a fight for their lives? That alone should hang you. You wouldn't hang me. Samson looked like she had just realized that she just might hang. Capital punishment is outlawed, she added, but gulping at the words. Tausig turned that one over to Chris with a glance. You are right, Lieutenant Commander Samson. The Constitution of the United Society specifically bans capital punishment. However, you committed your crimes in the Alwa system, a system only in general association with your King Raymond. As such, part of what this court will decide is whether we have jurisdiction in the case or whether you should be turned over to colonial authorities to face these charges. Commander, the colonials on Alwa have hung people, and they may again. Chris had no doubt that Granny Rita former Commodore of Bat Crew Ron 16, would be standing first in line to head the prosecution and demanding death by hanging with every breath she took. You can't let them have us, one of the civilians said, stepping forward. Please, ma'am. We just wanted to go home. This woman, he said, waving at Samson, she said she could get us home. That was all we wanted. We didn't know nothing about the aliens maybe getting us in our ship. Good God, woman, the aliens were what we were running away from. We didn't know anything about mutiny. Admiral, the man has a point, Penny said, standing. You talked to the ship's officers when they arrived. May I have your permission to poll the defendants and see if any of them were there when you gave your orders? Chris had appointed Penny to defend. She hadn't actually expected her to defend, but Penny was nothing if not loyal to the law. Please do, Counselor. Chris said. Are any of you a ship's captain, first mate, or chief engineer? There were a lot of mumbled no's and shaken heads. Then who was running the reactor watches? Tausig asked, saving an incredulous Chris from doing the same. I was, a man said, raising his hand. Me and a couple of others are certified to stand a reactor watch as second. I didn't think it would be that much harder to stand first. Goes to show what I know, ma'am. We know. You know, ma'am. Their engine's performance showed the quality of those standing watch, Penny pointed out dryly. Tausig cleared his throat. What did your officers tell you about you staying in the Alwa system? That our job was now here, and we could whistle for it if we didn't like it, the erstwhile engineer said. I can't say that we much liked it. Chris, I mean, Admiral, that may have been a failing at the command level. We did not write out articles of war and have them read throughout the fleet, nor did we have them signed by all the crews. I think we need to do that when we get back. Penny paused to let that hang for a while. Chris didn't like it, but her friend had a point. In ancient times, Chris, that's what was done aboard sailing ships. They did hang anyone who violated their signed articles. Thank you, Nellie. Penny went on. I'm not going to say my clients aren't dumb, stupid even, but they acted without knowledge of the consequences. That those consequences were known and recognized at the command level is not proof that they were known and recognized at the mess deck level. Chris made a face, but even her own sense of fairness was being dragged kicking and screaming to Penny's side of the court. Vice Admiral Her Royal Highness Chris Longknife brought the gavel down for one firm knock. You crewmen have a very effective defense counsel. What you did was stupid and put not only your own lives, but the lives of every man, woman, and child in human space at risk. Not to consider the risk you brought to your shipmates back on Alwa, who were waiting for the cargo you did not bring in. Chris eyed the crew before her. They were a pretty hangdog bunch. She'd made her point. Gunny, take these men to the brig. They will stay there until we return to Alwa. There they will be turned over to colonial authorities and assigned to jobs that will not bring them back to space for the duration of the state of emergency. When Chris said turned over to colonial authorities, a wave of panic went through the crew, but the prospect of dirt-side jobs for the rest of their life seemed preferable to other outcomes. 
Gunny growled orders, and Marines began moving them off the drop bay. That left Samson to face the court alone. You have no excuse for your actions, Tausig growled. That long knife woman is nothing but a jumped up Corvette captain, Samson snapped. She ran away when she faced those bastards. She can't judge me for doing what she did. She, Gunny, shut her up, Tausig growled. Gunny Sergeant Brown went to stand beside the defendant. One look at Gunny's face and she shut up. Wrong defense, Penny said with a sigh. I was in the retrograde movement with Vice Admiral Longknife, Tausig began. We ran because there was nothing else to do, and the human race had to know what had happened on the other side of the galaxy. I put my ship between the aliens and Princess Longknife so she could get the word back, and when she did, she came back for me and my crew. She had to fight an alien ship that outweighed her ten to one, but she did save us. I would have come back, Samson snarled when Tausig paused for air. I would have come back with a court-martial board to try that whore. No, Gunny, Chris said. He looked ready to slug the defendant in the mouth. Ma'am, he said. I may need to amend my charges against you, miss, Tausig said. Actions unbecoming and prejudicial to the service seem more and more appropriate. Samson didn't wait for Captain Tausig to pause for a breath before launching into a torrent of curses and invectives. Even when Chris hammered her gavel for silence, she raved on. Gunny, remove the prisoner. See that she is put in a cell separate from the others. Even they don't deserve this kind of grief. And no, Gunny, I don't want to see a mark on her. Ma'am was a bit ambiguous. Chris wasn't sure whether Gunny felt that her implied order was uncalled for or out of order, all things considered. It took two strong Marines to usher Samson from the drop bay. That didn't go as planned, Chris said, standing. It never does, Chris, Penny said, joining her. That's why my old man said justice was blind. Yes, Chris said, still not sure she liked the way her friend had jobbed her. What is it with that gal? Tausig said, joining the main table. Nellie, the last time I had a run-in with Samson, I ordered a full checkup on her before she left the brig. Did a doctor look her over? Yes, Chris. But if I may point out, the kind of exam that the doctor could do in the brig and the kind of exams that Dr. Mead did with the aliens have a level of magnitude in difference. Good point, Nellie. Please ask Dr. Mead to do a full workup to include anything she can do to look into that woman's brain. There's got to be a screw loose. A bucket of screws, Jack growled. Now, with that distasteful matter done, Captain Tausig, you were too sick last time to share my table. Cookie has found a stash of steaks. Could I interest you in one with all the trimmings? I think you could. I understand congratulations are in order. Jack, you lucky dog, you. I'll woof to that, Jack said, and they adjourned to the ward room. 38. The stakes were good, and it gave Chris a chance to lay a proposal before Captain Tausig. Captain, there was no way that I could allow Samson and a mutinous crew to take the Sisu back to human space. However, there is the matter of you and your crew's survivor leave. We're a good bit of the way across the galaxy. Would you like to take your ship the rest of the way? Excuse me if I'm missing something, but why me and not them? He said around a nice rare piece of dead cow. I can keep these aliens across the system off your tail, Chris said. Turnabout being fair play. That would be much obliged, he admitted. But if you did get caught, I trust you would blow the reactor and give them nothing. Phil Tausig leaned back in his chair. We didn't blow the reactors last time because there was hardly anything left to blow. We did destroy our computers. I don't know if you noticed that. I figured you did, but I didn't have time to check it out, Chris admitted. Yes, if we got caught, I'd blow the reactors. After seeing that house of horror, there is no way I want my head or body in their trophy room. Do you want to go? If you do, I'll send along a full report of what we found. 
Do you think that would make any difference in the way your great-grandfather, my king, is building ships? I can't say that it would. I can't say that it wouldn't, Chris admitted. So it boils down to the original question. Do I and mine want to take this chance to get off the tip of this spear and back someplace that might or might not be safer? Yes. No, he said right back. No? No. No way. No how, Chris, Admiral, Viceroy, whomever I'm talking to. We're out here and we'll stay out here if you don't mind. I'm always glad to have fighting skippers, Chris admitted. Chris, I have a message from Dr. Mead to you, Nellie said. What does she have to say? The examination Lieutenant Commander Sampson had earlier was very cursory. She's just completed a full body scan, and the woman has a cancerous brain tumor. It's a rapidly growing one, and she's glad she managed to catch it right now. In another week or two, it would have been inoperable. You may have just saved that woman's life, Penny said. Chris considered that for a long moment. I wish I could say that I felt better about that, she finally admitted. I'll wait to see how she acts when the tumor's gone, Tausig said. There are bad actors, and then there are people with an excuse for acting bad. They ate in silence for a while on that thought. Chris, would you like an update on the new alien planet? Thank you, Nellie. Chris said, then explained to the others at the table with her. I've had her hold reports on the new aliens until we settled this problem with Samson. I take it that the nasty aliens are still staying put, Nellie? If they so much as budge, you will hear. Even if you and Jack are... Thank you, Nellie, Chris interrupted. You're welcome, Chris. Around the table, Penny was in a coughing fit. Sorry. <coughs> I was drinking when Nellie started giving way too much information. The recent defense counsel finished by taking a long drink of water. You may report now, Nellie, Chris said when Penny was settled and the rest were no longer looking at her and Jack in that most familiar way. We flung off a probe before we finished breaking. It will use the fifth planet to break before going into orbit around the fourth. The Buffins are trying to use as much natural slowing as they can to avoid any bright lights. They suspect this civilization has enough technology to notice a sudden bright light in the sky. I wonder what they'll make of a fight between us and the bug-eyed monsters. Tausig asked no one. Nellie had mastered the rhetorical question. She let it go. The probe is not there yet but the fourth planet is throwing off enough electronic media for us to do a major analysis of them without putting anything on the ground. There are several wars raging right now. It appears that the planet is just coming out of a colonial period. Do I need to explain what that is? No, Nellie, Chris said. We all know what it means when folks one place think they should tell folks some other place how to run their lives. The wars right now are being waged using conventional weapons, but Chris, these people have fissionable atomics for power and hydrogen-enriched atomics for weapons. Oh, so our bug-eyed monsters do indeed have a hot one on their hands, Jack said with a chuckle. And they have chemical weapons, too, Nellie added. Several of the larger armies have access to nerve gas and have fighting uniforms designed to handle the problem of it on the battlefield. This just gets better and better, Penny said. Who are these people? From the looks of them, we think they evolved from something more like an earth feline. They have peaked ears, furry faces, and several still have tails. <laughs> the aliens found themselves a batch of tigers, Tausig said, and they sound like they're at the technological level of the late 20th century. Back at the academy, I took a course on that century. It was such a train wreck that I couldn't turn away from it. Some of our best alien invasion literature dates back to that time. They spent a lot of their time scared, and space aliens were about the scariest thing around. <laughs> that and zombies. Zombies, Chris said. Living dead things, Tausig said. And don't ask me how they square that circle. Living dead, Chris repeated. I have pictures, Nellie said. Don't, came from everyone at the table. Now, about our feline aliens, Chris said, who appear to be armed to the teeth. 
they are divided up into 157 different competing districts, some much larger than the others, some much more powerful than the others. Three appear to be dominant, two share a similar language and call their planet Sasquan, Nellie said. Well, if they are as combative as you say, Jack asked, why haven't the larger ones taken over the smaller ones? Some of the smaller ones can be quite nasty if you invade their territory. Do I need to explain guerrilla warfare? Nellie asked. Oh, good Lord, Penny said. They've got that going on down there? Even when you win a war, you don't win it. It never ends until you finally get smart and go home. Something like that. So let me sum it up, Chris said. Our big bad bug-eyed monsters have stumbled upon a really nasty bunch of cats that might just give them the fight of their life and not quit even when they're beaten. <laughs> I can't think of a better future for them. You will notice they are not tackling them, Nellie said. I have one question that has been bothering me, Tausig said, putting down his fork. How come the BEMs are here? This is a long way from where we whipped their mothership. How'd they get here? Nellie, that sounds like a very interesting question, Chris said. I already ran the necessary jumps, Chris, and I don't much care for what they show. I was waiting for a better time to ruin your dinner. Good turn of phrase, Nellie. My dinner is already ruined, I think. Finish it up. If the defeated aliens cut across the Alwa system at 1G acceleration, they would have hit a jump point beta at about the right speed for a long jump, assuming they used at least 10 RPMs at the jump and goosted up to 2Gs. I don't like where this is going, Jack said. Penny grimaced. We know where it's going. Right here. Nellie waited for the chatter to die down, then went on. They took four slower jumps to duplicate our one high-speed jump. But if they accelerated through two of them and began decelerating, they would have ended up here. So the aliens know how to take long jumps, Chris said. Yes, Chris. Apparently, they don't risk them with their mothership, but the warships can do them. Captain Tausig was shaking his head. There goes your 12-jump-point-out warning system, he said. They can jump directly into Alwa from way out. But, Nellie quickly put in, they will be coming in at several hundred thousand kilometers an hour. They would need the entire system to slow down and maybe then some. They would have no fighting capability in that situation. Maybe they wouldn't want any, Chris said. Back in the Unity War, something like that almost wiped out Wardhaven. They were going to use relativity bullets, Huge iron slugs traveling at 0 0.05 or so percent of the speed of light can make a hell of a mess when they hit. Like the bullets that hit the insectoid planet one out from the alien's homeworld, Penny said. Exactly. Let's say those speedsters they've got get themselves up to a really high velocity and don't try to slow down before they hit Alwa, or any human or Aitichi planet. Even this one. I love you, Chris Longknife. Jack said, but you can come up with some of the most horrific ideas. I didn't come up with this one. It's in our history books. Jack, you've got to do something about her bookshelf, Phil Tausig said. You try getting this woman to do anything she doesn't want to do, was Jack's quick answer. That got him nods of understanding. Getting back to our alien situation and not all about me for a moment, Chris said. Do all the aliens have this kind of knowledge, or just the one we scared into running away from us as far and as fast as they could? She may have a point there, Penny said. They were running scared, and not just from us. Who knows what was coming down on them for not going with the rest and hunting up a horde that would take them in. Conflict management and resolution doesn't strike me as their strong suit. No, conflict avoidance seems to be their preferred way of living, Chris agreed. And we know that the last time we passed Alwa, Jack said, it was still there. We also know that the critters across the system from us haven't rocked the critters down system from us. Smart move. I wouldn't piss off those kitties until I was real sure I could take them. 
Does anyone wonder if there's another mothership headed this way to take out the... What do they call themselves? Sasquans? Penny asked. At least in two of their zones, Nellie said, answering one question. That is a possibility, Chris admitted to the other question. But they are a long way from their usual stomping grounds. There's another thing. I could be wrong, but bragging rights for wiping out a planet seem to be a big thing. Nellie, get Jacques on the line. You called, Chris? Do the alien ships claim bragging rights for the planets they kill? Most definitely. They count the number they've bagged like notches on their belt. There was a notation, not in stone but in pigment that we managed to read, bragging that one ship had five and another ship only had four. By the way, those two weren't even the high scorers. One had nine, but I think it may be the original ship, and it didn't seem to need to brag. In your opinion, if the aliens across the system from us didn't join another horde, what are the chances they'd call in another ship to handle this planet? Pretty low. No guarantee I'd be right. Understanding these aliens is a study in progress and likely to be for a long time assuming we don't kill each other first. I understand where you're coming from, Professor. Thank you for your informed opinion, Chris said and rang off. Which leaves me, Chris said, with one big problem. Do we tiptoe out of this system and mark it on our map for later examination, or do we do something now? The table got very quiet. Thank you all very much, Chris said. Phil, can the Hornet do without you for a bit? Hell, I'm just the captain. If we're just swinging around the anchor here, she's probably better off without me. Have I told you how well you lie? Chris said. My family's been Navy for 500 years or more, Admiral. Of course, we tell good sea stories or space stories. I think they're still sea stories, Jack said. So the rest of us can say, oh, I see, as you pull our legs. Whatever works. Nellie, get my key staff, and that includes Professor LeBeau, as well as Amanda and Jacques. If I'm going to put my nose into a hornet's nest, I want the most informed guesses I can get beforehand. Hornets? <laughs> I know a lot about hornets, the skipper of the last two hornets said through a grin. They adjourned to Chris's day cabin. 39. I know we've only begun our study of this new bunch of aliens, Chris said, beginning her staff meeting, but I've sworn that no more new heads get added to that trophy room under their pyramid. However, Alwa is my first responsibility. Chris made a face. So, what do we do about these felines down sun from us? We've got an eighth of Alwa's defending frigates here, maybe more, depending on if the smart metal work is not going well. She paused to look at everyone around the table. She had their attention. What is the best course of action? Do we attack the aliens on the other side of this system? Should we make contact with the aliens' down system and tell them who's sharing their sun with them now? Could we give them some advanced technology that would let them do a better job of holding their own against any space-based attack? Chris paused, then added the final option. Or do we do nothing? Mark this place on our charts for later contact and get back to Alwa. Do any of you see some other option that I missed? Again, Chris was met with a silent table. I'm getting a bit tired of this silent treatment. But then they could remain silent and do nothing. She was the one who had to choose action over inaction. A lot of people exchanged glances, but no one spoke for a long time. Finally, the looks between Jacques and Amanda sprouted words. The cat people, as some of us have taken to calling them. I think that's better than furries, Amanda said. Anyway, they are firmly into their industrial age. Jet aircraft, early rockets, lots and lots of personal transportation. They do not yet have any of the computational power that will put them into the information age. She glanced at Professor LeBeau to see if he would contradict her, but the administrator seemed happy with her words. However, that may be changing. The three biggest groups are making noises about a race to their moon. 
If they do that, they will have to develop better and smaller computers, and that could launch them into the information age and major changes to their economies. How that will turn out is anyone's guess. Amanda eyed Chris as if deciding what to say next, then glanced at Jacques. He took over the story. The problem Amanda and I are struggling with is a question of how well these people can learn to work together. We make a joke of, it's like herding cats, but they are living that problem. But they have a military, don't they? Chris asked. A successful military requires discipline, working together, following orders. Yes, Chris, but a lot of warlike people in human history have succeeded in war without giving up a lot of individual prerogatives. Not all warrior societies want every soldier walking in lockstep. Some pride themselves on the berserker mentality or the samurai spirit. You can march in step and still get all kinds of independent action. Where did I first hear the virtue of improvise, improvise, damn it, improvise? Chris said. Precisely, Jack said. Oh, <laughs> Colonel Cortez, how I wish you were here, Chris said. I feel his ghost at my elbow, Jack said, and he is laughing his head off. Chris paused a moment to see if she could hear the good colonel's pleasant chuckle. Hearing nothing, she went on. Okay. So my anthropologists and economists tell me that these felines are very independent but dangerous as hell, Chris said. I get the feeling that all this beating around the bush is intended to slowly work me away from putting any high technology in their paws. It would be worse than petting their fur the wrong way. I wouldn't agree with that imagery, Jacques said, but I sure wouldn't want to artificially inject advanced technology into their civilization. The outcome could be ugly. So, one of my options is off the table. That still leaves two. Do we risk this squadron in taking out the aliens across the system, or do we quietly leave and shut the door on this Pandora's box? Maybe come back in a year or two and see what we find. Chris, said Nellie, I don't think the matter is in your hands anymore. Why, Nellie? Twenty-two alien warships just boosted out from the gas giant's orbit. Chris allowed herself a deep breath. She would not panic. She'd fought and killed them before. She would do it again. Letting out her breath, she put on her war face as she glanced around the table. Jack and Penny were already back in battle harness. Massau looked inscrutable. The three boffins looked surprised. Bet they didn't see this one coming. Report on the aliens' movement, Nellie, Chris ordered. To their right, a screen came to life. It showed the entire system from well above the sun. The aliens have begun a 1G acceleration that will take them toward the sun and assuming some modifications to accommodate the solar presence, I calculate it is very likely that they will swing around the sun and arrive at the fourth planet. Chris, they are launching an attack on the cat people. Why would they do that now? Jack asked. Nellie, has there been any evidence in the cat people's radio transmissions that they are aware of the aliens? No, Chris. There are no references to an alien attack in their news. Their fiction, as distributed in their media, has no genre for alien attack. I also find it hard to accept that they would be continuing their minor war if they were fighting for their existence with the aliens. No, this is the first attack by the aliens, Nellie said, drawing a conclusion from what Chris would have considered incomplete data. But that still leaves the question, why now? Jack repeated himself. Maybe they needed time to refuel, Chris said. Maybe they needed time to prepare. Or maybe they even had an argument as to what to do next. Nellie, is that all of their warships? Two are remaining behind with the four large reactors. So it's seven heavy frigates in the Endeavor against 22 of their monsters, Chris said. Those are the best odds I've faced yet. Nellie, send to the squadron, prepare for battle. We get underway in two hours, Long Knife sends. I guess I'll be getting back to my hornet sooner than I expected, Captain Tausig said, standing up. 
Good luck and Godspeed, Chris said. The same to us all, Tausig replied. Despite Chris's early alert, they were still at anchor 12 hours later. There was no rush. Even with the later start, they would reach the felines well ahead of the bug-eyed monsters that looked too much like humans. They spent the extra time absorbing the Sisu into the Wasp and the Intrepid. These two frigates had begun life with only five 18-inch guns. Now they sported ten 20-inchers. That made them better in a fight, but their power generation meant it took far too long to reload the lasers. Over the next couple of hours, one of the reactors from the Sisu was swallowed by each of the other two ships. They wouldn't be used for propulsion, but they could be used to recharge the lasers. When the occupants of the brig discovered they were going into a fight, the engineers among them begged for a chance to run their own reactor to power the guns that might just save their lives. While they might or might not have heard much about why they'd been detained in the Alwa system, they certainly had learned that the bug-eyed monsters did not take prisoners. Chris granted them their desire, but assigned engineers from her own watch to keep an eye on them, as well as marines to do the same, only armed. When the rest of the engineers stepped forward to help with their new fourth reactor, Intrepid also took them up on the offer and detached marines to keep them straight up. The extra smart metal was also much approved of by Penny when she got half of the Sisu's hull, scantlings, and fittings. Nellie and her kids had to work hard with both the Wasps and Intrepid ship maintainers to get the stuff smoothed into their own structure. Chris thought long and hard on it, then decided to keep the ship at Condition Baker for the 1G acceleration and deceleration down to the fourth planet. She delegated to Jacques and Amanda the job of explaining to the newly recruited aliens that they were going to war. Don't say who with. Just let them know that we have run into someone who owes us their head, Chris said. See if they can get the concept. An hour later, Nellie reported back that the aliens didn't have a problem with the sky gods fighting other sky gods. The path of the people was often bloody. Why shouldn't the path among the stars be red as well? Chris shivered at the thought but took her blessings where she found them. With fuel topped off and enough reaction mass both for the trip sunward and plenty extra to pad their armor with cooling liquid and dispersant to vent if hit, they began a carefully measured 1G burn for the cat planet. If things went as planned, they would flip ship at mid-course and go into orbit just as the alien fleet was rounding the sun and decelerating toward them. Their presence did not go unnoticed. As Nellie pieced it together from the local news, a ten-year-old amateur astronomer with eagle vision spotted them against the gas giant as they accelerated away. He lost them after that, but caught sight of them again when they flipped ship to start their deceleration burn. Once their engines were pointed at his planet, he reported the eight moving lights on their amateur astronomy network, and the kitty litter hit the fan, so to speak. Some of the largest telescopes were brought online to track them as they rocketed in, with eight sets of engines burning bright against the stellar backdrop, the cats went crazy. We're getting questions aimed at us from everyone and his dog, Nellie said. That's a joke, right? <laughs> dog, Chris said. Yes, it's a joke. Not a good one. No, Nellie, very good. So, who wants to know what? The questions are all the same. What are we doing here, and what are our intentions? They come from all sorts of media outlets. Every one of their 157 governments, no, 162. There were a couple of small ones we missed. Or maybe they're that new. It's hard to tell with precision. Oh, and there must be a million news organizations begging for an exclusive. I guess news organizations are the same wherever you are in the galaxy. Is that all of them? Chris asked. Well... The boy who first spotted us is using a friend's radio to ask us where we came from and why we are here. A kid, huh? Jack said. A kid, Chris repeated. Both of them, the astronomer and the radio operator, Nellie said. But if we reply to them, everyone will get it, right? Chris asked. No doubt, Chris. Even if we tried to send it on a tight beam, I'm not sure their antenna could pick it up. 
It's very primitive technology. How sure are you that you understand their language? Language is, Chris. We've identified 53 being broadcast so far. There may be some weak signals we're ignoring. What language are the kids calling us in? Jack put in. One of the dozen or so major ones, the one that calls themselves Sasquans. I've got over 50,000 hours of recordings, both radio and TV. I'm 99.99% sure of the words for we come in peace, we mean you no harm. You are about to be attacked by starships coming around your sun. We will protect you as best we can. Have they spotted the alien warships coming around the sun? I don't think so. There is a lot of encrypted radio transmissions. Some are pretty easy to crack, but others are on throwaway ciphers. There just isn't enough there for me to hack it, Chris. Send the message. You better not append Long Knife Sends. Long Knife is rather aggressive, or so I've been told. The name, or just you? Nellie asked. Not funny, Chris said. But a good bit of sarcasm, Jack added. Message sent, Nellie reported. Now we wait and see what happens next. Nellie, will the BEMs get the message you just sent? I sent it on a wide beam, Chris. Very likely they will get it too. Send it again. This time, a penned long knife sends. Do the catfolk have military ranks? Yes, Chris. They have air, land, and naval ranks. If your next question is, do I know what Vice Admiral translates to? Yes, I do. Then make it Vice Admiral long knife sends. Do you want Princess added too? Do they have a lot of royalty down there? I don't think so. Most of the governments are democratic or pretend to be. I've identified several presidents for life and something called the leader of the people, three of them leading three different peoples. Also, two of them are shooting at each other, but not officially at war. Chris, it's a mess down there. Vice Admiral will be enough. Sent a second time. I'm sending it repeatedly. Now we see what happens, Chris said. 40. The fecal matter really did hit the air redistribution system when Chris's message arrived at the planet. Within ten minutes of Chris's message showing up, it was in all the news distribution media that her squadron could copy. There were also references to something called print media. Nellie had to look that one up in her archives and was shocked to discover that trees were sacrificed to make paper specifically so that information could be printed on it and sold. What a waste of those lovely forests, she told Chris. Nellie dug deeper into the media from the locals' airwaves and found examples of forests being cut and bulldozed. Why are we even fighting for these people? Chris's computer asked. They're destroying their own planet. Chris sent Nellie to search the ship's own historical archives of Earth in the 20th and 21st centuries. The computer returned much chastened. Well, at least it appears to be something that your type can grow out of. Most of the new queries aimed at the squadron were more of the maddening same, demanding to know who they were and where they were from. There was even one asking Chris what she used to assure she had a glossy coat. Chris ignored them all, all except two. One was from the kids. They thanked Chris for answering them and hoped they might meet whoever she was and that she would win the coming fight. Children are so innocent, Penny said. Read the other message, Chris suggested, and handed her friend the one that had come in on a very powerful tight beam. How do we know you are what you say you are? How do we know that the other ships are our true enemy? Penny read aloud. Where did this one come from? Chris asked Nellie. It was beamed from a communications satellite. It was on a tight enough beam that we're pretty sure none of it washed back onto the planet. Can you return a tight beam to catch that satellite? Only at certain times in its orbit, say in about seven hours. It's in a geosynchronous orbit. Sometimes it's behind the planet, sometimes it's right in front of the planet. Twice a day, it's way out on the side of the planet. 
We'll still be outside their moon when we get our next chance to tight-beam something to it when it's out on the edge of the planet. Nellie, get a small summary of what the alien did to the first planet we discovered. Say five minutes' worth. Add in a couple of pictures of their trophy room. Send it under the heading of, This is what they do. Then get a collection of the ships we destroyed, including the first mothership and one or two of the warships we blew away the last time we visited that wreck. Send it with the heading, This is what we do. Let's see how that goes over. I've got it ready. I'll send it as soon as I'm sure it will miss the planet's general distribution. Thank you, Nellie. So, Chris, do we make contact with only this nation that has the highest tech? Jack asked. Chris gave him the thanks-for-nothing husband look and reconvened her war council to stew about that question. Both Jacques, Amanda, and Penny were out of their seats before she'd even finished posing Jack's question. No, we can't do that, and that is a terrible idea seemed to sum up those talking. The others proved less hurried in their need to verbalize, but were no less sure that Chris would be making a major mistake. I'm glad to see that we have consensus for once, Chris said. You can count me in with you. Then why are you sending this message to only one of the many sides? Amanda demanded. Because they have the technology to ask the question and get the answer in private. We're still well away from them. We'll toss the mouse into the cat convention and see how they handle it. They didn't have long to wait. At first, nothing happened, or at least nothing appeared to happen. Then Nellie started noticing trends. Chris, we may have a problem, she told Chris at supper. What problem might we have, Chris said, as Jack eyed Chris's collarbone where Nellie rode. A polite, tactful, even pensive computer was turning out to be a bit of a pain at times. You remember that one country that could send us a tight beam question? Chris allowed that she did. Well, it appears that several senior business executives have cancelled meetings and cannot be located. Their legislature has also suddenly recessed, and the president has cancelled all appointments and his press offices are not responding to inquiries. Oh, and it is now in the media that their nuclear weapons, carriers, rockets, air vehicles, and submarines are on a heightened state of alert. This is causing trouble among other atomic powers. I was wondering how the other players were taking this, Chris said. Didn't I read somewhere that this was the kind of thing that happened when one atomic power was about to try for a first strike? Yes, Chris. It's in the old records from the horrible 20th century— it looks like they are at risk of something. Just what we need, Jack said. Aliens coming down on them, and they're about to have a nice little war tossing atomic weapons around in their own backyard. Not if I can help it, Chris said, decision made. Nellie, broadcast to all the planets on a broad beam the report that we sent to that one nation. Back it up with a report on the first ship that attacked us, a more thorough report on the raped planet we found, and more visuals of us destroying the two alien motherships. Include shots of our fight with the three alien warships at the Hulk and the one I fought when we rescued the Hornet. Have I missed anything, Jack? I take it you want to avoid the huge battles and us getting our butts kicked? Yes. You know this is going to cause panic on that planet. Chris nodded through a scowl. I suspect there will be a lot of hasty exits from the large urban areas, I don't see how we avoid it if we don't want them to get themselves into their own out-of-control war. A war with atomics, for Christ's sake. The other two major powers have gone to alert, Nellie reported. They are surging their atomic-armed submarines out to sea and launching their air vehicles. Some of their missiles that have to be fueled before launch are being very ostentatiously pumped full of rocket fuel and oxidizers. Messages are being sent both in the clear and with visuals. Then we'd better get our message out right now. Nellie, send out the main message. But I want to talk to the kids. See if you can get them on the radio. Both messages are sent. Chris, I'm trying to raise Zeth. His name is longer and means prancing hunter. Froden's name is also much longer and means loud howler. But the kids go by the shortened names. Maybe they have to grow into the longer name. You can translate for me. 
With 99.99% accuracy, my children and I are refining our dictionaries by the minute as we get more data. Oh, here are the two kids, Chris. The voices seemed both surprised and maybe a bit scared. Are you really calling us? Nellie translated. Yes, Zeth and Froden. I wanted to talk to you. We are sending out a longer message to your planet, telling them about the other aliens coming from the other side of your sun and about to attack you. We will defend you, and we expect to succeed in destroying that attack. However, one of your nations contacted us and is now responding to what we said in a way that is upsetting its neighbors. Your world seems on the edge of war. Chris waited while the message went out and the answer returned. It's always on the edge of war, Froden said. My dad thinks we all ought to just chill out and take a nap. My mother says we have to protect the pride. Dad says it's a guy-gal sort of thing, and things would be a lot more peaceful if the gals would just let the guys run things. <laughs> Ouch. You guys would just sleep while the herd stampeded through the pride lands. Well... Chris said, carefully interrupting what, no doubt, was a never-ending debate on roles and priorities. It would be a shame for nations to destroy themselves just when they are about to be attacked by aliens, now wouldn't it? Doesn't the pride face out together when something strange moves into their territory? The chatter ended and always came in two-part harmony. Chris had guessed that one right. They paused for her reply. What I want you to do is try to let everyone know that you should be alert to the coming attack from the sky and that you are not alone. We will do everything we can to defend you. Can you? Was a while in coming, but only for the speed of light delay. We've beaten them like a drum every time we've met. These are the survivors of the first pride that attacked. We beat them once and sent them off with their tails between their legs. We will beat them again. We've been recording this message, Froden said. Is that okay with you? I was hoping you would. I want everyone to hear this. I'm also sending on an open channel a report on our experiences fighting these aliens. I hope your commanders will look at it and that it will help them plot their own defense. The pride doesn't defend. We attack, Zeth said proudly. You might want to be careful attacking these guys the first time. Chris said. They have wiped all life from a lot of planets. Wiped out all life? Was one part shock, one part awe. This is what they like to do. I will show your leaders these aliens' trophy room if they ask, after they examine the report I'm sending. And you want us to get this message out? Zeth said. As quickly as you can. We'd better be going, then. We met a reporter... She's nice and a really sharp hunter for stories. She says you have to get the story in before a deadline or you lose it. You go talk to her, Chris said, and ended the strangest interview she'd ever given, either as the Prime Minister's brat or that damn long knife princess. 41. Chris moved her war council down to the wardroom. Her stomach was rumbling on empty, it was a pretty lame supper. Apparently, Cookie was saving the steaks, either for the aliens aboard or for a victory celebration. Today's meal was reconstituted, canned, and hard to identify. Quickly, Nellie brought everyone up to date. You're dropping yourself right into the middle of their politics, Jacques said. From the looks of it, that's a real maelstrom. And my alternative was to let them get their world war underway and deliver their wrecked planet on a platter to the aliens, Chris countered. Jacques winced. No one else offered any further insight. Nellie, how is the message going over? Penny asked. She had her own computer, Mimsy, but when you wanted the counsel of all the computers, you asked Nellie. They seemed to be taking it differently in different zones. The media on that one that was getting its elite out of the target areas got a hold of the story, and now everyone is panicked. The other large zone has released the entire report to its media and is organizing evacuations from their cities by the license number on their personal vehicles. They put ten numbers in a hat and drew out a three. Only vehicles with plates that end in three 
can use the main roads out of towns today. They'll pull another number tomorrow morning. And they haven't even seen the aliens yet, Amanda said. They're still behind the sun. We aren't, Jack pointed out. They may be evacuating for fear of an attack from us. Well, at least they're running from ground zero, Penny said. There are three major zones, Masao said. What about the other? That one is run by a leader for life, and there's not a lot officially happening. He runs a centrally controlled country, and he apparently hasn't decided what to do yet. He is now holding a meeting in a bunker under a mountain. Lots of his cronies are with him there. How do you know this? Jacques asked Nelly. If he's running a lockdown dictatorship, you can't be getting this off the media like the other places. No, Nelly said, and you could almost hear the pride in her voice. However, his codes are child's play. Everything his police send might as well be in the clear for all it matters to me and my kids. Fearless leader does something, the police jump to protect him, and I track it from start to finish. I take it that fearless leader isn't all that fearless, Chris said dryly. Petrified of everyone, Nellie said. I really wish you could find an excuse to laze his hideout from orbit, Chris. He is everything that a government should not be. But likely we can't, Jack said. We don't do things like that. Don, Nellie said. Sometimes being the good guy is not all it's cracked up to be. I'm very aware of that, Nellie, Chris said. How are the countries that aren't in the three major zones taking the message? They are still thinking about it, although anyone who can find an aunt, uncle, or grandma to visit in the country is taking this chance to use their vacation time. A lot of roads are jammed. That's also happening in the first zone we alerted. Now that everyone knows, there's a lot of, uh... I think you used to call it gridlock before computers controlled traffic patterns. It's a mess down there. Hopefully they'll straighten it out before the bad guys arrive, Chris said. Chris, there's a movement developing among the smaller states to call for a conference in their associated peoples to talk to you, Nellie said. Are you willing to go down there? Chris raised an eyebrow, tossing the question to her brain trust. Jack jumped in immediately, shaking his head. I don't like the idea of putting you down in the middle of that madhouse. We don't know enough about them to know if marching in with a Marine honor guard would settle things down or start a fight. And I am so not letting you down there without the Marines. No surprise there, Jack, and thank you, Chris said, trying to make her words worth more than she knew they held. What about the rest of you? There was a long pause before Jacques said, I don't want to get on the general's wrong side. However, there are cultures where anyone not willing to speak face to face with their enemies is assumed to be lying. I've asked my computer to study what we know of these mad cats, and I'm afraid that I'm coming to the opinion that they are one of those cultures. Nellie took over the conversation at that point. We have been examining their TV transmissions. They have some very interesting shows that I think would fit right in with what you humans call soap operas. They even sell soap and other beauty aids. That glossy coat question that got beamed up to us earlier was from one of them. Nellie, is there a point in here somewhere? Chris said. Yes. It may just be a product of their visual theater, but personal confrontation and reconciliation is the norm. You're basing your cultural intelligence on soap operas, Penny said. It is not just their soap operas. They have movies, historical patents. All of them depend on this kind of eye-to-eye -eye encounter. Movies and soap operas, Jack said with a rumbling sigh. How can we go wrong? It's not like you humans broadcast scientific treatises on human conflict resolution on your day or night entertainment media, Nellie said, sounding downright snappish. Okay, okay, Chris said. I have all of your input. We haven't received an invitation to this talkathon. Let's put this question off until then. Chris eyed her team. Jack was being Jack. He wanted her safe. He'd always wanted Chris Longknife safe. He didn't seem any different now that he was arguing to keep his wife safe. 
Her science friends were giving her the best they had. It was a thin gruel at best. Still, she might have to base her decision on something that thin. It was Nellie that bothered Chris. Nellie was starting to sound personally involved in the decisions she advocated. Was Chris's computer beginning to show early signs of an ego? Chris had been raised around big egos. Father used to grumble that he'd never met a politician who didn't come with a bloated ego. Naturally, Father had one of the biggest Chris had ever known. Grandpa Trouble and Grandpa Ray were legends, and though Chris had missed them at first, they had the egos to go with the legend. She'd never seen the two of them go at it and hoped she never would. But now it was Nellie. How big could a computer's ego get? How much trouble could it cause? Chris sighed and went on to her next problem. Nellie, could you get the ship captains in a conference? Immediately, Nellie said and hopped to it. That's it, Chris thought. Keep Nellie on specific things with specific solutions. Let's keep the poor computer away from the value judgments where a flip of the coin is as good as anything else for conflict resolution. In a moment, Captain Drago had joined them, and the other seven captains were watching from the wardroom's own screen. Also watching were a lot of junior officers who were paying only partial attention to their meals as they watched the elephants go about deciding their fate. We have a battle to plan as much as possible, Chris said without preamble. From what we've seen of the aliens, they've adopted a line ahead, 22 ships long. I propose to fight them in a line ahead of seven ships. Endeavor, we'll keep you in orbit around the planet. Pardon me, ma'am, but we'd like to have a place in the fighting line, if we may, said Captain Odell. She'd started life as a merchant ship skipper, as had the Endeavor. Her ship only had six 18-inch lasers, three forward and three aft. That was intentional. Chris wanted the Endeavor to be as dangerous running as chasing. This is going to be a knockdown, drag out fight, Captain Odell, Chris said. I know, ma'am. Me and my crew know it will be, ma'am. But we've seen the inside of that damn pyramid. We'd all kind of like to get a chance to make our own statement that they ain't going to get our skulls for their horror house, if you know what I mean. I think I do, Chris said. The crew thrown together for the endeavor was a very mixed batch. Some merchant marines, some navy, and a lot of the gun crews were ostriches. If a crew such as that were voting for a fight, Chris had quite a team on her hands. Nellie, put our assumptions about the enemy up on the board. A line of 22 ships appeared on a second screen. It showed the aliens decelerating toward the cat planet. Physics decrees that they must be breaking as they come in on final approach. However, as we saw in the attack on the Hornet... They have learned to break a bit farther out and gain some tactical flexibility as they get in range. We'll have to be prepared for that. Still, their tactical problem is governed by the laws of physics, and they can only get around them so much. Chris eyed Captain Odell. You will be in the lead position as we join the enemy in deceleration. I intend to use the moon to loop out to meet them, then fight it out with them in that final approach. Endeavor. You will be at the head of the line. Nellie added a name to the ship closest to the cat world, Endeavor. You know, ma'am, some might say we were at the end of the line. In space, it's often hard to tell, Chris said. But that is your position. I intend to cross their T and concentrate our fire on the head of their line. Well, that means the ship that's at the other end of the line could be in for a heap of trouble. Captain Tausick said in a soft drawl. Any of their other ships that get in range will be firing away at that poor soul. It does look that way, Chris admitted. May I claim the honor of that position for the Hornet, Admiral? Are you sure it's an honor you're asking? Chris said. It's where I think we'd rather be, Chris. We got a bone to pick with these bastards. They clobbered the old Hornet. I want them to know they've been solidly stung in this next fight. Chris knew that Phil came from a long line of Navy heroes, going as far back as the wet Navy. She'd always thought it was a pain in the ass to be one of those damn long knives. Maybe she was seeing how hard it could be to bear another proud name. You will have that place, Captain Tausig. Thank you, Admiral. I think my great-grandfather would be very proud. Yep, some names were just a pain in the butt. 
which leaves the question of who gets the honor of the next hot spot in line, said the skipper of the Constellation, Captain Sims. Chris nodded. I hope none of you will think me less courageous than those who have already spoken up, but General, please retrieve my cover from my quarters. Oh, and the printout Nellie's making. What printout am I making? One with all the names of the other six ships, well spaced out so we can cut them into slips of paper and draw them from the hat. Cover, Nellie corrected. Whatever. Jack returned with her cover, complete with Admiral's scrambled eggs. Nellie and Abby had had a ball constructing just the right gold braid for the bill of her hat. Captain Drago produced a pair of old-fashioned scissors from some drawer in the wardroom. Oh, scissors, what delightful old tech. I'll have the lovely Amanda Cutter serve as our honest broker here. This sheet has the names of the other six ships of the squadron, each of them capable of fighting just as well as the next and holding any place in our line. Yes, the paper does. Amanda said, holding it up for all to see. Chris handed her the scissors. Cut the flimsy up and fold them over. Then put them in my cover. She did. Chris stood and went to stand behind Amanda. She held the cover above the economist's head. Now draw out the name of the ship that will fight right behind the hornet. Constellation, Amanda said as she opened the first slip and laid it on the table in front of her. Captain Sims grinned proudly from his place on the screen. Royal, Amanda read next. Another skipper seemed just as glad. Wasp, Captain Drago's grin was full of pride. Congress was followed by Intrepid. Bulwark would fight next to Endeavor. That, my good captains, is our fighting order. Captain Drago, please arrange for the ships to take their station in our new line. And may God help us all, Captain Drago was heard to mutter. 42. They made orbit, and then the problem started. The squadron was in its second orbit, and the ships were busy maneuvering to get nose-to-nose -nose and swap anchoring cables. Being at zero gravity, Chris was belted into her chair at her desk, reading the latest set of guesses about the planet beneath her. Chris, three missiles have been launched at us, Nellie reported curtly. They are still in boost stage. Shoot them down. Chris ordered just as curtly. Suddenly, the wasp lurched as it brought its aft batteries to bear on the planet below. I've fired three aft lasers, just a short burst, Nellie reported. We hit all three. What the hell is going on with my ship, Chris Longknife? Came as a bellow from the bridge. I take it, Nellie, that you didn't inform Captain Drago of our little problem. There wasn't time, Chris. Is he mad at me? No, he's mad at me, Nellie. Are there any more launches? No, Chris, but the missiles fired were atomic-tipped. One had a low-order explosion when it crashed. The other spewed radioactive plutonium. Thank you, Nellie, Chris said, as she undid her seatbelt and pushed herself off for the bridge. Can I have my ship back, your high-handedness? Captain Drago said with a scowl. I'm sorry, Captain. Missiles were fired at us. I told Nellie to shoot them down quickly because they were still in boost phase and an easy target, Chris said as she latched onto the back of the captain's chair. Next time, I'll tell her to inform you and let you do it the proper Navy way. The hard way, the skipper said, and if possible, his scowl got even deeper. I hate to say this, but thank you. You're welcome, Nellie said from Chris's collarbone. So, what do we do about this greeting? The captain asked. Nellie, which of the zones launched the rockets? Do you remember that one I called Fearless Leader? Yes. It was definitely her. Her, the captain said, raising an eyebrow. Yes, Nellie said. We've come to find out that all the major zones are led by females of the species. God help us! Captain Drago said in full drama. A planet full of Chris Longknifes. What sin could I have possibly committed in my previous life to deserve this? Are we still over her territory? Chris asked, ignoring the drama queen at her elbow. No, we're far enough away from it that I don't think we need fear shots from them, Nellie replied. Then broadcast this on the usual frequencies. 
I have been fired upon with atomic missiles. I have destroyed them with more ease than you SWAT flies. Do you really want to go to war with us? We came here in peace to save you. Admiral Longknife sends. Let's see what we hear from the rest of the crazy cats between now and the next time we pass over fearless leader's domain. Chris shoved off from the skipper's chair and headed back to her day quarters. So do we continue to anchor? Captain Drago asked. Chris paused at the door to her quarters. She shook her head. Be to quarters and get ready for a fight. With luck, next time Nellie won't have to step on your pride. The captain made a face, but he passed the order to the squadron. Ships pulled away to get more maneuvering room. Crews settled down at their battle stations and made ready for whatever came next. What came next was a flood of denials that anybody wanted to fight the squadron. They came from heads of states, including both of the two other major powers, as well as from movie stars, heads of major industrial combines, and the two kids that Chris had talked to. Chris took their message personally. Please, listen to us. Froden said. Chris could almost hear the tears in his eyes. My dad says no one wants war. Even my mother says it would be a bad idea. And so do my folks, Zeth put in. It's just that crazy tale over there. They've been in trouble ever since she came to power. She doesn't speak for the rest of us. I'm coming to understand that, Chris said. I will handle this problem just between her and me. Please do. The rest of us don't want to have anything to do with it. Chris ended her radio session with the two kids. They might just be kids, but what they said was backed up with signals from 161 other countries. Only the fearless leader kept quiet. The squadron was battle-ready as its orbit swept toward the problem zone. Missiles rose to meet them. Endeavor, engage the threats. Engaged, came back quickly and seven missiles were lazed before they could get out of boost phase. The last one was hardly off the ground. Two exploded, including the one that had just lifted off. That might explain why no more were fired. Nelly, do we have a solid lock on just where fearless leader is hunkered down? I am 99.999% sure I have her mountain dialed in, Chris. Please pass it along to the other ships of the squadron. I want to give it a broadside from each ship. Full charge from the forward lasers, then flip ship and give it the aft batteries. Orders passed. Around Chris, the wasp swung down, pointing its nose at one particular mountain. Fire, Chris ordered. She felt nothing as six 20-inch lasers poured every joule of energy they stored into firing on one particular piece of real estate. Chris had once been too close to a building when Admiral Kratz, of mostly fond memory, lazed it from space. He hadn't had anything like the ships she had. The only sign Chris had that the forward batteries were empty was the wasps swinging around to present her aft batteries. Five seconds later, Captain Drago reported. Broadside fired. Request permission to resume anchoring. Permission granted. Keep an eye on that zone next time we pass it. That I will do, Admiral. However, some cartographer needs to remeasure the height of that mountain, it ain't what it used to be. No doubt. I wonder how fearless leader is taking it. We'll know next pass. Next pass was uneventful. Then, Chris found herself invited to a party. 43. Well, Jack, it's now official. I have been invited to the general session of the Associated People's Annual Session. Apparently, it's being held three months early just for little old me. Chris tried to keep a happy grin on her face. Unfortunately for the debutante in her past, she was none too sure she meant a word she said. Where is this shooting gallery going to be held? Jack asked before Amanda, Penny, or their tagalongs could say a word. One of the largest cities on the planet, it's located in the zone with the highest tech, the one that first contacted us and then proceeded to keep the bad news to itself, Jacques pointed out. Has anything been heard from the people you lazed from orbit? Massau asked. Not so much as a peep, Chris said. And when we cross their territory, we are not even tracked by radar. Total shutdown, Penny said. But I notice we're still on alert. 
It only takes a few seconds to turn a radar on, track us, and launch, Jack pointed out. So are you going down? Amanda asked. The invitations from both of the major zones say their leaders will be there personally and wish to speak to me eye to eye. That phrase may not mean what it says. Or it can mean exactly what it says, Jacques put in. Yes. So what do we do? Penny asked. We do what we always do, Jack growled. We keep her safe to spite herself. Penny, you were the admiral's coordinator with the local police, so get on the horn and talk to the local police. Coordinate. Me, I'm the chief of her security. I will be talking to the chief of the security details of these other two top cats and seeing what they're doing to keep their primaries safe. General Montoya paused for a breath. We are going down to talk with civilized people with the usual problems of organized civility. Honey, Jack said, turning to Chris, don't wait up for me tonight. I may be dirt side for a day or two. You're not mad at me, are you, Jack? No, love. You do what you do and I do what I do. We knew it would be like this when we decided to share as much of our lives as we could. Chris blew him a kiss, but he and Penny were already having their computers hook them into what passed for a communications net dirt side. In seconds, both were talking to someone. Minutes later, they were headed dirt side on the same longboat with a detachment of Marines. Jack was not in her bed that night nor the next one. That day, the aliens finally showed up, clearly swinging around the sun and still in their long line ahead. And that was the day Chris was formally invited to address the Associated Peoples the next day, with Jack's approval. She arose early the next day, pulled on her spider silks and donned her vice admiral's dress uniform. At the last minute, she slipped on an armored wig as well. <laughs> what had Jack called it, the shooting gallery? Certainly there was no one down there that had a beef with one of those damn long knives. However, she had flattened someone's mountain. Fearless leader had not been heard from since the mountain got slagged, and the squadron continued to zip above that zone with not even a hint of radar ranging. Still, Chris chose to take no chance. It proved to be a wise choice. 44. The Admiral's barge landed in a river and was promptly surrounded by police boats and led to a pier. Chris exited into a wharf, covered against the rain and even heated against the damp chill. On a gallery above her, cameras rolled and lights flashed. There were a lot of shouts to look this way, and Chris did. She remembered how to do the princess thing and smiled and waved as was necessary to the role. Jack let her stand there, but there was a large black limo waiting for her, and farther back several large SUV-type rigs with an ambulance at the rear. You really do have all this prepared? Chris said through her wide smile. It's been a while, Jack answered through a tight smile, but it's like a bicycle. Once you've got the hang of it, you always know how to fall off again. Chris had to chuckle at that. This is your allotted time for waving. A furry female with a sleek black coat and interesting silver harness said, It is time to be going. And she entered the limo. Chris gave one last wave and slipped inside. Jack, in dress blue and reds, did the same. In a moment, the cavalcade was on its way. You speak our language very well, Chris said, settling into her place. I am a professional translator. I have mastered 12 languages and can read 18. Your language is moderately easy. I have been studying it since we started picking up your communications. Chris eyed Jack. When you talk to the kids, you talk and Nellie would translate. Both seem to have gotten through. It also appears that Nellie included several of the original copies of our reports, as well as the translations. I thought they might come in handy, Nellie said. I found them most helpful. Now, about your schedule, the female said. I am Chris Longknife, Chris said, offering her hand. Oh, I am sorry if I have violated greetings protocol. I am Zara Aktorina. At your server. At your service, Nellie said. At your service, Zara corrected. And this is? 
she said, staring at Chris's collarbone. My personal computer, Chris said. She is also my translator. Computer? You have computational machines, Chris said. Yes, for weapons design and some other things. Businesses are starting to use them for billing and inventory. Very primitive, Nellie said. Nellie, shush. I think we need to keep you out of this. Spoil sport. We use computers for much more, and ours are much smaller. Have you landed a person on your moon? Zara shook her head. There is talk of doing that, but many think it is just talk. On our first planet, the race to put a man on the moon sparked all kinds of improvements in life and technology. I will suggest that your leaders undertake that challenge if they want to expand their horizons. Just your being here is a major expansion of our horizons, the translator said. No doubt, Chris said before Nellie could. We are driving to the Tower of the Associated People's Grand Assembly. Almost every country has chosen to send its leader to this meeting, so you will be seen by most everyone. There will also be private meetings so you can talk face-to-face with President of Kalam Almar, President Almar, and Prime Minister of the Bizalt Kingdom, Madame Garou. They represent the two most powerful zones, now that President for Life Solzen seems to have departed this life. Is she the one that fired on us? Yes. Foolish to do it once, stupid to do it twice. Many of us agree with you. Apparently, what you did to her mountain redoubt has also taken out most of those who implemented her rule. The country is in disorder. All wonder what will come of that chaos. Chris chose not to remark on that. The ride was smooth, attesting to the weight of the car and, no doubt, the thickness of the armor. Here and there along the drive, people on the sidewalks paused to wave. They seemed dressed for the wet weather and substantially more than the interpreter, leaving Chris to wonder what the attitudes were towards clothes. You should have asked me sooner. I watched a few of the soap operas, Nellie growled in Chris's head. They don't much care for clothes, but they like to be wet even less. You hairless apes may have to get used to a more open attitude. Thank you, Nellie. You're welcome, Chris. They drove into a basement and directly to a wide-open entrance. The interpreter exited first, then stepped aside to allow Jack to step out. From the following black rigs, Musashi Marines in bright red dress uniforms rushed to form a defensive perimeter, all eyes out. Only when they had taken up station did Jack motion Chris out. She offered her hand and she stood. Again, a wall, well away from them, was taken up by cameras and their crews. Chris smiled and waved like a good princess, then went where her guides led. The Marines fell in on both sides of her. They don't mind having armed Marines in their halls of power, Chris said through another wide smile. These aren't their halls of power, Jack answered through tight lips, and they like a parade as much as the next although I got the impression they wanted the Marines buck naked. That would spoil everything, though. Most of them think our Marines are female. How's it feel to be a guy in a gal's world? No different than it ever does, Mrs. Montoya. That almost broke Chris up. Zara led them to a large foyer with high walls on two sides, but open to the next floor up on the other two. Again, there were camera crews recording everything, The rails on the upper floors were lined with people who watched and waved. Chris spotted two young ones, only about half the height of grown-ups waving madly. She waved back. Zeth and her young boyfriend had made it just as they had planned. They'd even managed to ship a picture of themselves up to the wasp so Chris could recognize them. But their time would be later. Zara led Chris to a female who might have once had a lovely golden black striped coat, but which now showed much gray in place of black. May I present to you the elected speaker of the Associated Assembly, Von Ock Entire. Chris held out her hand. The elderly female held out her paw, but no sooner had Chris and she touched palms than the elected speaker pulled Chris into a wide hug. Chris suspected she could have been crushed in the hug, but it was pro forma at best. Quickly it was over, and Chris stepped back. You could have warned me about that, Jack, she said on Nellie Net. 
What, and take all the fun out of it? Then a slug slammed into Chris's back before she even heard the shot fired. 45. Chris hit the deck both because that was what she'd been told to do and because she had to. The force of that slug was that bad. When the second slug hit her, she rolled both to make it harder to hit her again and because the round made her. It also hurt like hell. Even the new spider silk was having a problem with the force of these slugs. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Jack shouted as he came to stand between Chris and the next round. Around Chris, the Musashi Marines had their rifles up, but Jack was right. Whoever the target was, she was lost among all the people watching from above, who were now racing away, either because of the shots fired or the sight of a whole lot of Marine M6s raised at them with intent. Penny, do you have an eye on the shooter? I have her, a white with thin black stripes. She's ditched her gun, but we have nano scouts following her. I don't think she expected our technology. We'll get her. No, make that we've got her. Five local blues. Well, black and silvers. Have her. That was followed by a, damn. What happened, Penny? Jack demanded. She suicided. She slipped something in her mouth and now she's down, kicking in convulsions and foaming at the mouth. We'll get nothing from interrogating that one. By now, Marines had formed a protective wall around Chris. Only now did Jack kneel down beside her. I see you wore your spider silk today. Damn right I did, Nanny. And you didn't even have to bug me about it. That's why I've decided to keep you, wife. You are proving to be very educable. And I'm hurting like mad. Can you give me a lift up? Jack offered her both his hands. She swung herself around, tensed every muscle she could handle, and let him haul her up. Ouch, she said through gritted teeth. Is it that bad? I've had worse. Now both the translator and the elected speaker were at her side. One was babbling, and the other wasn't making a lot of sense. Calm down, Chris said, drawing a slow breath. I am hurt but not injured. You have skin tough enough to resist a slug thrower? Asked Zara. Let's just say that I do, Chris said, not willing to give more away than she had to. Where are the two I need to meet? The speaker led Chris quickly to a door. It was opened by what Chris took to be a soldier. She had a slug rifle and her leather harness was brightly shined and sported several brass buttons. The soldier stepped aside to let Chris and Jack enter, but closed the door before any Marines came in. Since Jack took that as acceptable, Chris did too. Penny, in dress blues, allowed herself in a side door and trotted to meet Chris before she reached the two groups waiting at the end of a long hall. It was quite a luxurious hall. Lined with marble pillars, the floor was a fine, golden hardwood. Between the pillars stood statues in perfect white marble of other felines. Some held spears, others held books. The balance seemed about even. As Penny joined them, Jack spoke through a hardly moving mouth. Do we know anything about the failed assassin? The official story is that it was a mad woman driven around the bend by the shock of learning that there was life among the stars, something that wasn't considered possible before a week ago. The most likely story is that one of the survivors of Soul's End's crew thought to get a leg up in the present intramural sport of offing anyone reaching for the fallen president for life's baton by offing you— the assassin was known to be associated with a spy network from Fearless Leader's side. They knew it and didn't haul her in, Chris said, trying not to lose her smile. If you've got them made, you never haul them in. You follow them and see if they take you to someone that you don't know about. Spoken like a true intelligence officer. Chris came to a halt in equal distance from the two groups as they were from each other. At the center of the groups were two females. One wore a blue coat edged in gold. The other wore a red cape. As it turned out, President Almar of the Cullum Almar wore the coat. The Prime Minister of the Basalt Kingdom, Madame Garreau, sported the cape. Chris saluted. The two of them bowed from the neck. 
those around them bowed from the waist. President Elmar stepped forward a pace. I wish to greet you in the name of the Congress of Column, in the name of our people and on my own behalf, she said. Chris heard the statement as an echo, one from Zara, the other in her head from Nellie. Nellie, let Zara do the translation. If you identify a major failure, tell me in my head and let me figure out what to do about it. Yes, Chris. Now Prime Minister Garreau took a step forward. I also wish to greet you in the name of the ancient parliament of the Bizalt Kingdom, and in the name of our monarch and the people of our ancient land, as well as myself. Chris took a step forward. I am Her Royal Highness Admiral Christine Longknife, Viceroy to the people of Alwa and Commander of the Alwa Defense Sector. I wish to greet you in the name of the people of the United Society, their Congress, and my liege, King Raymond I of that name. And if I may, I wish to greet you in the name of all humanity as well as the Aitichi Empire. May we long share peace with them and the people of Alwa. There are three different races riding between the stars, President Almar remarked. Yes, Chris said, not putting too fine a point on the Alwins. There was quite a discussion among their own advisors about that. President Almar seemed to shush them with a scowl before turning back to Chris. I wish to apologize for the assault on your person, she said. I understand the problem, President Solzen was foolish to fire on us the first time. To fire on us the second time was stupid. No doubt her continued silence is causing much confusion in many corners. Zara had liked the foolish, stupid meme. Chris was thinking of adding it to her speech if it went over here. In life, Solzen showed herself to be many things, Madame Garreau said. No doubt she will meditate long and hard on her folly from where she rots in hell. Meanwhile, it leaves us with many things to contemplate. Can we expect attacks like you showed us from these aliens you say are coming? I should think by now your own astronomers can see them, Chris said. Madame Garreau glanced behind her. One of her advisors came up to whisper in her ear. Why was I not told about this sooner? She snapped. The advisor gave what looked like a shrug and backed away. Chris eyed the two leaders, Neither of them showed any gray, but something about Madame Garreau left Chris with a sense of age. We have seen the ships coming around the sun that you told us of, President Almar said. Will they pound us as hard as you pounded Solzen? Chris, the word for a pound that she used has a negative connotation. Cats cut and slash, dumb animals hammer and pound, Nellie put in. Solzen behaved like a dumb animal, trying to throw rocks at what was not within her reach. I could have cut or slashed her. I chose to hammer her. I have enough weapons in easy reach that I can do whatever I chose to do. Both national leaders turned back to their advisors. Good jab there, Chris, Jack said on Nellie Nett. Well, thank you, Nellie, for the input. You're welcome, Chris. Now the top cats were looking at each other as if to decide who was the top cat. Finally, Almar spoke. May I ask you a question? You don't have to answer it. Chris, that is very tentative, almost submissive, if we can trust the soap operas. You will have to ask the question before I can know if I can answer it or decide if I will, Chris said, pulling herself up to her full height, which just about equaled that of the cat before her. Why are you here? President Almar asked. What brings you to our solar system now, just when we are being attacked? The timing seems much more than a coincidence. Chris had expected that question. She'd spent the better part of the last day going over it with Amanda and Jacques. Their final conclusion was that the truth would be better than evasion. Chris had harbored a hope that it would not come up. At least it was raised in semi-private. I am here because I chased a ship full of mutineers here, Chris said slowly. I caught them and would have gone back to Alwa, except we discovered your radio and TV transmissions at the same time we identified the alien ships that had fled here to lick their wounds and 
regroup after the last time we defeated them. Chris paused to make sure her translator had stayed with her, then she went on. Hard as it may be to believe, it is a long series of coincidences that led me here. After capturing my miscreants, I was considering going back to Alwa without making contact with you. However, when the aliens launched their attack, I chose to defend you. There are twenty-two of them, and only eight of you, Madame Garreau said. Do you expect to win this battle? I expect to. But one never knows in battle, does one? No, Almar said. Lady Chance dances a jig in every battle. What will you do if you win? Lady Garreau asked. Now her tail was twitching. I will return to Alwa, which I have a duty to defend on my honor, Chris said. But I think your question was, what will I do about you here? That is correct, President Almar said, standing very still as if waiting to pounce. I would prefer to leave you alone, Chris answered. Alone? Came from both of them. Chris didn't even need a translator for that. In their surprise and shock, both took a step back. Several of their advisors seemed to be pacing now, tails lashing their sides. Chris went into her prepared speech. She spoke slowly, both so the translator could follow her, and so her words would have weight. You are at a precarious stage of your civilization. You were still divided into tribal factions. Only now you are tribal factions with atomic weapons. You can destroy yourselves and everything that lives on this planet. I would prefer not to have anything to do with you until you decide for yourselves if you are to wipe yourselves out or will grow beyond your childhood. That is an interesting perspective, Almar said with a snort. You are where we were four or five hundred years ago. We chose one path. You are still at that crossroads. Which path will you choose? Will these aliens you are about to fight stand by while we choose? Almar asked. Now it was Chris's turn to frown. If she'd had a tail, she might have twitched it. They create a problem. Will you stay here and guard us? Madame Garreau demanded. No, Chris said. And why not? President Almar said. I am charged to defend Alwa, Chris said. There was a long pause at that. And you do not have enough ships to do that, do you? President Almar said slowly. What admiral ever had enough ships for her job? Madame Garreau said slyly. I think you are inviting us into a war that is still very much in doubt, isn't it? Almar said. I am not inviting you into any war. It is coming at you, Chris said. But you cannot defend us, Garreau snapped. And you cannot defend yourselves, Chris snapped right back. The two leaders turned back at that and joined in heated conversation with their advisors. This going well? Jack asked on Nellie Nett. About as well as I expected. Chris, I can follow most of their talk. Some want to take you hostage and demand you protect them. Others fear you. That slagged mountain really impressed them. A few just wish you'd go away and take the other aliens with you. So no consensus, Nellie. Nothing even close. Jack? I've already alerted the Marines outside. There doesn't appear to be any move to contain them. I've got others moving into place. Penny? I've set repeaters into most of the police nets. Their electronics are not very sophisticated. There's nothing on any net about moving against us. So it's just talk. Jack, keep your Marines on standby. There's no telling what one desperate type might do. Trust me, Admiral. My wife, I'm very alert. Finally, the two statesmen stepped away from their advisors and faced Chris. What might we do to gain a defensive alliance with you and your king? Madame Garreau asked. First, let me be very clear. If any of you launch a nuclear war or any war of conquest that exhausts your resources and lays waste your lands, all bets are off. You will be on your own. 
Chris paused. She knew she'd spoken too fast for the translator. Besides, there were several aides who were elbowing others in the ribs. No doubt someone had brought up the idea. Secondly, yes, a planet must have a united government to apply for membership in the United Societies. It must be democratic and have arrangements to see that the will of the majority rules while protecting any minorities under a rule of law. Again, Chris paused. It sounds like you have had plenty of experience with fractured governance, President Almar said dryly. Yes, it lacks balance. Finding that balance is often bloody. But you will not impose that single governance, Madame Garrow said. That always leads to more blood, not less, Chris said. That brought what Chris took for grim chuckles from both leaders. But you yourself have said that we cannot stand against these aliens. We might as well roll over on our backs, show our bellies to be scratched, and piss ourselves. What are we to do? Madame Garrow said. You have not yet sent one of your own to walk your moon, Chris said. We have talked about it. It will be very expensive, President Almar said. It will also be very productive. It will require you to advance your science and technology. It will put you into space. But we still won't be able to stop these attackers, snapped Almar. But you will have started down that path. And if we are attacked in the meantime? Empty your cities, spread out. Be prepared to be attacked with nerve gas. Fight them. Make this victory so expensive that they turn away in disgust, Chris said. But you will not sign a defensive pact with us, Madame Garrow said. No, Chris answered. Madame Garrow's tail was thrashing now. Mort, don't have yourself a coronary. President Elmar said to her sister politician. She's an admiral, for pity's sake. Yes, she may be the whelp of her king, but still, she's just an admiral here. Would you want some admiral, even of your royal bloodline, negotiating a military treaty for you to sign? And negotiating it with no authority and no guidelines? Thank you for understanding the limits of my authority here, Chris said. I think there are more limits here than you want to talk about. You are going into battle at three to one odds. Something tells me that you don't have the resources to protect us if you did sign that treaty more to so hot to get your paw print on. You will understand that such issues might be covered by the State Secrecy Act. We have one, too, Almar agreed. Just how much danger are we in? Almar asked after a pause. What do these aliens want? Slaves, resources, control of the means of production. They want your heads, Chris said bluntly. They want to sanitize your planet down to the smallest signs of life. The big cat visibly gulped at that. Madame Garreau had been consulting with her aides. Now she turned back to Chris. Our heads. Nellie, project the inside of that pyramid for them, Chris thought as she turned to face the opposing wall. The hologram was very solid. Suddenly, the walls were no longer marble, but lightly worked granite. The pillars became figures encased in cubes of glass. The floor showed piles of heads, skulls, carapaces, whatever. Sweet ancestors! Came from somewhere, but otherwise the room was dead silence. These aliens are not like any other aliens my species has encountered, Chris said slowly. We enjoy encountering different species. Unless, of course, they go to war with us, but the less said about the Aitichi, the better. These people hate all life not of their own kind. They search space, hunt for life, and then kill it. Chris let that sink in. Then, once they have plundered a planet down to even its air and water, they take one sample of that life, encased in this plastic cube, and a pile of heads, and take it back to their trophy room. Their room of horrors. Chris left the hologram up for a bit longer, then had Nellie kill it. She said nothing as she turned back to the two leaders of this planet's most powerful governments. It seems we have our work cut out for us, 
said President Elmar, if we are to keep our heads on our shoulders. Yes, it seems we do, Madame Guerrero agreed. Chris's address to the Associated Assembly after that was a minor affair. She gave the nice generic speech she had planned, adding in the foolish versus stupid reference to Solzen. It went over big now that she was assumed dead. Chris made no reference to heads or raped planets, but left it to her listeners to assume the worst. No doubt they would assume far less than what they faced, but hopefully their fear would be enough to unite them. She, Jack, and Penny were back aboard the Wasp before it was time for lunch. Chris still hurt quite a bit from those two slugs. Nellie told her that several religious groups on Sasquan were claiming the miracle of her survival for their gods. That was another opinion Chris was willing to leave open to whatever interpretation people wanted to put it on. Captain Drago interrupted her lunch. The aliens are breaking as they come around the sun, but they have launched stone, iron, and lead bullets at the planet. These are not slowing. They're headed our way at several hundred thousand kilometers an hour, and it looks like they are aiming for major cities. Chris tossed her napkin on the table. Enough of diplomacy. Now we get to fight, she said. 46. The 500-ton bullets were coming in fast. Twelve of them, each made of whatever the aliens had been able to get their hands on. No doubt they'd made a major hole in whatever they hit. And what they would hit would very likely be a major city. If not intercepted, every one of them was headed for an impact within one or two kilometers of the center of a major urban area, the 12 largest cities on the planet. Good shooting, Captain Drago was heard to mutter. Too bad we'll have to spoil their shoot, Chris said. She'd ordered the Endeavor to cast off and head out immediately. As she did, Nellie and Chris went over several possible shoot scenarios. They ordered the simplest one. The Endeavor did a deorbital burn, dropped down to graze the planet's atmosphere, then slingshot herself up into an orbit that put her 50,000 kilometers above the planet, headed for the incoming slugs. A 100,000 kilometers below the targets, she hit the first three with a head-on shot, cutting them in half. Endeavor then did a flip ship and deceleration maneuver while using her aft batteries to fillet the next three. She repeated that again and there were 24 half-size bullets headed in, but on slightly different courses than they had been a few minutes before. Chris could only imagine the rejoicing among the ostriches as their laser sliced targets exactly as they intended. No doubt there would be a lot of chest bumping later, but not now. Now they sliced and diced what was left of the bullets hurtling toward the cat world. Every 15 seconds or so, the Endeavor would lash out at the bullets, dicing them into quarters, eighths, sixteenths, and smaller. Whatever energy wasn't needed to recharge the lasers went into the engines, breaking the Endeavor in orbit and heading her back down. It wouldn't do for the little Endeavor to run into the entire enemy fleet all by herself. Captain Odell reported, however, that the ostriches were quite willing to do so. The aliens' first shots did slam into Sasquan, but not as 500-ton streamlined bullets— Instead, they hit the atmosphere as ragged, jagged chunks of 30 tons or less, rolling and out of control. By the time the atmosphere had its go at eroding them, they hit the ground as meteorites of 10 tons or less. That might be hard on the two or three dwellings that got flattened, but they were no longer city killers. Whatever doubts the cats might have held about Chris's true intent vanished with the demise of the slug strike. The air waves were unanimous in their praise of Chris as their planet's savior. Let's hope they're still saying that after the battle, Chris muttered. The Endeavor made its orbit again and rejoined the squadron. The problem was she was low on reaction mass. She'd used a lot going against the laws of physics. The bulwark launched its pinnace over to refuel her. The bulwark had come out from the gas giant with more fuel than the other frigates, it was a joke among the skippers that the skipper of the bulwark was always afraid of running out of fuel and always took on extra. Now no one kidded him, and Captain Odell was grateful for the help. For the upcoming battle, Chris intended to use a similar orbit to the one Endeavor had used, 
only she'd sling herself around the moon to get farther out and be on a better angled orbit. Like her enemy, Chris would be breaking. But with any luck, Chris would be closer to the cat world if she did so. That would put her in the perfect position to cross the T of the alien line, able to shoot up their vulnerable sterns, hit their engines, and rake their reactors with all her ships, while few of them could reply. At least that was the plan. And like all battle plans, it didn't survive contact with the enemy. 47. Chris's squadron had reached the apogee of their orbit above the moon and were beginning to fall back toward the cat planet. The aliens were off to her left, still breaking. Chris studied their deployment from her flag plot. On other days, it was her day quarters, but today it was organized to command the developing battle. Screens around her reported the availability of every ship's lasers, armor, reactors, and other critical systems. Chris had been alone when she fought her last battle from this same space. Today, Jack kept her company. It was nice to have his supporting presence, but she somehow doubted she'd find time to even notice him. Her eyes roved from screen to screen. No surprise, the aliens had upped their deceleration for a bit and were farther out than Chris had planned for. The extra deceleration meant they would have to do some reaching to make orbit, but it would allow them more maneuverability when the shooting started. Chris would not always be able to count on having their vulnerable engines and reactors pointed her way. Trade-offs, trade-offs. This was a surprise Chris had expected. Then they did the unexpected. The first seven upped their deceleration, which put the other 15 rapidly climbing up their rear. However, as the next eight overtook the vanguard, they slewed aside to take station on their far side. Then they also upped their deceleration. The last seven ships slid in smoothly on the side closest to Chris's squadron. That done, they all resumed their previously scheduled fleet deceleration. Instead of facing a long line whose T Chris could easily cross, she was now confronted by three much shorter lines. One was a few hundred kilometers closer to her, but the other two were in a perfect position to flank Chris if she tried to have her squadron take that line on alone. They formed squadrons, Chris said softly to herself. I bet you didn't see that coming, Jack said. Actually, I kind of expected something like that, Chris said, still half talking to herself. I was thinking they'd form a dish like in the last fight, but three lines have advantages as well. They aren't dumb, Jack said. <laughs> I never said they were. No, I don't believe you have, he agreed. So, now what? We use our 20-inch lasers for best effect, and boy, do I wish I'd brought along just two of those 22-inch war wagons. This will be a slugfest, Jack concluded. It's looking that way. They outweigh us. If they manage to come alongside and board, they'll bury us in bodies. However, we have the reach, and unless I'm mistaken, they don't have any armor. Chris, Chief Benny has been doing his best to get a solid mass determination on those ships, Nellie said. And they do have armor, Jack said softly. The ships are massing more than they did the last time we met them. Every one of them is different but there seems to be between forty-five and 75,000 tons more shipped there. Nellie, how many extra tons were on the ship we shot up at the Hornet's arsenic planet? I estimate there were fifteen to 20,000 tons of rock, Chris, that we had to punch through before we could hit the soft, chewy center. There is likely double or more armor on these hulls. So it's maybe twice as bad as the last time? It looks that way, Chris. Pass that word to all the captains with my compliments and suggest that they plan on hitting the same place on their target's hull as hard as they can, as often as they can. I've sent it, Chris. They were at 300,000 clicks and closing when Chris ordered the fleet to set condition Charlie. She saw no reason to let the aliens know any sooner than she had to that their targets could get smaller. The former mutineers pitched in, manning the Wasp's extra reactor. Those who weren't engineers mustered with the Marines to repel boarders. Samson stayed sedated in the brig. It was tiny, but it was locked. 
Jacques and Amanda joined the 20 alien recruits in a space reserved for them at the center of gravity for the Wasp. Hopefully that would make the jinking around easier on them. And hopefully Jacques could find words to explain what was going on. Chris had so wanted to talk to an alien ever since the first time they gave her a choice between killing them or dying herself. Now she had her own pet aliens and she hadn't found a second to talk to them. The problem, of course, was that these aliens were of a different tribe from the strong, silent types that wanted her dead. Oh, and the tame aliens didn't have all that big of a vocabulary. Someday the world would have to present Chris with a few easy problems. Someday, hopefully sooner rather than later. Physics ruled space warfare. In ancient days, ship battles had depended on the wind. No wind, no battle. Too much wind and the ships might find themselves struggling to stay afloat more than fight each other. Space battles were very much like that, only it was gravity that ruled the roost. And while gravity might be more constant than the wind, it was no less a master of the battle. The alien warships were decelerating, aiming to make orbit around the cat world. What they'd do there was an exercise best left to horror. Chris was on a course to intercept them. Gravity ruled both their vectors. But laser power might very well trump gravity's vectors. At 160,000 clicks, Chris ordered all her ships to condition Z. 30 seconds later, she ordered them to cut deceleration and face the enemy. Seven of her ships lashed out at the closest seven enemy ships, with six 20-inch lasers each. No surprise, the targets shed rock and droplets of steel. Some shut off steam as ice burned away to gas. The targets got fuzzy but showed no serious damage. Chris flipped ships, paused for a second or two for the gunk to fall behind, then hit them with the aft batteries. The targets fizzed as ice and rock armor ablated away under the lasers probing, but again, no explosions. Chris brought her squadron back on course and returned to a deceleration burn as her lasers recharged. Twenty seconds later, she repeated the double volley. Twenty seconds after that, she did it again. This time, the closest enemy squadron showed damage from the pounding. One blew up and two staggered out of line, their engines firing in directions they weren't intended to. The other four turned bow onto Chris's squadron and charged. Above and below those surviving four, the other two lines of ships did the same. Their commander was now much less concerned with making orbit than getting in range of Chris's ships and slamming them with their main battery of more lasers than Chris had ever had a chance to count. Maybe whoever was giving the orders didn't care if they made orbit so long as they destroyed Chris's ships. Who's your enlightened one? Chris ignored the question and ordered her ships to flip. They began jinking and danced away. Now Chris was between a rock and a hard place. Specifically, the moon she'd been using to swing above now was coming up fast below her. The enemy, desperate to get in range to use their own huge battery of lasers, were coming up nearly as fast behind her. Chris's ships emptied their now recharged aft batteries. One more ship blew up, but the surviving close-in three absorbed their hits and kept coming. The Hornet at one end and the Bulwark on the other end of Chris's line took on the new ships coming in range. They fired and got only fuzz to show for their shooting. Chris flipped ships again. Her middle three ships finished off the first squadron they'd attacked. Two ships blew and the last lost all acceleration and just drifted in space. However, the other two squadrons had closed the range as Chris's ships exterminated their fellows. Enemy lasers began to crisscross the space around her ships. In her flag plot, boards began to slip from green to yellow as ships reported their armor taking hits. Reaction mass and water bled out of the damage into space to disrupt the lasers just as the enemy's rock, ice, and steel armor had splayed out Chris's lasers. It was the same for both sides, except that while the alien's gunk quickly fell behind the decelerating ships, Chris's bleed of ice and hydrogen fouled the middle ground between them for a few critical moments more. Now 15 alien ships charged in to narrow the range for their four to five hundred tons of angry, suicidal commitment to Chris's doom. Chris, we will miss the moon, Nellie reported. But if we keep this up, 
we'll have trouble making a good orbit around the planet. We'll worry about that later, Nellie. Chris studied her boards. Now her ships were slugging it out as best as they could, dancing the crazy jig that never kept them on a straight course for more than two seconds, a dance that dodged the aimed enemy fire. The enemy's 15 ships were huge and overweight. They were too heavy on their feet to dance like Chris's, but what they lacked in finesse, they more than made up for with their huge batteries. Chris's ships fired and reloaded. The aliens fired and fired and fired. Never for a moment were they silent. Worse, most of Chris's ships now faced two of them. Only at the head of the line was the Endeavor able to fight a single alien, applying her limited battery of six 18-inch lasers as best she could. The big war wagons, the Hornet, Constellation, Royal, Wasp, Congress, Intrepid, and Bulwark, each divided its attention between two ships, firing bow batteries at one, aft batteries at the other. This kept each of the enemy ships shedding bow armor, rock, steel, and steam spread down the hull, dispersing their own lasers and occasionally causing damage. That was good. The bad news was that her ships weren't hammering through the alien armor to smash reactors inside. The worst news was Chris's ships were taking hits. Damage was accumulating. Chris could lose this battle if she kept fighting it this way. Wasp, Congress, Intrepid, concentrate on one ship opposite you and kill it, she ordered bluntly. Seconds seemed to take forever, and minutes vanished in a blink. The battle went on with her ships firing, flipping, firing, recharging, then doing it over and over again. The enemy fire hammered them. The constellation suffered damage to a rocket motor and zigged out of her place in the line. Unfortunately, she also steadied on a course for more than two seconds. The luckless Connie took more hits. The royal changed fire from the two she faced to slice at the one that had the Connie's number. It worked for a second. The enemy ship's fire faltered, and the Connie got her engines under control. But Royal paid for saving her shipmate, as her own two targets got off scot-free for a few seconds. Now her armor showed bright red on Chris's boards. Across from the Wasp, the enemy ship rocked as a laser slashed through its bow and cut deep inside. It hit a reactor and freed the demons inside. Gouts of plasma shot out its sides, but its huge batteries kept shooting. Chris watched the readout on her board as the wasp's armor went from yellow to red. The wasp flipped and the bow lasers fired. There must have been nothing left of the alien's bow. Six lasers cut through it and deep into its guts. More fire blossomed within the shattered hull, but angry lasers still reached out, cutting through the thin vapor of the space around the ship. Even as the reactors lost containment and the plasma demons gobbled up the ship, it was still spitting death at the wasp. Captain Drago, engage one of the ships fighting the Royal. On it, Admiral. The wasp didn't miss a beat as it flipped ship and began slicing into the ship that Royal had been splitting its fire with. Royal, the wasp has the ship closest to it. You concentrate on the other one, Chris ordered. Great, and even fight. Royal Skipper said and laid into the one target. The Intrepid did not finish off its ship in quite a spectacular fashion as the Wasp. Its target ended up rolling in space, a silenced hulk with fires gutting it from stem to stern. Chris ordered Intrepid to turn its attention to the ships attacking the bulwark. She did it none too soon. The poor Endeavor was in trouble. She only had six 18-inch lasers and her armor had been thin to begin with. She was hurting. The bulwark switched fire to engage the Endeavor's ship. The forward end of Chris's line was still two ships against four, with the Endeavor giving all that it could. In front of Chris, her board showed way too much red. Suddenly, two alien ships blossomed into gas, and there were no ships facing the Royal and the Wasp. Royal helped the Kami, Wasp helped the Intrepid. Now there were four fair fights. The gallant Hornet was still being hammered by two, as was the Bulwark, but the enemy ships must have been hit just as hard as Chris's. The end came quickly, but none too soon. Enemy ships began to burn and explode, even as the Connie, Hornet, and Bulwark limped out of the fight, reactors dead, overheated or redlined. 
When the enemy saw that the day was lost, all the ships that had fallen by the wayside began exploding as containment fields were dropped, and plasma was intentionally let loose to finish what the fight had begun. Not one surrender, Chris groaned. They never do, Jack agreed. 48. The battle was won, but the squadron was still in dire straits. Chris, did you know that many of the French and Spanish ships the British captured at the Great Battle of Trafalgar were lost when a storm came up and blew them all onto the rocky shore? Yes, Nellie, I seem to remember reading that somewhere. We're in danger of smashing ourselves onto the planet below. Yes, I noticed, Nellie. Now shut up. Chris motored her high G station onto Captain Drago's bridge. Can the Wasp make orbit? Yes, we've got one reactor offline, but we can make it. I can't say the same for the Hornet, Constellation, and Bulwark. They're both down to a single reactor, and none of them are in good shape. Could we loan them a pinnace? If I do, I'm none too sure the Wasp will make orbit. Penny, Chris said, turning to her only staff officer, who had spent the battle on the Wasp's defensive station shuttling smart metal around to cover for hits on the armor. Yes? Can you merge the Hornet onto the Wasp? Say something like a pinnace? Penny was already shaking her head before Chris finished. No, Chris. The pinnace is a subsystem of the ship. The programming to generate it is there. Remember, the hull is a special program with all sorts of security overrides. You can't just slide it all away from, say, one beam to let another hull merge with it. Chris said a most unprincess like word, but then she was an admiral today and she'd been told that sailors cussed. We've got ships that aren't going to make orbit if we don't do something. Get me a fix, not back talk. Maybe we could adjust the two ships' hulls so they could come alongside and kind of dock together? Make it happen, Penny. Find a good chief and do what you have to do. Otherwise, some of our ships are going to burn up on re-entry. That's bad for our people, but worse for the people on the planet we're supposed to be saving. I'm on it, Penny said, with a huge sigh her late husband's Irish grandma would have been proud of. Whether it was Penny or, more likely, a lot of good chiefs on the Wasp and Hornet, the two ships did end up docking hard, but docking enough that between the Wasp's two good reactors and the one they could keep running on the Hornet, they made orbit. Once Penny and the chiefs had shown it could be done, the Constellation and the Royal got cozy, and the Bulwark sidled up and not quite rammed her bow into the Congress. Captain Odell asked permission to try the same with the Intrepid. One of the Endeavor's reactors was out, and the other two were none too reliable. Eight ships had gone out to face the aliens. Four of sorts succeeded in reaching orbit again. On the ground, you could easily see fireworks and great rejoicing. In Chris's day quarters, there was little to celebrate. She had the butcher's bill to read. The frigates were crewed by 400 men and women. 250 boffins and 50 marines topped them out at 700. The wasp tipped in at some 900, what with extra marines and scientists. Her squadron had avoided the catastrophic failure of a reactor that consigned all aboard to a fiery grave. Still, the enemy lasers had cut deep. Chris read the list. 612 dead, 1,452 wounded, with some still likely to die despite all that modern medicine could do. The Hornet, Connie, and Bulwark were hardest hit, although the Endeavor's smaller crew had suffered heavier casualties in proportion. What had shown up on Chris's boards as bright red for damaged armor, lasers, and engineering had been real men and women dying, as lasers slashed hard into their ships and defensive stations juggled armor around desperately to keep disaster at bay. Chris leaned back in her chair, stared at the overhead, and found she could fervently pray. Please, dear God, may I never fight another one like this. But there was more to do than mourn the dead. The living needed to eat, and they needed to celebrate that they'd once again faced death, looked it in the eye, and walked away from its hungry scythe. Chris, do you have a moment? Captain Drago said after knocking on the door sill. Talk to me, Chris said, putting down the report of blood and loss. 
Cookie tells me that he's got a deal on meat. Cheap. As in, free. All we have to do is go down and get it. Can we afford the reaction mass? When our longboats go down for chow, they'll be bringing back water as well. That's one way to feed the reactor and feed the crew. Free meat. Are you sure we can eat it? The Buffins are pretty sure. The meat offer came with a full scientific analysis of what goes into the locals' digestion. A certain President Alma wanted you to know that they were providing the full details on their physiology. To make sure, I'll be sending down a doc to make the necessary tests, but I'd rather try it than not. If Cookie says he can make it taste good, go for it. And the water. We aren't bone dry on reaction mass, but we'll need to refuel before we leave here. Captain Drago stepped in and closed the door. Let me guess. You want to refuel from the gas giant on the other side of the system? The one where the aliens set up a base? Chris made a sour face. I'd like to wipe this system clean, but these damage reports... She said, waving her hands at her boards. Yeah, it would be nice if we had a repair ship to tie up to. But we have a lot of good ship maintainers, and we can do a lot with this smart metal. We've done a lot. I've got some folks working on figuring out if we can drain the smart metal from our two wrecked ships. Maybe move the reactors out of them and into a ship that still has some fight in it. I'll have that report cycled through to you as soon as they're done. Do, Chris said. She ended up studying reports for the rest of the evening. Jack brought her a meal from the wardroom, and Chris ate it at her desk. It was quite late when Jack finally hauled her off to bed. When she ignored the wonderful things he was doing to her breasts, he rolled her over like a log and began doing even more wonderful things to her back. Am I distracting you yet? he asked. Well, you are definitely attracting my attention, Chris admitted. She stretched and found it made a lot of her feel very good. Good. Because I am not stopping, young lady. Persistent, huh? She said into her pillow as he did something wonderful to the lower part of her back and then went lower. You fought your fight. You won. I'd like to celebrate that I'm alive, if you don't mind. And you want to celebrate it with me? Most definitely. She rolled over and smiled at her persistent husband. Then I guess I'd better let you celebrate. So he did. Then she did. Then they both did until they fell asleep in each other's arms. 49. The ships moaning around them woke Chris in time for breakfast. They quickly showered. Jack kissed her very black and blue spots where she'd been shot, then found some cream to put on them. It seemed he now had a supply of medical ointments and drugs for all the particulars that ailed her. Husbands were nice. They made it to the wardroom while the officers were still eating. What's up with the racket? Jack asked, as they found a space at Captain Drago's table. We're pulling the smart metal out of the hornet and re-spinning it into the wasp. The hornet's hull was barely holding out the vacuum by the time the shooting stopped. Their wardroom and mess, along with most everything else, got smashed up pretty bad, so you may notice some new faces at our tables. Captain Phil Tausig of the Hornet arrived as he spoke. He had a bandage over one eye and an arm in a sling, but he was balancing a plate full of eggs and bacon with great aplomb. Welcome aboard, Chris said. I can't tell you how glad I am to be aboard. I seem to be making a habit of this, coming aboard your flag in a roughed-up state. I'll try to avoid it in the future. If you need a port, we'll provide the storm, Nellie said. That was a joke, Chris said. Of course. Phil took a bite of his bacon and made a face. I'm not complaining, but this is a bit on the strange side. Locally grown, Drago said. Just arrived last night. Phil took another bite. Not bad. Will it mess up my gut anything like the last local rations I had to share? I have it on the best of confidences, Captain Drago said that this chow is as good for you as any you got from your mama's breast. I was a bottle baby, Phil said. 
much to my wife's delight in my adult fixations. So we have ourselves some locals that are really glad for something our princess did. Isn't that unusual? No doubt, and totally, Captain Drago agreed. But there is no accounting for tastes, and we are enjoying their, no doubt, short-lived appreciation. Don't I ever get credit where it's due? Chris asked the overhead. No, nope, and not likely seemed to be the table's consensus. At least it was from the general and captains. There were a few lowly lieutenants at the foot of the table who kept their own counsel and, no doubt, tried not to be shocked by the carrying on of their seniors. How's the reaction mass coming along? Chris asked. Much better than I expected, Captain Drago said. Thank heavens for smart metal again. We've re-rigged several of our longboats into water tenders. They drop down and pick up as much fresh water as their antimatter engines can lift. By late today, we should have enough aboard to allow us to motor quite stately out to that other gas giant you were interested in. By tomorrow morning, I expect to have enough for a safety margin that will warm the cockles of even an old nanny such as myself. Gas giant, Phil said, swallowing his dried eggs and bacon. I want to clean out the last of this rat's nest, Chris said. They sent 22 of their 24 ships, Drago said. That leaves two, plus whoever they have keeping their hands warm around the four large reactors we've spotted over there. What do we have left to fight them with? Phil asked. That's what I'm waiting to find out today, Chris said. And no, Phil, if we don't have enough firepower, we go home. I'll even allow for a 50% safety margin. Do we know these dudes well enough to know what 50% is for our safety margin? He asked with a grin. You've been with me too long, Chris said with a sigh. And I'd like to point out I've survived all of it so far. Chris looked around. Drago, is there any wood to knock on? It's all smart metal, the skipper of the Wasp reported. I have a real wooden desk, Chris said. You can drop by after breakfast and knock on it. You can also try your hand at figuring out what a 50% safety margin is. I think I will. So it was that Jack and Phil ended up sitting around Chris's conference table studying the schematics of the revised and readjusted ships when Penny and Masao dropped in. Is that what the new ships will look like? Penny asked. I have no idea what they will actually look like from the outside, Chris said. But this is what they will be packing and what will be pushing them through space. Each ship is different, Penny said, after a quick glance at the boards. It all depends on what the BEMs left us after the last fight, Jack said. The Wasp Hornet looks to be in the best shape, Chris said. Between the two of them, we can patch together eight forward 20-inch lasers. We have two of the Wasp's reactors and one from the Hornet to go with the one from the Sisu. We only have three aft lasers. The bad guys were aiming for the stern, and it was hard on reactors and aft batteries. Any chance we can move one of those lasers aft? Phil asked. Not in the time I'm willing to take, Chris said. Sorry about the stern, Penny said dryly. I had armor shuttling back and forth from the bow to the stern, depending on which way you had us going. So what will our armor thickness be? Penny asked herself likely to be responsible for the defensive station in the next fight. Even at Condition Z, we'll only have 85% of the planned offensive depth. How much hell will I have to protect us against? Penny asked no one, then went on. What about the Royal Connie? Aside from getting the best name in this lash-up, Phil said, taking over the story since he was standing in front of that pair of ship schematics, it looks like there are only seven lasers surviving from their forward batteries. Aft, we have two lasers and three reactors. Pretty heavy casualties for those two. The armor belt will only have 60% of the norm. That's kind of thin, Penny said. The intrepid bulwark has another good name, Jack said. She also has seven lasers forward. Her reactors are in the same state as the Wasps, with two of her own good one from the larger reactor from the Bulwark and the borrowed one from the Sisu. Aft, she has three lasers. Her armor has again been thinned down a bit, 60%, maybe 55, depending on how small we make the ship in Condition Z. The Congress Endeavor, Chris said, taking back the story, 
<laughs> Sounds somehow dirty. Or maybe Jack's just having an evil influence on me. Jack allowed that he might, and Phil congratulated him on that. Chris went sternly on. Only two of the Endeavor's six lasers survived, one fore and one aft. The casualties among the Alwyns were high. Only one of her reactors is still workable. The Congress is in pretty good shape, four lasers forward and two aft. Two of her reactors are also online. Almost all of the armor they have is from the Congress, and it's only going to give 55% of the depth she had in the last fight. Penny fixed Chris with a jaundiced eye. And you want to take this collection of patchwork wrecks into another fight? Chris winced. But there are only two warships over there. For all we know, the reason they stayed behind was that they are not fit for space. We need to wipe this bunch out, once and for all. But if they are combat ready and looking for a fight to defend what's left of their wives and kids, Penny said, then we approach them carefully. Come to a halt well out of range and use the advantage our 20-inch lasers give us. Does that sound like a plan to any of the rest of you? Penny demanded. Pretty much, Phil said. Have any of you considered that the more time we spend with this crazy woman, the more likely we are to trot along eagerly with her next insane idea? Yep, pretty much, and that's what I see happening. The last came from Masao and was accompanied by a broad smile. You men, Penny said, but her show of exasperation was mellowed by a growing grin as well. Okay, count me in too. Through the day, the schematics of the four compound frigates began to grow on Chris's boards as chiefs and sailors went about rationalizing and resolving some of the more difficult problems of pulling gear from one ship and mounting it on another. Storerooms, quarters, water mains, and air ducts had to be moved around as reactors were slipped from one hull to the next. Slowly, a single hull began to take shape that men and women could live in, fight in, and if necessary, die in. Chris had made the decision to merge her squadron's eight ships into four. With that decision made, she found herself mainly an observer, as chiefs and sailors did the work under the supervision of the division heads. Occasionally, a decision got passed higher up. Phil left most of the calls to his executive officer, but occasionally the XO would call him. He'd listen, then politely excuse himself from Chris's day quarters to consult with Captain Drago on his bridge. They'd talk, resolve the problem, and pass it down. Chris never had a question passed up to her level. She wasn't sure just how she felt about her new, rarefied rank that left her twiddling her thumbs as all those around her stayed busy. When she tried to involve herself in Amanda and Jacques' work, she found them pretty much ignoring the aliens on board so they could study the society sprawled across the planet below them. It really is amazing, Amanda said. They have little or no computers, but their economy is complex and global. I know that historically we humans did something like this back on old Earth, but I've never had a chance to closely observe a mashup like this. It's like I'm in a time machine. Chris went back to her quarters and watched, as more spaces vanished or were moved around in her ships. As supper approached, Phil ducked out to talk to Captain Drago for a moment, then both of them presented themselves. Admiral, you are invited to a dinner in your honor in the forward lounge, Captain Drago said. Dinner in the forward lounge, Chris said. The uniform is dress blues with all your medals and decorations, Phil added. Chris gave them both the evil eye. What's going on here? We will see you in an hour, Drago said. Don't disappoint us, Phil added, as the two left. Chris found her day cabin suddenly emptying, as Penny and Masao also vanished away. Jack, Nellie, what's going on? Chris demanded of the only two who were still with her. Nothing mutinous, my love, Jack said, grinning his most lopsided grin ever. So you're in on it. Et tu, Nelly? Your Latin pronunciation is atrocious, Chris, but yes, I do know, and no, I won't tell you. Honey, you just have time to shower and get dressed, Jack said, bowing and ushering Chris toward their night quarters. Shall we? Was not a question. 
So, just time to shower and get dressed. <laughs> Not a second for something else, Chris said with a sly grin. Be a good girl and we shall see. But you always say I'm best when I'm naughty, Chris said. Jack sighed. Naughty and nice in one long, tall package. So she was. Fifty. Captain Drago and Commander Phil Tausig were in dress blues as they appeared to greet Chris and Jack as they came from their night quarters exactly one hour later and not a second sooner. An escort, Chris said. What with all the modifications, I wasn't sure you could find your way to the forward lounge, the wasp skipper said. Nellie, you're not putting in that you could guide me anywhere. What's up? Chris, this is a thoroughly human moment. I'm observing and keeping my mouth shut. Thank you very much. This is going to be a very strange evening. Despite the report to the contrary, they easily found their way to the forward lounge. A tin hut, Admiral on deck greeted them as they entered. For the first time in her life, Chris didn't immediately shush those offering her this honor. She was too waylaid by what she saw. The forward lounge had been converted into one huge wardroom. As far as she could see, officers stood at their linen-covered tables, china and silverware before them. Every surviving officer, even some who looked pretty banged up, were there. There were even a few ostriches doing their best to stand to attention with the humans. Someone tapped a glass, and they began as one to sing, For She's a Jolly Good Fellow. The song went on. Someone had added stanzas that would never be appropriate for children, but seemed right at home among her victorious warriors. Through it all, Chris just stood there. Maybe her eyes did mist up a bit, but it must have been a flaw in the life support system. Some irritant in the air, no doubt. It must have been. Beside her, Jack was having the same problem. The song ended with a rousing cheer, and Chris began to make her way to her usual head table. Her progress was slow. Every ship's captain and a lot of their senior division heads were along the main aisle, and they wanted to shake her hand. Even Captain Odell was there with her collection of female officers and four Alwyn gun captains who had survived the fight. Chris got a chest bump from one of them. It was a gentle one, at least gentle enough not to crush ribs. It took her a long time to get to the head table, but waiting for her there were not only Penny and Massau, but also President Almar of Cullum Almar and Prime Minister Garo of the Basalt Kingdom. They greeted Chris with a bow and Chris returned it from the waist. Again, Zara Octorina stepped forward to translate. Her harness today was red, with golden buckles and spangles. We are glad that you live to meet us again, President Almar said as the room fell quiet, again in response to someone's tapped glass. We are all glad to meet you again, Chris said. You have won a most wonderful battle, Prime Minister Garreau added. A lot of people have won that battle. And many of them are not here to celebrate this victory with us. Yes, yes, President Almar said. Thus it is always. Good young felines die for the homes of their mothers and the graves of their foremothers. We can only offer you our humble thanks that you, who have no homes or graves here, have done us a service we could not do for ourselves. We did what our duty to all sentient life required, Chris said. Yes, so you have told us, Almar agreed. But we must offer you tokens of our gratitude, even if they are but minor tokens. They are ours to give, and we give them to you. The president looked to her right, and two cats, tawny gold coats marked off with the same red and gold harness as the translator, came forward. One carried a long black pike with silver and jewel inlays along the finely worked point, the other a large sword, its two-handed grip wrapped in gold filigree and studded with sparkling jewels. Almar stepped forward and took the black-handled pike. A feline is never without her weapons, she said, and where a moment ago had been a softly furred hand, now five long claws sprang forth. 
However, we learned quickly enough that a good pike could outreach the sharpest claw. Among our people, the Colnon halberd with its long reach and its sharp blade has defended us from many an attack. In the last two hundred years, few have been honored with the gift of the Colnon halberd by proclamation of the Congress of Colum. Today, we hope you will accept this from us. She handed the ancient weapon to Chris. Chris accepted it with a bow and a thank you. The room cheered. Chris raised the halberd high so all could see it. She twisted it so that its sharp edge flashed in the light. When the applause slowed, she handed it off to Jack. He accepted it with a bow and stood beside her, the Colnon halberd at attention. Chris did the handoff to Jack because Prime Minister Garreau was coming forward and motioning to the sword bearer to approach as well. The Prime Minister cleared her throat and spoke. Among our people, the most ancient of honors is to join their king in the charge. We hope you will allow us to bestow on all of your officers the honor of being members of the king's charge. We ask also that you allow us to bestow on the captains of your ships the honor of commanders in the king's charge. I gladly accept these honors in their names, Chris said, wondering where this was going and why there was one sword bearer still standing off. The prime minister's tail twitched and the sword bearer came to stand beside her. My king has bidden me to offer you her highest honor. She wishes to raise you to king sword bearer and commander of the king's charge the Prime Minister bowed. In the thousand years of our recorded history, we have no higher honor. The sword-bearer presented the sword to Chris, handle first. She withdrew it from its gold and bejeweled scabbard and flourished it above her head, careful not to slice the overhead or dent the blade. Who knows which is tougher, smart metal or this steel? No doubt it would be the smart metal, but it would be a shame to find out otherwise. When the cheering died down, the two leaders of the most powerful lands on the planet below did not suggest that someone serve the meal. No, two more warrior types appeared with boxes in their hands. These were made of fine wood, beautifully polished, and just the right size for awards. Chris recognized the sizes of the boxes. One was as big as the one that came in the mail from Earth and contained the Order of the Wounded Lion— the other was about the size of the box that Admiral Kratz had tossed to Chris and revealed the Pour la Merit, Imperial Greenfeld's highest honor. All had come without fanfare. Apparently, the felines intended to start Chris on a new tradition. When she opened these boxes, they would really feel like awards. Again, President Almar went first. She opened the smaller of the two boxes it showed a silver shield with crossed golden swords hung from a watermarked red ribbon with golden edges. This is the Medal of Highest Valor. For the last two hundred years, it has been the highest award for valor given by the people of Callum. We offer it to you. So saying, she stepped forward and slipped around Chris to fasten it around her neck. President Elmar whispered something. It's getting crowded here. Nellie translated. Tell her that it is no less welcomed in the name of all those who fought, bled, and in too many cases died with such valor, Nellie. Chris's collarbone spoke softly. The president did not seem surprised. Again, the prime minister came second. She opened the larger box and drew out a long yellow sash with a golden medallion. The order of the rose and the thistle is the highest order in our kingdom, she said. For those who are recognized for their civic contributions, the rose is first on the medallion. For those who win it on the field of battle, the thistle takes the place of honor. Your medallion is the first of its kind. The thistle and rose surround an image of our solar system. We suspect there is more to this symbol than we have yet plumbed the depths of— she finished with a wry smile. Now President Almar came to stand beside the Prime Minister. All of you will find at your place a simple wooden box. Please open it now. In it, you will find an expression of our gratitude. It is the Defender of the Star Award, 
and it is meant for all of you who fought for us. Unlike what we have been giving here, it is an award that the people of Colum and the king of Bizalt give together. This is the first such joint endeavor. We hope it will be the beginning of a long and fruitful cooperation. Penny opened hers and showed it to Chris. Like the Medal of Highest Valor, it was in the form of a three-cornered shield. In place of the crossed swords, this one showed a sunburst. Here was an award that looked forward and out, not to the past and what it had meant. Penny gave Chris a wink. Yep. We've started something, now to help them finish it in the best way we can. Servers began to circulate among the tables, bringing plates full of roasted something, petite red potatoes or something like it, and a bean that the server suggested that Chris not look too closely at. Cookie and Mother MacReady made it taste wonderful wherever it came from. The president and prime minister joined Chris at her table. They were served a plate of raw meat, seasoned with flakes of something green and purple. Chris didn't have to make an effort to not look too closely at that. Your general commanding your guard, who I understand is also your mate, advised us that we should not have a banquet in your honor the day that you came to our association assembly, President Almar mentioned as the meal progressed. Something about it being a fast day for your religion? Chris glanced at Jack. They both managed to suppress a laugh, if not a grin. I think that he feared that our culinary preferences might be as hard for you to take as we find your proclivity for burning good meat. I think you might be right, Chris said. You will forgive us, Penny said. Our digestion is only able to fully process meat that has been seared. It helps us digest it in ways that our stomachs can no longer do alone. We have been burning our fine meat, as you put it, for half a million years— do you have a wise saying that goes something like, one woman's meat is another woman's poison? The prime minister asked. We have one just like that, Chris agreed. May I ask what you will do now? President Almar asked. Chris put her fork down and turned to face the two leaders. We intend to clean up the alien holdout base on the other side of your system. We will go there ask them to surrender, and very likely have to fight them to their death. I noticed that all of the attacking ships were destroyed, Prime Minister Garreau said. Many were disabled in the fight, Chris said. When they found that the battle was lost, rather than surrender, they chose to do things to their reactors that caused them to blow up their ship. We are told that our nuclear reactors cannot explode, the president said, alarm showing at her muzzle. I don't believe yours can, Chris said. They can't, Nellie added. We use thermonuclear reactors, the next step up from yours, Chris added. I keep hearing that thermonuclear power is just 20 years away, the prime minister said. And it has been for the last 40 years. It is a difficult jump from fission to fusion. At least it was in our history, Chris admitted. If we can make the jump to our moon, might you be willing to share with us that secret? It is possible, if the request comes from all of your world's people, and a means can be found to share it peacefully, Chris said. If that is a deal you are offering, that is a deal we are taking, the Prime Minister said. You say that the Order of the Defender of the Star is your first joint effort, Chris said. The first of many both leaders said. Then let us give you a system that is all yours, Chris said, and raised her glass of water. Those around the table raised their own glasses. It seemed the locals did brew a most magnificent collection of beers. The mess was enjoying not only homegrown meat, but also home-brewed beer. Glasses clinked. The deal was done. Exactly how Chris would keep her side of the deal was something only a long knife could figure out. And they always did what they had to do, didn't they? 51. They were still accelerating at a comfortable 1G as they swung around the sun, headed for the gas giant on the other side of the system from the cat folks. 
Chris was holding her reduced squadron to normal gravity while more repairs and adjustments were made. Officially, Captain Drago was willing to put on 2.5 Gs. So were the others. Unofficially, they all asked Chris to go light on the spurs. She intended to. No doubt the coming battle would respect her good intentions. In a pig's eye. Clear of the sun, they now got their first good view of the alien base. Two ships, six huge reactors each, Chief Benny reported. The base has five mega reactors, larger than we'd usually build for a major city. Are their lasers charged? Captain Drago asked. I can't tell at this range, sir. Well, tell me as soon as you can, Chief. That's your main job for the next three days. Aye, aye, sir. Chris tracked the bridge conversation from her own Admiral's Bridge. Her space was now more formally a bridge. It was a fiction that impressed the visitors, and she had three of them. Two old felines, an admiral and a general, and the young translator, Zara Octorina. They sat at Chris's conference table now. Seated on stools, the seniors' tails nervously lashed back and forth. I don't think they like space, Nellie said. Would you want to be going into a battle totally dependent for everything, even the air you breathe, and completely different from any fight you'd ever been in? Chris, every battle we go into is different from any one we've ever been in. Chris almost heard a chuckle at the end of that. We're still two days away from any serious fight, Chris told the two. Nellie, please show our visitors the likely outline of the battle. Yes, Chris, Nellie answered primly. Nellie was no longer a secret, though Chris suspected that the general considered her some magic talisman. Nellie quickly showed the status of the gas giant and its moons ahead of them. The planet had a dozen moons, large and small, as well as a ring system. The two surviving alien warships are orbiting this small planet-sized moon. The reactors are also in orbit, so we assume they have built some sort of habitat in orbit rather than a ship. If they should choose to come out to fight us as we choose to come out to fight them, they'll have to make their decision tomorrow. Their likely course is thus, Nellie said, and several appeared on the screen. In one, they dived down, grazed the giant, then shot up to intercept Chris's ships faster and farther out. In the second, they swung around the second largest moon and intercepted Chris well before she got to where their habitat orbited. In the third, they rose up from that moon's gravity well and headed straight for Chris as she made her final approach. You can forecast your enemy's course of action that accurately? The admiral asked. Gravity defines what can be done, Chris said. In our ancient days, wind and currents defined what ships could do. Does your history have something like that? The admiral nodded. I knew old admirals who lived by wind and waves. It has been nice to tell a helmswoman to go there, and the ship does. The next generation may look back fondly on the control my generation had. But the next generation will have the stars, Chris said. She translated that as stride the stars with a hint of stalking for the pounce in it. Chris, are you sure we want to give these people the stars? Nellie. I'm descended from Native American warriors who like nothing better than a little horse raid. Maybe steal a wife, too, while he was at it. Yet today, I hate war as much as the next one. But you fight them so very well. Enough, Nellie. Which of these paths will your enemy follow? The general asked. I have no idea. We have a saying, you can plan your battle as much as you like, but your enemy gets a vote as to how it will go down. We have a saying much like that. You may hunt the long-toothed one, but she may also be hunting you. So you will prepare for all three of these, the admiral said. And a fourth. What if they choose to stay in orbit and not come out? That might be the worst option for you, the admiral said. You spotted the problem, Chris answered. I watched your battle, your, uh, you call them lasers right? Yes, Chris said. Light. Who would think that light could kill someone? The general grumbled. 
It seems that we have, but didn't know we had, the admiral admitted. At least some technical students have created them in their classrooms, but they take up way too much energy and do very little harm. And a baby takes a lot of work and shows nothing of the warrior skills she may have someday, Chris pointed out. And the first steam boilers were hardly able to cruise around a pond, the admiral said, nodding. Chris was grateful. These folks shook their head when they meant to shake their head and nodded when they meant to nod. That made it easier for her. Chris nodded back. Knowing how you power and arm your ships will make it easier for us to avoid a lot of wrong turns with nothing to show for them, the admiral said. Chris chose not to react to that. Yes, that may or may not be all it is cracked up to be, the admiral said and laughed. For the felines, a laugh was something that began deep in the throat and came out more as a loud purr than as a human laugh. Chris expected that she could get used to it. Phil Tausig arrived. He was supposed to take the visiting firewomen off Chris's hands for a tour of the ship ending in the forward lounge. Mother McCready had laid in a very large supply of beer and a single malt that aficionados said could easily hold its own against any scotch in human space. Chris's opinion of scotch was that it shouldn't be forced on anyone in or out of human space, but she kept her opinion to herself. Once Phil left, Chris settled herself at her desk and did admiral things. The report from Amanda and Jacques on the culture of the cats was interesting, but not complete. Chris doubted it ever would be. Whatever they were at present would not be what they were ten years from now. The synthesis of the reports on the original aliens and their homeworld was ongoing as well. Chris put it aside and ducked out to Captain Drago's bridge. Yes, the repairs and modifications were coming along. Yes, the lasers were online. Yes, the engineering spaces were being reorganized. No, there wasn't a problem bringing in the larger reactor from the Hornet to work with the Wasp's two smaller ones. Not spoken, but bubbling near the surface, was a strong hint that one admiral ought to take herself somewhere else and not bother the working people. Triss returned to her own spaces. She used her boards to take a walk through the four ships. It did look like the problem of sorting out two damaged ships and making them into one battle-worthy hull was coming along nicely. She had Nellie check the engineering reports and verify that there had been no reactor excursions or burbles in the flow of plasma to the engines during the gentle 1G cruise out. Chris, go find something to do, Nellie suggested. When the fight comes, you'll fight it. They'll fight it. Relax. Go jump Jack's bones or something. Computer! Behave yourself. I'm not a computer. I'm Nelly, and I was never taught by my loving, caring semi-owner to behave. So there. Chris went back and tried to lose herself in the reports on the original aliens. There was nothing new, no surprises. Her team had about squeezed everything there was from the data. They were refining it, but so far had not found or stumbled across or fell into anything that changed what Chris knew about them or had made a wild guess at. Chris decided she should go down and spend some time with the 20 aliens she'd recruited. Down two ladders, around three passageways, and Chris was totally lost. Nellie, where are they keeping the original aliens? Take a left at the next cross passageway. Go down the next ladder you come to. Ask me for directions again when you get there. Chris did. Or she started to. Chris had read in the after-action report that half of a Musashi marine platoon had been hit when an alien laser slashed through the hull. Twelve were dead and more wounded. Somewhere she'd noted that the Wasp had opened a memorial chapel to those Marines, but Chris hadn't noticed where it was. She walked by it. It was open. The Tory gate had no doors. Anyone at any time walking by could not help but see the twelve pairs of boots, twelve rifles, and twelve pictures standing along the far wall. In front of them was a sand garden. Somehow someone had either lifted sand up from Sasquan or programmed smart metal to create sand and rocks, the stonework appeared ancient. Lichen and moss seemed to cover them. 
Without thought or reflection, Chris found herself turning into the small memorial garden. On the walls were simple scrolls. Chris could not translate them for herself and did not ask Nellie to do so. There was a stone bench. Chris settled on it. For a long while, she stared, eyes hardly seeing, at this memorial to twelve who had given their lives under her command. Twelve who had died defending the feline planet in a space battle they had no real part to fight in. Something drew Chris's eyes around. She turned on her stone bench. The wall beside the Tory gate was etched with the names and pictures of all 187 of those who died on the Wasp and the Hornet in this, their most recent battle under her command. Now the sobs came. The grief that she had refused to touch racked her. Tears flowed as if they would never stop. She wept for those who had died and those whose lives went on with their flesh and blood and minds slashed and scarred in obedience to her commands. She almost wished she could think of some error on her part that she could beg their forgiveness for, but she had fought the fight as best she knew how. The enemy had been good. She and those who fought with her had been better. Better, but not good enough to fight these bitter killers and come away unscathed. Somewhere in her grief, Jack appeared at her side. His arms enfolded her. Ever ready, he produced a handkerchief. He held her, just held her, and said nothing. Thank you, Chris said when she found she could finally speak again. For what? For being you, for being here, for not lying to me and saying it's all right or some other crap like that. I don't lie, Jack said. I know. Don't I get any credit for getting Jack here, Nellie asked. Jack, is this on the way to the alien quarters from Admiral Country? I don't think so, he said. So tell me, Nellie, who gets credit for getting me here? I do, Chris. You had to do something. There's another battle coming, and you had a burr up your ass. You're impossible to live with. Nellie, your choice of words is getting way too close to the gutter. Blame Granny Rita. She would have told you that. She can, don't you? You do feel better, don't you? Chris leaned against Jack and found the last of the emotions draining out of her. Yes, I feel better. I'm alive. Twenty-two enemy ships worth of bloodthirsty killers are not. They will not wreck that planet full of kitties, bloodthirsty or no. How about something to eat? Jack said. Lately, you've only been picking at your food. Chris's stomach picked that moment to rumble, about 6.9 on the tummy rumbling scale. You might have a good idea, Jack. I was headed down to pester Jacques about our newly recruited aliens, who seem to be content to eat our meat and rest in the artificial sun outside the cave we've made for them. There's got to be something we can do with them. See why I gave her the wrong directions? Nellie said. You're going to have to be careful, Nellie, Jack said. You keep messing in the affairs of us humans, and we're going to mess back in your affairs. Yes, Nellie said, almost sounding contrite. There is that off button, and if I send you in the wrong direction too many times, you'll hire one of those dumb navigation systems and start using it. And you, smart girl, would be out of a job, Chris said taking the hand Jack offered her to help her up from her stony place. That might not be stone, but the smart metal seemed to have left her just as stiff and cold as real stone would have. The wardroom was serving dinner. They ate in good company and retired to their quarters. Chris told Jack they'd just cuddle. That was all she wanted, and he agreed. Whether Chris changed her mind or Jack changed it for her, she was glad for what came her way, she slept well that night, untroubled by ghosts. She'd have more before she slept again. Many more. 52. Next morning after breakfast, Chris connected with Jacques and did make it down to where they now housed the alien natives. Their quarters were more spacious and much more to their liking. 
they had what appeared to be three caves coming off a rock overhang. Below was a sandy area and what looked like a stream. When Chris crossed it, she found herself splashing. Apparently, a certain amount of the wasps' reaction mass was in use as a creek for them. They had their own fire and were roasting something that had no doubt until recently been alive on Sasquan. They seemed content. You chased off the other star walkers, the gray-bearded man said, no doubt in his voice. They will not walk among the stars again, Chris answered. Will you take more heads? The bald woman asked. We will either take their heads or they will take ours, Chris said. The bald woman shook her head. Nellie reminded Chris that this meant agreement among these people. Why do you have to take their head? Why do they want to take your head? Piped up a thin voice. Chris turned to see the young fellow whose leg injury had started all this. Now he was up and hobbling toward them, a young girl playmate following him like a shadow. They have land, the graybeard said. If you go in someone's land, you either run away from them or fight them. If you win, it is your land. That explanation seemed to satisfy all the adults listening. It didn't satisfy the young fellow. But look up in the sky at night, not this one, but the real sky. There is a lot of land. Every one of those dots of light is a star with land. Why fight? You will know when you are older, the bald woman said. That answer didn't seem any more acceptable to him than it had to Chris when she was his age. Can I go with you, Uncle Jacques? The anthropologist stepped forward. You can go with me if your father's father or your father's mother says you can, the anthropologist said. The if was in standard. Can we? Came in two-part harmony from both the boy and girl. Go, the grandfather said. Leave your betters in some quiet, and you be sure to feed them, Jacques. When they walk off with you to pester you with questions, they miss their meat here, and come home whining for meat that is already eaten. I will feed them, Jacques assured their elders. The four of them crossed the stream, opened the door painted to blend in with the forest motif, and stepped outside. Can I have my reader? Both kids begged. Jacques produced a pair of readers and gave them to the kids. In a moment, they were lost to a basic primer on letters and numbers, the kind of thing Chris had been given when she was three. You're teaching them to read? Chris asked. Their elders can't grasp the concept of symbols meaning anything. They aren't dumb. Drop them in the woods and they'll track a gnat that we can't even see when it's biting us on the ass. But try to get across to them the idea of three or four. <laughs> nope, not possible. Me, mine. One, two, many. Big many to some, but just many to most. But these kids... Chris said, waving at the two, then grabbing one and pulling them out of the way of a hurrying sailor. Chris had almost walked into enough poles, walls, ditches, whatever as a kid lost in her games to smile as she rescued this girl from a similar fate. We caught them just before their brains locked down. They're learning. Their brains are also sprouting synapses like a house of fire, just like one of our kids in their age range. They're learning to speak standard? Chris said, eyeing what the kids were reading. And they're picking it up like a dry sponge does water. They're also learning our vocabulary, a full modern vocabulary. They'll be like the others, only open to talking, Chris said. Yep, Doc Mead wants them back in the lab this afternoon. I don't think she'll mind if I bring them in early. She's studying them, matching them against the cadavers we have and the baselines we have from their folks. These kids' brains are so different from those of the elders we've got. Chris chewed that over. Jacques kept talking. So, in answer to the question you're not asking me, yes, it was worthwhile picking them up. But the very act of bringing them into our conversation is making them different. Different from their own tribe, different from the bloodthirsty killers among the stars— I have no idea where all this is heading, but it's opening up what was pretty locked down beforehand. I'm going to judge this as good, Chris said. Chris, Captain Drago wants to talk to you. Why? Chris asked. 
There's a problem up ahead. Maybe it's nothing, but he'd like you to know about it sooner rather than later. Jacques raised an inquiring eyebrow. Chris shrugged. You take the kids to the doctor and I'll see what's worrying the captain. And she walked off quickly. Admirals never run. That might scare the average sailor and really scare their officers. But admirals can walk very, very quickly. 53. Chris decided to use her day quarters as a shortcut through to the Wasp's Bridge. Captain Drago had told Chris never ever to even think of doing that, but now looked like a good time to break that rule. So she was very surprised to find Captain Drago and Chief Benny waiting for her in what they had turned into her flag plot. What's the rush? Chris asked, her stomach already in free fall from the looks on their faces. The enemy isn't there anymore, Captain Drago said. What? brought Chris up short. Chief, explain this to the Admiral. Yes, sir, the old retired chief said. He had a black box in his hand and began tapping it. One of Chris's large screens converted to show what Chris had looked at so many times in the last few days, a visual of the gas giant and its moons. Always it had shown the enemy base camp orbiting one moon. Now it showed nothing. What happened? Chris demanded. I don't know, ma'am. One minute it was showing the reactors and other electronic hums. The next minute it's showing nothing. Not a thing. Of course, with the speed of light lag time, whatever it quit showing, Captain Drago pointed out, quit happening a while back. Yes, yes, I know, Chris said. But what did they do? Could they be masking their emissions? The Aitichi had a way of throwing off our sensors in the last war, Chris remembered. Yes, somehow the bastards could throw off our radar and laser rangefinders by a couple hundred clicks, ma'am. We never have figured out how they did it. It's one thing to spoof sensors a bit. It's another thing entirely to hide the emissions coming out of a thermonuclear reactor. That's raw physics, ma'am. You've got to contain the damn plasma. That means a lot of electromagnetic fields. All those I can see. Even a blind man could see them. But we're not seeing it anymore, Chris said. I tell you, it's not there. So they either blew themselves up or turned everything off, Chris said, naming the only two options she could think of. They didn't blow themselves up, Chief Benny said. We'd have seen that. So they turned off their gear, Chris said. Captain... What's it look like when you dump a reactor? First off, you don't dump a dozen huge ship reactors and five gigantic city-sized reactors when you're tied up at the dock. That tends to wreck things you don't want wrecked. Things we wouldn't want wrecked, Chris pointed out. What about them? There's no accounting for them, the captain growled. Admiral, would you be so kind as to order my chief engineer to report to your quarters... And could you scare up that chief boffin? They've got all kinds of senses. They might be able to add something to our conversation. Nellie, make it so. Already done, Chris. They're headed here as fast as their legs can carry them. I think the rumor that we've lost the aliens is wandering through the ship at faster than light speed. You humans do like to talk. And you computers don't, Drago said dryly. We are networked by our very nature, sir. We were networked long before you were, the captain retorted. Enough, children, Chris said. Chief, can you take my board back to just before you lost the aliens, enhance it to maximum resolution, and walk it through the loss as slowly as possible? They were going through that loss for the second time when the chief engineers of both the Wasp and Hornet reported to Chris, with both Captain Tausig and Professor Labau only two seconds behind them. Not far behind them were the two felines and their translator. Chris brought all of them up to date on the enemy's status, something that didn't seem to surprise any of them, not even the cats. Then she had Chief Benny run them through what they knew about the sudden change in the alien status. The two engineers were shaking their heads as the reactors disappeared from the screen within a single second. I'd never scram a reactor while tied up to the pier, 
Commander Manuel Ortega of the Wasp said. Even if I had it on minimum power, and what we were getting from our targets wasn't minimum. Ronnie Thieu of the Hornet agreed. Bad idea, but those shadows on the screen? I think that might have been the plasma dissipating into space, or at least some of it. If we're reading it this far away, it's got to be tearing into something to create that kind of radiation signature. She turned to the head boffin. Did any of your people have a better look at this? I have some independent reports of this, the professor began in lecture mode. However, I must tell you that our most sensitive sensor for this was destroyed during the recent fight, and our best researcher in this area lost her life. Her assistant is doing the best he can with what he has available. Our computers are trying their best to enhance what we did capture. My children are all working on this, Chris, Nellie reported. We should have something for you in the next five minutes. Good, Chris said, wondering why she was hearing about this first from Professor Lobau rather than Nellie, but this situation was coming at them very fast. So, Chris said, thinking on her feet as fast as she could. We've lost all evidence of reactors. What about laser capacitors? Are the guns charged? We're too far out to read anything like that, Chief Benny said. How close will we have to get before we know we've got two huge batteries of lasers loaded and aimed at us? Chris got in before either Captain Present could. 500,000 kilometers, the chief said, plus or minus 100,000. We better be really slow on our final approach, Captain Drago said. Absolutely, Chris said flatly. What about their communications equipment, Chris asked, not that they make a practice of talking to us. I'm sorry, Admiral, the chief said. At this range, they could have comm gear online, but unless they start talking on a wide enough beam or really jack up the power on their gear, I'm listening to a great big nothing. Then please keep listening, Chris said, and let us know if you hear so much as a twitch. You'll be the second to know right after Captain Drago. And you were only about 30 seconds behind me on this, the skipper of the Wasp told Chris. If you'd been home gnawing your liver instead of gallivanting around my ship, you'd have known it then. I've had enough liver for this week, Chris said. She glanced in the general direction of the felines. Zara was translating like mad. Nellie, is she getting this right? Pretty much, Chris. There's a lot that looks like magic, and the general keeps saying so. The admiral insists that this is advanced technology, and he wants some. Good. Correct any major mistakes, but let them run their own course. Admiral, Nellie announced to all, we have the analysis of the main antenna's takeaway from the recent event. I'm bringing it up on screen. The enemy base again appeared, only this time each reactor stood out clear from the others. Two pairs of six reactors in the shape of a T, three aft in engineering proper, powering the ship's rocket motors, and three strung out along the keel. The pair of six were docked nose in to a space marked out with five gigantic reactors, roaring away with plasma and the superconducting magneto hydrodynamic racetracks that the aliens use to extract electricity from the superheated plasma in their reactors. Until only a few years ago, humans had used the same technology. Many starships still did. Then the lights went out. On screen, gossamer shadows showed where the plasma went. There were brief sparkles where the plasma met something and interacted with it. On screen, it was hard to see. No doubt in person, it had been horrible to suffer. It appears that the reaction from venting the plasma, Nellie reported, tore the ships away from the station. We can't be sure because the ships vanish from our observation as the plasma dissipates. What happened on the station? Chris asked. They stayed put for a bit more than a second after the ships, then they too vented. Each reactor vented in several different directions, Nellie reported. On the screen now, only the station showed. Shadows went in several directions from each reactor. Here and there were more flashes, as structures not meant to face the demons of hot plasma encountered it and became one with it. If they were planning on doing this and being in shape to restart and attack us, Nellie said. I do not believe that it went as smoothly as they wanted. 
Chris found herself gnawing at her lower lip. We'll see what we shall see when we get closer, she said. That didn't have the firm finality that an admiral was supposed to bring to her words, but it was the best Chris could muster in this situation. Nellie, send to squadron. Continue battle preparation. I don't trust these bastards any farther than I can throw them. I sent it, Chris. All of it? Right down to the bastard part. Chris shrugged. That might not go down with the other deathless words before battle, but it definitely reflected her thoughts. The long knife legend would, no doubt, edit it appropriately. 54. It is impossible to come to a dead halt in space. Always you are orbiting the center of the gravity at a mind-bending pace. Usually you are orbiting a sun at a more reasonable speed, but you are still moving. Finally, most times a ship is orbiting a planet of some sort. We humans don't go to space for the view, we go for the territory. Maybe we aren't as territorial as the newly discovered felines, but we're looking for living space and resources. Chris knew all of these laws of physics. Still, from her flag bridge, she ordered Captain Drago to bring her squadron to as near a dead halt as possible when they were 500,000 clicks from the moon, where the aliens had built their orbital refuge. Making allowances for the huge gravity well of the gas giant only a few million miles away, the squadron drifted in space. Every mind, every sensor aboard, focused its full attention on the mystery that lay ahead of them. Every scrap of spare computing power concentrated on analyzing what the sensors revealed. It pretty much came to one big nothing. As far as the electromagnetic spectrum is concerned, there is no there there, Chief Benny reported from his usual place at sensors on the bridge. Every instrument we've got says there is just nothing happening up ahead. Visuals? Chris snapped from where she sat in flag plot. They are still rather vague, Professor Labau reported from her elbow. We are unsure if that stems from the junk that has been injected into the space around the base, or because whatever we are looking at just doesn't look like what we are looking for. Chris did not smile, although the report was as perfectly noncommittal as she'd expect from a scientist reluctant to admit he had nothing to add to their knowledge base. No doubt it was very embarrassing. Captain Drago, lead the squadron closer. If there is a creep space, use it. That got a heads up among the feline contingent observing them from the corner of Chris's flag bridge. The admiral actually smiled at Chris. Of course, a feline smile showed a lot of teeth, long, pointed ones. Let's keep these folks as allies, Chris reminded herself for the millionth time. At 400,000 clicks, the observed results were no better than they had been at 500,000. By 300,000, they were starting to get a decent picture. It was ugly. Two ships rolled and drifted alongside a long cylinder. Occasionally, they bounced off each other. There's no guidance there, Captain Drago concluded. They're totally out of any semblance of control. But are they dead? Chris asked. I wouldn't put it past them to have their lasers loaded and on automatic. Whoever closes in gets hit with one last massive broadside. They'd need sensors to know there was anyone there, Tausig pointed out from his place at Chris's other elbow. There could be something passive, Chris insisted. It would have to draw some juice, Captain Drago pointed out on net. We are not getting anything at all, not the low hum from capacitors, nor anything in the lower electromagnetic spectrum from something waiting to power up. Chris eyed Tausig, who sat at her elbow, since he was now a passenger on the Wasp, riding along with the remnants of his Hornet. Take us in closer, Captain Drago. Professor Lebow, I want that particular sector of space examined like no bit of vacuum has ever been before. I don't trust these folks to give up without a fight. There is always a first time, Jack said. For a human, maybe. For them, never. It's not enlightened, Chris spat. Slowly, as slowly as the laws of physics allowed, they closed in. We are getting some electromagnetic activity, the chief reported at 200,000 clicks. 
It's in the form of low-powered electric servo motors. They're very weak and not much of them. The kind of things we use for minimum life support. So someone might be alive? Possibly, on what's left of the space station. Give me a picture, Chris ordered. Chris knew space stations. She'd blown up at least one and fought to save another. A cylinder was the usual design for them, a simple tin can in space. This one was no exception, or at least it had started as no exception. Now, not so much. Unless the aliens had intentionally built a twisted and malformed cylinder, this station had suffered a catastrophic failure. It was easy to see why. In a dozen or more places, the hull looked singed, burned by the venting of superheated plasma that these spaces on the hull had not been designed to contain. The vent point showed signs of wreckage drifting by them or hanging on by a thread. No wonder it had been so hard to get a decent picture of the alien base. Its very death had cloaked it in a veil of destruction. Where is the activity? Chris asked. In the extreme forward section of the cylinder, Professor Labau said. The area farthest from a vented reactor. Nelly highlighted that section. It was well away from the self-destruction of the reactors. While the other end of the station appeared to be completed and done with, this end still showed where construction had been going on. Had some low-caste workers there chosen life over death? The odds were long against it. But a mother and father had chosen life for themselves and their two babies once, in Chris's experience. Only the babies had survived, but still, of the almost hundred billion aliens Chris had slaughtered, at least two had chosen life. Captain Drago, I believe the Wasp has the best armor left after the last fight. Yes, we're at 85 percent, Captain Drago reported. Why? Let's leave the rest of the squadron at this distance. Set the strongest condition Z you can on the Wasp and nose in there. If I were you, I'd keep my engines away from them for the first pass, Chris said. But what do I know? I'm just the Admiral. And the bloody long knife. Drago muttered under his breath, almost. Chris didn't hear him. Very carefully, she didn't hear him. The squadron swung wide of the moon while the wasp crept closer. If a ship traveling at a 100,000 clicks an hour relative to the huge gas giant looming over them all could be said to creep, they were 50,000 clicks out when the aliens made their move. 55. We've been pinged! Radar! Bridge personnel are supposed to be very informative, but circumspect in their reports. They are never supposed to shout their reports. Sad to say, old Chief Benny failed to follow proper decorum at that moment. He was definitely shouting. There's also communication from the station to the warship wrecks! There was no need to order battle stations. Everyone was already there. The Wasp even had an admiral at the weapons station. There was also no need to order a flip of the ship. The frigate was on a nose-forward course anyway. Nellie, jink. I'm doing it, Chris, but we've only got thrusters to play with. There's not much I can do. Nevertheless, in her high G egg, Chris felt the side movement as Nellie slid to the left, then dropped the ship down. On her board, Chris held the lasers ready, but she had no target. Nothing moved. Captain Drago had arranged his approach so that only one of the warships was over the horizon of the alien station. Chris searched it for a target. Enemy lasers are powering up and coming to bear, Nellie reported. Kill them, Chris ordered. Laser one on the wasp's bow shot out a stuttering blast of light. On the hulk, a section of hull exploded. But there was more movement visible on the dinged, seared, and dented hull, Faster than human thought, Nellie popped one, then another, then four. Finally, she used all seven lasers. A missile tried to launch from the dead ship. Nellie nailed it before it cleared its launcher. The explosion wrecked several other launchers. Chris was fighting a zombie. It shambled and shook and tried to kill her with every twitch. The wasp fought back with the clear, intelligent intent of every human and computer aboard her, who loved life and intended to keep living. Almost as suddenly as it had started, it was over. 
In what seemed like an eternity but couldn't have been more than a blink, the dead ship was truly dead. The bridge crew took a second to recover their breath. What do we do with the other ship? Captain Drago asked. I'd love to send a couple of antimatter missiles its way, Chris said, still working on catching her breath. But we only have a limited supply of them. Order the Royal to scrounge up some rocks and send them at it fast. I've sent the order, Nellie reported. And what do you want to do with that spark of life we see on the station? Jack asked from his egg parked beside Chris's. Mount up your Marines and see what you find, Chris said. If there's anyone over there alive, I want a word with them. Clearly, they need to understand what a white flag means. Chris, I didn't notice any white flag, Jack said. Chris could almost see the grimace on his face. They set a trap, and we tripped it. It wasn't a very good trap, and we tripped it with our usual long knife sledgehammer, but... He left the conclusion to Chris. Yeah, she said with a sigh. I've got to quit expecting these folks to be decent and open to negotiations. Foolish of me to even think so. I'll mount up both marine companies, Jack said. Captain Drago, can we borrow the wasp's pinnace? Take all the longboats, too. Better you see what lies over there than me. It would prove regrettable that anyone had to see it. 56. A longboat went in first. It headed not for any particular hatch, but for one of the vents that had been seared in the side of the station by a reactor's hot breath. They expected a lot of death and destruction. Still, what they found was a shock even for battle-hardened Marines. Damn! There are bodies all over the place, Gunny Brown reported to them as soon as he and a squad of Marines were inside. Was it explosive decompression when the reactors got dumped? Chris asked. The bodies don't look like they died of that, ma'am, Gunny reported. I got a forensic team right behind me. The sergeant heading it up thinks they were dead before space got to them. Any idea what killed them? There's a lot of paper cups floating around here. Droplets of liquid. They captured some of it and they're doing a field analysis. Give us a minute or two, Admiral. Chris settled back into her chair in flag plot, tightened her belt, and prepared to wait. The wasp had gone to condition Charlie after tossing a few large chunks of rubble over the horizon of the station at the derelict warship. It hadn't reacted to any of them. The royal was headed this way with a couple of good-sized rocks and ice hunks from the giant's ring. Next orbit, they'd see if there was any fight left in the wreck. Show it or smash it. Chris no longer cared which. She was starting to develop a very negative attitude toward her enemy. We got the results from those droplets in the cups. There was some kind of alcoholic drink in them. Alcohol and cyanide, we think. Chris turned to where Amanda and Jacques sat at her conference table. Amanda was rapidly going pale. Beside her, Penny's mouth was falling open. It was Jacques, the anthropologist, who gave voice to what the others were struggling to get their minds around. They poisoned themselves on their communion wine, he said. On the huge base ship they'd shot up, they'd discovered a memorial garden where the ashes of the dead were scattered. There, they grew a grain and a fruit that seemed readily converted to alcohol. Bread and wine. Sacraments, they'd concluded at the time. Now, with their chances to continue the fight slim, and the option of surrender seemingly the only one any rational person would consider, the enemy had taken their own lives with their sacrament. Again, the aliens have chosen death before surrender, Chris muttered to herself, or maybe she spoke aloud. But to make mass suicide a religious experience? Dear God, was no doubt truly intended as a prayer from Penny. My general tells me to tell you that we had a nation very much like that among us not all that long ago, Zara said from the corner where the feline observers sat. What became of them? Chris asked. They learned different, that life is more important than a hollow death, Zara answered without consulting her officers. Then she had to turn and tell them what she'd said. They agree with what I said, she quickly added. We have had groups like that also, 
Jacques said. They have also learned differently. These aliens we fight are slow learners. The general says maybe they are not meant to learn, only to die. I wouldn't mind that so much, Chris said, and was surprised by the words as they came out of her mouth. But they take a lot of good sailors and marines with them. My admiral says that is always sad. Yes, Chris agreed dryly. What are we going to do? Penny asked. Find out who's still alive in the aft section, Chris said and tapped her comm link. Jack, have you been following this? Loud and painfully clear, he reported. You about to go in? The pinnace is clamped onto the hull a good hundred meters short of the end. We're about to cut our way into it. Jack, be careful, Chris said. Wife, I always am. Chris took a deep breath and gave the order. Marines, land the landing force. 57. General Juan Montoya did one final check of his lead platoon. All were as ready as they ever would be. The battle-armored spacesuits were primed and ready. Their weapons were locked and loaded. Jack signaled the sailor, herself in an unarmored spacesuit, and the hull of the pinnace opened up a hole in it the size of a double door, which sealed to the alien's hull. A marine applied a laser torch to the revealed metal. In less than a minute, a huge chunk of plate drifted off where it was pushed. Another marine combat engineer put tape on the sharp edges of the cut. The battle suits were tough, but there was no reason to ding them unnecessarily. Jack motioned and a sergeant led the first fire team through the hole. As the last trooper of that four shot aboard the station, a second team followed. Jack had promised Chris that he would not lead from the front. With eight Marines of his battalion aboard the station, he figured he would no longer be in the front and slipped himself into line as the third fire team of the squad went in. It was strange how a man trained to be a Secret Service agent changed his idea of a man's job when he spent all his time with combat Marines. Well, them and a certain long knife. Jack forced his head back into the game and faced what he knew would be waiting for him. Gunny's warning was hardly enough for what he faced. Bodies drifted, thick as seaweed on a kelp bed he'd swum in as a kid. There were men and women, elders, kids, and infants. So many of the bodies were tiny. Most stared at him with eyes frozen in some hard stare that the poison had brought. A few of the kids almost seemed asleep. Jack wanted to puke. Instead, he did his best to ignore what he saw and ordered a follow-up fire team to sling weapons and shove bodies forward. What they were after was aft. Up here, sir. I think I've found what we're looking for. Jack found a purchase and shoved himself off for the aftward bulkhead. It stretched far around, showing clearly that the station's outer wall had been the floor when it spun. The bulkhead went high up for these people, a good 15 meters. Possibly they would have put in an extra deck as their population regrew. Apparently they built large, expecting a lot of kids. From the proportion of the dead, they'd had a population boom in the year since Chris had clobbered them. Again, Jack had to force his mind to focus on what he had been sent here for. Ahead of him was a hatch, a hatch with a wheel lock and a window that let you look in. Jack peered in, shining a light to help him see all there was to see. It wasn't much. Some two meters away was another hatch with a lock and window. Chris, I found an airlock. I think they intended to keep this place airtight. It looks like hurried work. Does that sound as much like a trap to you as it does to me? Came in the form of a question, but Jack doubted that Chris, as an admiral, or as a long knife, intended it to be taken as such, certainly not Chris as a wife. I'm ordering up the airlock we brought along, he said. Did he hear a whispered, thank you, in response? Four sailors came up, their suits equipped with jet packs. Each handled the corner of a large room equipped with airtight hatches. A combat engineering type had been taking soundings of the bulkhead. He signaled the sailors and they adjusted their drift. The temporary airlock settled into place, and the marine with the welder quickly locked it down against the wall. As he did that, 
the sailors expanded out the lock, tripling its size. Two squads began filing into the lock. Jack included himself. Only when the aft lock was sealed down did one of the sailors open up the smart metal of the forward bulkhead and turn aside for a marine to put a long, thin bead of explosives along the station bulkhead. He covered it with armored cloth. Get ready to shout, folks. I'm using the smallest explosion I think I can use, and the cloth should direct the force inward. But if your ears are precious to you, shout on three. The count was quick. All had taken themselves off net as Jack had. With the armored spacesuits, the overpressure was merely annoying, although Jack distinctly felt kicked where he preferred Chris to fondle. The wall blew in, and the first rank of Marines rolled through the newly created hole. Jack was in the second rank. He joined the rest of his Marines, standing there dumbfounded. Are you getting this? he said, then remembered he'd killed his sound and video feed before the explosion. Chris, are you getting this? he repeated after clicking himself back onto the net. My God, Jack, Chris breathed. The scene was enough to make even a long night resort to prayer. In front of Jack, an old gray-haired woman stood. She held a knife to her throat, as if ready to drive it up into her skull. Behind her, over a dozen children ranging in age from maybe twelve to at least three stood. Each of them held a knife at his or her throat, just like the woman. Some of the bigger kids helped the smaller kids hold their knives. There were tears running down the cheeks of the kids. There were no tears in the old woman's eyes. The face she presented Jack overflowed with rage and vicious hatred. Vermin will never touch us, she spat in a dialect that was just barely understandable. Jack struggled to remember what Chris had said, what she'd say in this situation. He signaled his Marines to hold their ground, chinned his mic to the speaker in the suit and thought, Sal, you and your mom better help me get this right. We're all on it. We are not vermin, Jack began thinking, and Sal translated and spoke. We are talking to you. What vermin can use your own words? The woman actually seemed surprised, but that did not stop her rage. Vermin may mouth the enlightened words of the people, but it is still an animal, she spat. You have fought us in numbers far more than we ever had, but it is you who hide here, licking your wounds. The woman's eyes grew wider, but the knife never wavered from its place at her throat. This is getting us nowhere, Chris whispered softly on net. Marines, prepare to fire sleepy darts on my word. Keep going, General. It is we who have come to seek you out. Is that the path that vermin walk? Fire, Chris ordered. Jack felt the pressure from the volley of sleepy darts. Maybe some of the soft pop did come up through the soles of his feet. Now the old woman showed shock. She tried to drive the knife up into her skull, but her arms would not obey her. Obey her full will. When the knife tumbled from her grasp, there was blood on the tip. One or two of the older children tried to follow their elder, but they were less ready to kill themselves or maybe less enthusiastic at the prospects. All of them collapsed on the floor with no blood on their knives. Chris, we need a doctor here. Doc Mead, how fast can you get in here? I'm on the outside waiting, came the woman's soft voice. Can I use this hatch? Have a combat engineer check it for booby traps. A minute later, the doctor was in the room checking one patient after another, she extracted the sleepy darts from the youngest children. Marines had already policed up the sharp stuff and bound the hands and feet of the older kids and the old woman. The children were evacuated, youngest to oldest, in survival packs that looked like nothing less than an oversized beach ball, one Marine towing a pack. Doc Mead came to the elderly woman last. She checked her vitals, then left the darts in her and checked her bindings. This one is very vexed, even under sedation. Keep an eye on her. They will all be on suicide watch, Jack said. If we can, try to get some of the youngest kids off to another ship. We don't want them running into any of the older ones. The big kids might kill the little ones. 
You think it's that bad? Jack said. I think she had a lot more she wanted to spit at you, the doc said. I think you interrupted her grand exit. I suspect she and these kids were intended to send us a message that you interrupted. By the way, I guess our grasp of their language is as good as we thought. Thank Nellie and her kids for that, Jack said. You're welcome, my mother says, Sal said. Well, let's get the kids where they're safe, and then let's get the hell out of here, Doc Mead said. This place gives me the willies. 58. Chris shivered as she studied the pictures Jack was sending from the station. She would never succeed in wiping them from her mind's eye. What must it be like for Jack? She'd need to hold him tight tonight. So she was a bit surprised when Jack called and said she needed to come down to the brig. The old woman's awake, at least as much as we're willing to let her wake up. She's babbling a lot. It's hard to make out, but I think she wants, no, demands to talk to our enlightened one, or, as she puts it, the vermin with pretenses of enlightenment. I'm on my way, Chris said, and, unbuckling from her desk chair, launched herself at the door. The wasp was back at condition able, big, roomy, and easy to get around in, assuming you knew the latest configuration. Nellie directed Chris, and today she directed her correctly. The brig, however, was nothing like it had been. Now it consisted of several annexes with no admittance from one to the other. Chris took the grand tour. Lieutenant Commander Sampson had her own wing of sorts. It was more like a hospital than a prison. She was still in bed, sedated, and slowly recovering from her brain surgery. Chris might have ordered her to sickbay, but she had no idea what the new normal would be for that woman. Samson would stay in the brig until a new baseline for her behavior was established. Another annex had the youngest children that had been brought aboard. There were five of them. They were likely somewhere around age seven down to three. Now they were bouncing off the walls, literally, in one large room under the close supervision of five young sailors and marines and one surprisingly matron-like chief. The children didn't know it, but the standing orders for their guards was to spoil them rotten. No surprise the kids were enjoying it and going along solidly with the program. Presently, they were having a pillow fight with the grown-ups and burning all kinds of energy that they had from a lunch, mainly of cookies and ice cream. No doubt a nap would be next on the schedule. Jacques and Amanda had been put in charge of designing a program for the seduction of these children from the dark side into the light. Chris allowed herself a smile. The gray-haired alien woman would gnash her teeth if she knew what was being done to the children she'd intended to have drive knives into their own brains. The bigger kids, 8 to 12 years old, were getting a different approach, one closer to what Jacques was using for the kids from the tribe Chris had rescued, drafted, enlisted, whatever. The brig for these five kids had been divided into five roomy cells— each kid shared it with a young marine or sailor who came from a large family and had been their age not long ago. Each room had one young alien, one young human, and two computer games. The human had started off playing the game by him or herself. Inevitably, or at least in four of the five cases, the kids had come to look over the player's shoulder. Two of the boys were now lost in games involving racing around tracks or over wild country, while the animal drivers or passengers tossed fruit at each other. The boys were laughing uproariously. Two of the girls had joined their guards playing something involved with directing different sparkly things into forming a wall. Then they'd wreck it if possible with one swing of the wrecking ball and do it all over again. The oldest girl was the one holdout. Instead of coming to look over her guard's shoulder and get involved in a game, she'd launch herself at the bulkhead head first. The guard had not been so lost in a game she'd grown out of years ago that she missed the move. She intercepted the girl on the fly. Now the girl was cuffed to her bed. On the wall directly ahead of her, a coyote chased a roadrunner with hilarious results. The guard laughed on cue with the video— as expected, the alien girl opened one eye to see what was so funny. As Chris watched, the girl succumbed to watching as one vermin repeatedly tried and repeatedly failed to get the other. I was betting on the roadrunner to drag her out of herself, Jacques said, 
drifting up to watch with Chris. Is she the hard case? Among our kids, yes. I understand from the royal that they have two hard cases, both older. Doc Mead wanted to spread the kids out among all the ships, but I told her solitary confinement would be the worst thing we could do to the youngsters. As it is now, we and the Royal are the only ships with nurseries. And most of them are coming around? All the youngsters are moving at one speed or another. This young woman, hard as she appears to be, is like putty compared to the diamond of the old lady's personality that you're about to meet. What are our chances of turning the woman? Chris asked. <laughs> Somewhere between none and nil, the anthropologist said. But Jack had us reduce her sedation so you could talk to her. He thinks it's important that you hear what she has to say. Is it safe to do that? Jack wants it. We've got the pump in her. We're ready to put her back to sleep at the first sign she's dangerous to herself. Why don't you come see for yourself? Chris left the girl. Her guard had just brought a pillow to support her head so she could watch the video more comfortably. The next room was not much larger than the one Chris had just watched. Here Jack stood, wearing only the sweat-stained liner to his battle armor. On the bed, the gray-haired woman was tied down with padded restraints. Her head lolled gently back and forth in zero-G. Jacques opened the door, but stayed outside when Chris entered. He locked the door behind her. Our enlightened one is here, Jack said, as Chris came to float beside him. The woman opened her eyes, took in the scene with a lazy glance, and laughed. It was a harsh, dry cackle. Vermin, your false enlightened one is a woman, she spat. I led the ships that blasted your other ships into tiny pieces, Nellie translated for Chris. The woman turned her face to the wall. Yes, 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 the vermin have chewed our toes. You said that before, but you are fools. She turned back to face Chris. You are a fool. You shot me with your false guns before I could tell you why I chose to live and see the fear in your eyes before I die like my worshipped one, the truly enlightened one. What will bring fear to my eyes? Chris asked. They have sent the torch to all the ships. Your luck may have led you to be there when we stumbled, but your luck cannot save you from what is even now moving to obliterate you. We will swim in your blood. We will pile your heads in our holy of holies. You will have no children to share the wine of your remembrance. She stared hard at Chris, as hard as her drugged state allowed. No one will know you ever lived. Nellie, show her the crypt under the pyramid. With pleasure, Chris. The wall to Chris's right came alive with a holograph of the Hall of Horrors under the pyramid. Even drugged, the woman's face took on shock, horror. You cannot have been there. I have walked your horror of horrors, Chris said through Nellie. I have spat on it. This is the message I left for all of you to read. Now the stone Chris had used to block the entrance to the pyramid filled the wall. You make war on us, Chris said. We will bury your pyramid under a pile of your skulls. We will flood your plane of glass with your blood. No, 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 the woman screamed. You are wrong. All the ships will come now that the torch has been sent to them. It is you that will be buried in a flood of ships. We have more ships than you can count. Our women are most fruitful. We will destroy you. Jacques, Chris said aloud. Are you listening in? Yes, came from a small grill in the door. Put her to sleep. I think she said all she came here to say. Her vitals are way up. I was about to do it anyway. Do it. The woman's head lolled back on her bunk, and in a moment she was snoring. They fled here right after the first fight, Chris said to Jack. He nodded agreement. I don't see any way that this group could have sent any torch to the other ships. It's not likely, he said. However, there may be some sort of precedence for them rousing the tribes with a torch. And she's assuming someone among the others has done that. Like the three ships that observed our last fight, Jack pointed out. Chris winced. Yeah. 
Any suggestions what we do next? I wonder if there is a library on the station, Chris muttered to herself. Some place that has the history of these people. The only way to find out is to search it, Jack said. I hate to order your Marines into that place. It's ugly, Jack agreed. You'll want scientists in the search, too, Jacques said, joining them. Chris heaved a sigh. Captain Drago, lay the wasp alongside the station, then please join me on the flag bridge. Have the other skippers come, too. Aye, aye, Admiral. The word is already sent to the squadron. Chris squared her shoulders. It was bad and would no doubt get worse. 59. Chris sat in her day quarters, meetings done. All four of the squadron ships now lay close to the station. The Wasp, Royal, and Intrepid were able to spawn pinnaces. They were out cloud dancing, gathering in enough reaction mass for the squadron's needs to get them back to Alwa. Hopefully, it would not take them long to refuel all four ships. The idea of sending sailor, marines, and boffins to root around among all those bodies on the station to see if there was anything helpful left had caused Chris to blanch. Professor Lebeau and Nellie had come up with a solution. As Chris sat here, nano-scouts were zipping through the station, looking for anything interesting. Nellie and her brood were doing the oversight. Only if they found something really interesting did a human eye get brought in. Thanks to a merciful god, the A-deck with all the bodies seemed to hold little of interest. It was closer to the hub that the scouts found things to refer for human review. There was a file room, huge and full of actual print on paper. There was something that might be a library, but it didn't have all that many books. There was also a series of large halls that might have passed for courtrooms with judicial chambers off them. In them were loads of officious-looking books— the scientists were all interested in these for lack of something better. What we haven't found, Professor Labau noted, is anything like a research facility or labs. Interesting, that. Chris was finding a lot of things interesting. The ship swung at anchor as close to the station as was safe. Now there were airlocks spaced along the station's outer hull, where longboats could easily dock. Inside, a small team had spread nets across a deck. If it worked as planned, the nets would hold the drifting bodies well back from the people who actually boarded the station to do the scavenger hunt. Chris hoped they saw no more than was necessary. For now, Chris stared at the screens in flag plot. They were blank at the moment. That was not what she saw. Bodies drifted across them. Big bodies, tiny bodies, bodies that screamed blood at her. No, none of the bodies had screamed. It was the live one that screamed defiances at her. If Chris let them, these people would drive her crazy with their wish for death. Death for all living things, except that tiny group that was enlightened just the right way. Chris shook herself out of her reveries. She had things to do and decisions to make. Not quite. If she was honest with herself, the things she had to do were pretty much already decided— she needed to return three felines to their planet and get back where she belonged. Getting there would be no easy job, what with her having only the wreckage of eight ships flying in four loose formations. Traveling back to Alwa would have to be careful and therefore slow. Once she got back, she would no doubt face even more problems. When hadn't she? She would also need to get a message back to human space. She'd found out a lot about the aliens. Oh, and she found a bunch of talking cats who will need protection, assuming they didn't want to conquer the whole human race. If King Ray had been pissed with her the last time she came back from adventuring, he'd likely have kittens over this one. Speaking of which, should she take the opportunity to deliver the message in person? She'd offered the chance to fill in his crew from the Hornet. They'd passed up the opportunity to get home, and now more of them had died. Maybe Chris could be the messenger. Oh, right. Chris was the viceroy and commander of the Alwa Defense Sector. For her to go home would be to abandon her post. She could order others home, but go home herself? Not so much. Chris stared at the overhead. She was starting to sound crazy, almost as crazy as that old woman. The two of them were a matching pair. Or might be if Chris didn't get a hold on herself. There was a soft knock at the door of her quarters. 
I could use an interruption right about now. Enter. Zara and her admiral came in. Do you have a moment? Zara asked, the epitome of politeness. Certainly, no one is scheduled to try their hand at killing me today, and I'm not planning on killing anyone myself. Zara promptly passed those words along to her admiral. She growled cheerfully and padded her way quickly to one of the stools around Chris's conference table. She settled there, her tail lazily lashing back and forth behind her. Where is your general? Chris asked, for no reason other than it filled the silence. She does not take well to space. She is still recovering from, what do you call it, zero G? Zara explained. I do not think we can get home fast enough to suit her. We humans do not care very much for it either, but the early space travelers had to learn to survive it. We should be heading back to drop you off very soon, Chris said. That is what my admiral came to talk to you about. Zara glanced at her admiral, who made a swatting motion with her paw. Zara swallowed and went on. You have challenged us to a race to our moon. My admiral was wondering if there was any way for you to tow or push one of the dead alien ships into an orbit around our moon. So if you got to the moon, you would also have a chance to look over all this advanced technology, Chris said. Something like that. And if one of these ships was orbiting your own moon, would the race to the moon turn into a real race, with all your zones trying to get there first and gain knowledge they could use to dominate the others? Zara did not flinch. We do not think so. When we left, the decision had already been made that Cullum and the Basalt Kingdom would be working together to reach the moon. Since we have been gone, many others have joined in this group effort. Yes, it is the first such effort across zones that we have ever made, unless there was a war driving us to cooperate to bring down a stronger power. But still, it is happening as we talk here. Chris found herself again staring at the ceiling. Should she refer this to her staff for examination? What would Amanda and Jacques think of this idea? Chris shook her head. Yes, the technology on the alien ships is well ahead of what you have, but no, I will not help you get access to it. Chris wondered if the admiral intended to roll her body up as if about to pounce, or if it was just ancient body language that no longer presaged attack. There are several reasons why I say that, and none of them involve a distrust of you or a desire to keep technology from you, Chris went on quickly. First, the technology we have found in the alien ships is obsolete by our standards. Do you really want to begin building ships that you will quickly be tearing up or throwing away? Secondly, the technology these aliens use is much different from what we use. If you are to build ships to fight side by side with us, you will need our communications devices, ranging gear, and weapons. No doubt you will give each of these devices a unique twist to bend them to your needs, However, a certain amount of commonality will be needed. Do you follow the logic of my position? Chris asked. Zara turned to her admiral. The officer nodded as the translator spoke. Zara turned back to Chris and began to speak for the admiral. We have found that to be the case with our own allies, and when one smaller power switches sides, it is often necessary for them to scrap their ships, airplanes, and armored fighting vehicles— so that they can fit in with their new overlord. She means ally. Zara moved quickly to correct her words. Chris wondered if the idea of first among equals was just catching on, or if it would ever catch on. There is one more question my admiral asks, Zara said. Yes. Can we join you, she and I? Can we travel back with you? Chris would often wonder why she did not reflect more before giving her answer. Yes, you may, she said. Thank you, Zara said, and led her admiral from the room. It would be two days more before Chris could order the squadron to get underway back the way they'd come, first to Sasquan, then to Alwa. It would be a long voyage. Chris wondered what she'd find at the end of it. 60. The Wasp came through the beta jump of the Alwa system with plenty of velocity 
and began immediately to break at 1.15 Gs. As soon as Alwa knew Chris was back in system, she was inundated with message traffic addressed to her as Viceroy, Commander Alwa Defense Sector, and CEO of New Enterprises. Must be nice to know you were missed, Jack said with an evil grin as Chris surveyed the pile of flimsy stacking up on her desk. You want half of these? Chris asked. Oh, no, Jack said, heading for the door. There's got to be some nice marine stuff I can lose myself in. Inspecting the heads, checking out the storage rooms, seeing how my deputy did organizing a brigade of marines and national guard. Lots of really fun stuff. Chris made a nasty face at him, then turned back to the first flimsy. It was from Granny Rita, the acting viceroy. It opened with how glad she was to have Chris back. Considering that Granny Rita had led the survivors of her battlecruiser squadron in scratching out a life for themselves on Alwa 80 years ago, Chris was left to wonder what could make her so happy to lay down her burden. One quick read, and Chris had Nellie round up Amanda and Jacques. Tell them to get here pronto. Two minutes later, they were there. Out of breath, but there. We got problems on Alwa, Chris said. We knew they were having problems when we flew through here before, Amanda said. Well, it's worse, Chris said, passing over the message flimsy to both of them. The old line Alwins want their old ways back, Chris said. Only now we've got new line Alwins who like what they can buy with the money they earn working for the humans. Humans will slow down and stop if a rooster type wanders into the road. Now Alwins are driving the big rigs instead of humans, and they don't stop for nothing. Some old, bald, feathered Alwyn wanders into the road in front of them. They don't slow down. And if the old coot doesn't get out of the way, they don't go back to see if they hit him. Ouch, Amanda said. That kind of makes it hard to figure out who did what to whom. Exactly, Jacques said. So the old liners hold all the new kids responsible for anything bad that happens to them. It seems we humans have created a cash-based society that runs on a schedule, Chris said. No wonder the old farts want their old world back, Amanda said. That old world is not coming back. They have a choice between us and those bloodthirsty alien space raiders, Chris said and sighed. But how do you get them to see it our way, Jacques said. We've done just about everything we can to rub their noses in the facts. They just ignore what they don't want to see. Chris leaned back in her chair and eyed the overhead. Maybe we have something new for them to look at. Jacques raised an eyebrow at Chris. Nellie, get me Doc Mead. Yes, Admiral, came quickly. If I were to take the old woman alien down to Alwa, could you keep her sedated for the ride, then cut back on them when I wanted her in full rage? I've got a pretty good idea on just how much to medicate her to keep her out of trouble, the doctor said. I may want her to get in trouble, Chris said vaguely. <laughs> I'm a doctor, Admiral. First, I do no harm. What kind of trouble do you have in mind? Chris told her. Yep, I think I can keep her meds at the right level for that without hurting her or her hurting anyone else. Good. I'll let you know when everything is arranged. You think that will do it? Jacques asked. From the look on his face, he seemed doubtful. Nothing beats a try but a failure, Chris said. Now, about this money-based economy. Amanda, are we doing this right? Chris, you want production. You have to pay people to produce. There aren't enough humans for all the defense you want, so you need to recruit all ones. They're new to this whole concept, but they like the TVs, computers, and amenities. I understand we've got a computerized egg warmer that is all the rage. I helped develop the advertising for it when it was still in R&D. You're starting to sound like one of the old farts. Oh, no, Amanda, Chris said through a grin. They don't want to have anything to do with our cake. Me, I want it in my grubby little hands, and I want to gobble it down whole. We're very different. How's the defensive effort going in general? Amanda asked. Admiral Catano seems happy. They've got the damaged ships back in full commission and spare smart metal to boot. I've already sent a warning ahead that the squadron got shot up badly and will need first call on the yard's time. 
Admiral Benson says he'll be waiting for us and we can take the ships right into the docks. I've apprised Captain Drago and he's passed it along to the other ships. Chris's grin got even bigger. He doesn't think our shot-up 20-inch lasers are worth fixing. He wants to scrap them and replace them with some of the new 22-inch lasers he's now got coming out of the yard armory. That ought to make you Navy types happy, Amanda said. You may not like business people, but you sure like the toys they make for you. No, Amanda. We like staying alive, which the weapons made by the industrial base does for us. Same thing, Amanda said. Very different, Chris countered. Before you two get into a cat fight, and may I point out, we now have cat allies to do that for us. May we take our leave, Jacques said, standing. Unless there's something else? Only other thing I've got is a rather short and cryptic message from Pipra Strongarm. You may remember her as the woman I left in charge of new enterprises, Chris said. What's her problem? Amanda asked. She didn't say. She did say that she needed to meet me as soon as I got in, even said she wanted to be ahead of Admiral Benson. But not why, Jacques said, rubbing his chin in thought. No explanation. You going to give her the honor of first meeting? She's got my curiosity up. I might put someone else last in line just for giving me that I got a secret and I won't tell kind of treatment, but I trust Pipra. If you trust her, you have to go with that trust. Amanda said. The two left, leaving Chris to wade through production reports from everywhere about everything. The good news was that there was a lot of it. Kitano reported herself happy that the new squadrons were training up well since the first exercise, a quick trip to the moon and back. Their latest run out to the closest ice giant had been 4.0. Well, that was good to hear assuming every alien ship in the galaxy wasn't standing in line to jump down her throat, she might have a fighting chance. And if they are, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. 61. They made orbit, and as promised, the Wasp Hornet went directly into Benson's yard. The Royal Connie was assigned to the Musashi docks, the intrepid bulwark was directed to the Yamato Yard, and the Congress Endeavor barely made it into the Portsmouth Yard. They only wanted one ship to a yard until they figured out if it was one ship or two they had. Chris had signaled that she would move her flag to the Princess Royal and was on her way there when Pipra intercepted her. We've got to talk. You're talking, Chris said. I'm listening. We found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I take it that's a metaphor? <laughs> what are you really telling me? When we got here, you pointed out, and you were quite right at the time, that there is nothing here that we could ship back to human space and make a dime off of. The transportation costs alone would eat up any profit, Chris said. Well, we found something light enough and worth enough that we can make all our fortune shipping it back there, assuming that they don't synthesize it or start growing it as soon as they get a good look at our first cargo. Chris slowly came to a halt. This could be a game changer, assuming she could ever get Pipra to spill what it was. Okay, what is in this pot of yours? It's a plant, Pipra said. We found it on their south continent in a river. Can you believe it? It can uproot itself and move, really move, like scoot out of the way of some hungry fish. A plant, Chris said incredulously, that can move and has sensors. At least it can sense a fish moving toward it and run away. That sounds like an animal. No, it's a plant. It does that photosynthesis thing. <laughs> Boy, does it ever. It can store up energy like nothing we've ever seen before. And when its mitochondria start burning that energy, it can pull its roots up and take off upstream or wherever it wants to go with a kind of speed that leaves most fish behind. Does it have a brain? We don't think so. It seems to react more than act, Pipra said, but not confidently. Any scientists who can get their hands on some of this are in it up to their ears. 
This is going to be worth megatrillions. Chris closed her eyes. She kept hearing this was a game changer and worth money, but she wasn't hearing a whole lot of why. How does it work? Chris demanded. Pipra made a face. We're working on that. There are flying fish and a bat-like thing that can move fast enough to catch this plant and also have the stomach enzymes necessary to use it. So it's complex. Complex as hell. And people are going to want to pay money for this because, Chris said, waving her arms vaguely. Pippa looked at Chris like she was a particularly dumb three-year-old. She started to open her mouth, then seemed to think better of it. A moment later, she finally said, You use nanos, don't you? Lots of them. I've never met a soldier that didn't like their nano scouts, Pipra said. <laughs> it can save your butt. But they don't have much endurance, not enough power. Right, Chris agreed. And you want to recover them, right? Right. But if a wind comes up, they might not have enough power to fly back to you. Yes, then you lose them, and commanders and budget folks get very cranky. Speaking of which, I'm getting very cranky. Yes, okay. Now, assume that your nano has one of these mitochondria powering it. A light went off inside Chris's head. Pipra went on. Marines gobble down candy bars before a fight. It gives them energy. Now, what if we could give them a candy bar with this stuff inside? Would it work? Again, Pipra made a face. If we can figure out what the flying fish and bats have in their bellies that allow them to access the full power of this stuff, yes, maybe. How close are we to making this work? Pipra shrugged. Six months, six years? Very likely not six weeks or 16 years. Chris made a face. So we're talking raw science with lots of unknowns. And we're dealing with people on one end. But nanos don't have civil rights, Chris said. But there are a lot of people that wouldn't want weeds or spiders running around with this kind of strength. This could be the invasive species from hell, Pipra said. I suspect that a lot of people won't want this anywhere near them. Ouch, Chris said, seeing the downside for the first time. Most of our research is taking place on a new lab on the moon. Who paid for it? We all did. And how much will it take away from the defense effort? Chris demanded. Not a lot, Pipra answered vaguely. Listen, you said the first day we were here that no one cared if we lived or died, so long as we died hard and the aliens figured we belonged here. Well, some of the scientists have pointed out that our DNA won't pass the smell test if the aliens do any checking. That thought has crossed my mind, Chris admitted. Now we have something on this planet that humanity needs, really needs, and we really don't want the aliens to get their hands on this stuff, assuming they'd look before they rape this planet down to the bare rock. Yes, Chris said feeling like the word hardly carried enough meaning for the job. So I invested your money in this. Chris nodded, thinking hard and fast. I think you did good. Then she changed the subject to her own concerns. By the way, have you hired a lot of Alwyns? Lots of them. Chris, our consumer products are catching on like a house of fire. They love our microwave ovens, down south, our solar-powered riverboats are selling just as fast as we can deliver them. That's what they're using to troll up this plant. Everything is changing. Damn right it is. Some Alwyns don't like it, Chris reminded Pipra. They can disagree with it all they want, but they better get out of the road. We are coming through. No doubt, Chris said. Are we done? Pretty much. I hear your ships got shot up pretty bad. We've got a decent supply of smart metal that should be good for repairs. We're also building our own reactors and lasers. Twenty-two inchers, I understand. Pipra grinned. <laughs> you bet they are. The businesswoman left to get about her business. Chris turned back to her walk on the Princess Royal. For Pipra, business was business. For Chris, it was complicated. 
She had two cultures she needed to bring together in harmony. No, make that three. She couldn't forget the felines. She might have a good job for them. She was lost in thought and almost to the P. Royal when an ensign ran up to her. Admiral Kitano sends her respects and requests your presence on the flag bridge immediately, ma'am. Nellie, Chris said. I'm in the dark about this as much as you. Chris began walking briskly. 62. Rear Admiral Kitano was waiting for Chris in her own day cabin, which looked very much like a flag bridge at the moment. The place looked downright homey. It had a wooden desk, just like on the Wasp, only its carvings looked like angels rather than Greek pillars. It had several sofas and armchairs. These were in a lovely royal blue rather than the Wasp's earth tones. Kitana wasn't seated at any of them, but stood before one of several large screens. You didn't rob the chief's mess for the screens, did you? Chris asked. I wouldn't dare. These are all local production. Among hard-working Alwyns, 60-inch screens are catching on. I got half of the first production. Chris went to stand by her subordinate. The screen showed the Alwa system in the middle and jumps covering a dozen systems out. Two were flashing red. Is there a problem? Chris asked. No and yes, or maybe yes. <laughs> Do you want the good news or the bad news first, Admiral? Make it Chris among admirals. And I'm Ember, Kitano said. And we are faced with what looks like incoming reinforcements headed for Alpha Jump. That's nice, but also headed for Alpha is something else. Does this something else have some substance? It just jumped into that red system farthest out. Six, I think. But if we're right, if it's going fast enough and puts on some turns, its next jump takes it to our system. Chris frowned. You know about what we found when we caught up with Samson and her mutineers. It's a big report, Chris. Did I skim over something I shouldn't have? Some of the alien warships from the mothership we first blew away put on some speed and revolutions and didn't try to slow down until they were quite a ways from here. I don't know if what they did was common knowledge or just something they stumbled across. It looks to be developing into common knowledge, Chris. A week ago, we had a ship jump into a system five out from our beta jump. It built up speed crossing the system and hit the jump at close to 800,000 clicks an hour. What did it do here? It never got here, Amber said. It must have missed the jump. You know how the normal jumps do wiggles? We figure it zigged out of their way and they went flying past it. I wonder if they had enough fuel to slow down, Chris said. We don't think they did, not if it was like the fast movers they used against us last time. Chris mulled that over for a bit. So they sent a fast mover on what can only be a suicide mission, and it killed itself with nothing to show for it. It looks that way. Now we've got another one incoming. I don't think we can expect to be that lucky again. Admiral, please get two 22-inch frigates moving toward both of your jump points. You think we can shoot it down? We better be able to, because if we don't, I suspect it intends to make one hell of a hole in the planet below. 63. Several hours later, Jack had rejoined Chris on the new flag bridge aboard the Princess Royal. He'd brought their private gear. Amanda and Jacques, Penny and Massau, sat around the conference table with Professor Lebeau and Admiral Catano. Reinforcements were arriving. The first ship through was the George Washington with Rear Admiral Yi of Earth. It was a 22-inch frigate and led the Abraham Lincoln, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the John F. Kennedy. Our problems have even old Earth rearming, Jack observed. With frigates, Jack, Chris pointed out. They're cheaper and their smaller crews cost less come payday. It's still nice, Penny said. I'll take any help we can get, Admiral Kitano muttered. Next up, we have the Lenin, Khrushchev, Bismarck, and Frederick the Great, Kitano reported. Do they have the Lenin and the George Washington in the same squadron? Amanda said. I thought those groups didn't like each other. The bigger reach, Nellie said, 
is the Kennedy with the Khrushchev. The two men almost blew up old Earth during the first atomic crisis. I am told this class is made up of great war leaders or peacemakers. Well, they didn't blow up Earth and we got to be here, Chris said. I'll put those two down as peacemakers. Chris, Chief Benny is having a problem with these ships. What kind of problem? Chris asked. Haven't I exhausted my supply of new problems yet for this month? She managed not to whine aloud. The radar image he gets off these ships is nowhere near as large as his mass density detector says it should be. His laser bounce from them is even less. Our gravity detector says there's a good 50,000 tons of ship out there. The reactors are what you'd expect, but the radar bounce is more like a 15,000-ton corvette, and the laser reflection is more like a 5,000-ton schooner. Chris eyed her staff. She got a lot of blank looks in return. I guess old Earth's dog may have taught itself some new tricks, she said. Nellie went on. The next division is led by the Charles de Gaulle. There's another Churchill, Clemenceau, and King George V. They're all 22 inches. Nice, very nice, Jack said. Get your history book ready for this one, Admiral Kitano said. Admiral Yamamoto, Chairman Mao Zedong, Admiral Togo, and Sun Tzu, all 22 inches again. No, Nellie, we don't want a history lesson, Chris told her computer as it began a dissertation on who these ships were named for. Earth can name their ships after anyone they want. Just so long as we get them to fight with us, it's all very fine by me. But Chris, a lot of these people were at each other's throats. That was 400 years ago, Jacques said. A lot can change in 400 years. Unless you've got an enlightened one passing down the same old, same old, Chris said. Yes, came from everyone present. Leading off the next division is the Nelson Mandela, followed by the Shaka Zulu, the Simon Bolivar, and the Jose de San Martin. I guess we know who paid for them, Amanda said. Here comes the last division, Kitano reported. Julius Caesar, Alexander, Saladin, and Genghis Khan. Behind them are a dozen merchant ships named Apple Blossom, Cherry Blossom, Pear Blossom, and the like. Lots of flowers. Oh, and what looks like two more stations. At least that's what I hope Shanghai and Plymouth mean when you put the names on huge ships. Chris stood and walked over to examine the board with her order of battle. Of the 34 that had sailed out to meet the enemy in the last battle, 26 were ready to answer bells and get underway. There were seven more in dock. Maybe four could be made battle-ready in a few days. It was anyone's guess when the Hornet, Constellation, Royal, and Bulwark might sail again, if they ever did. Admiral Kitano had trained up another 32. They were drilled and ready. The 24 that Earth had just provided would need to adopt to Alwa battle methods and be put through a few shakedown cruises. With luck, the enemy would give them the time they needed. Chris really did have a fleet now. 82, maybe 85 frigates almost triple what she'd had the last time the aliens attacked. Of course, at least three times as many aliens were likely to come at them. The screams of the old woman echoed in Chris's mind. All of them are coming for us. Jacques, how many is all of the alien base ships? We're studying the writing on the wall, Chris. As best we can tell, there are at least 30 of them. There are some that seem to have left only one memorial and pile of heads. If they are still out there and come calling, there might be as many as fifty. Chris shook her head. We'll worry about them later. Just now we have this other problem. Fast movers. Let's see how we handle them. 64. Chris studied the screens with Kitano. This was a Navy problem. The civilians stayed at the conference table, even Penny and Masao. The feline slipped in and settled down on stools in the corner. Chris didn't object. They'd come to see what the humans could do. She'd give them a show before she took them out to meet the Alwyns. The cats might like the ostriches, assuming they didn't try to eat each other. Admiral Kitano spoke first. 
We've sent warnings through Jump Point Alpha telling the reinforcements that they might have something following them through, with a high-speed vector on the boat and unable to steer clear of them. Admiral Yi is taking his ship down a bit below the planetary plane and slowing them at 1.25 Gs. Except for those two, Chris pointed out. Yes, the Saladin and the Genghis Khan are decelerating at 3.5 Gs and are rising a bit above the direct exit from the jump. They've got those new 22-inch lasers with a range close to 200,000 clicks. If they can anchor some three or 400,000 clicks from the jump, they'll be in position to take solid shots at our fast visitors for a long, long time. And the ships you sent up from here? I've got four of the 22-inch frigates of the Ghost Division headed out, Phantom and Voodoo to Alpha, Banshee and Damon to Beta. But they've got a ways to go. When do you expect our hostels? I hate to say it, but your guess is as good as mine. They don't maintain a constant acceleration. The report on jump activity will likely arrive after they do, assuming they don't miss the jump point and not show up at all. Your best guess? Any time from five minutes ago to an hour from now. They could be later. Obviously, they weren't earlier. Nellie, do you have an opinion? No, Admiral. The Admiral's guess is as good as mine. Smart computer, Massau was heard to whisper. May I get you some coffee? Jacques asked. Do you want some coffee? Chris asked the anthropologist right back, arching an eyebrow. I would. Thank you so very much, Admiral, and I do believe Amanda would as well. Me too, Penny put in. Zara, would you and your Admiral like some? May we have some of that other dark, warm liquid? Chocolate? Yes, please. Get me some hot water for tea, Chris said. Please bring a few bags of that relaxing kind. Me too, Jack said. Massau, would you lend me a hand? I'm going to need a pack mule to haul all this, Jacques said. Of course, since you ask me so kindly, the Musashi officer said, smiling. Oops, Amanda said. And he calls himself an anthropologist? Maybe I'm just a little bit worried and off my game, Jacques said, as he opened the door for his putative pack mule and intelligence lieutenant. No sooner had he closed the door than the screens lit up. No doubt what was now showing up had taken place hours ago. That made it no less nail-biting. A bright blip shot out of Jump Point Beta. The Saladin and Genghis Khan were still breaking, their bows with six 22-inch lasers aimed at the Jump Point. However, the alien raider was moving fast, some 600,000 clicks an hour and accelerating at close to 3.5 Gs. It was also spawning bullets, lots of bullets. Were they just iron slugs or atomics? No way to tell from here. It seemed like forever, but it couldn't have been more than a minute before the two Earth ships opened fire. Their first shots missed. The alien was accelerating and jinking. They'd learned something from watching Chris's fights. The ship was a haze on the screen as it went up first, then down, then right, then right, and finally left. The Earth ships fired, then fired, then fired again. They must have fired their forward battery empty because it looked like they paused, cut deceleration, then flipped ship and started firing their aft battery. One of those must have scored a hit because the alien's vector went off hard and long to the right, and it held its course. Lasers from both ships transfixed it before it could make corrections and get back into a jinking pattern. Where a ship had been was now only a quickly gone cloud of hot gas. The Saladin and Genghis Khan took 15 seconds to finish recharging their forward battery, then flipped ship again. They were breaking at 1.15 Gs as they took on the bullets. They were just dumb iron with no engines, no jinking, they were melted to drops of slag quickly under the cuts and slashes of 22-inch lasers. The battle was over before it had barely begun. That was well done, the feline admiral said. But how much more of these will we face, Jack asked. There was no way for this one to report on their success or failure. They likely already have more on the way, Chris said. Ships hurled at us blind, Penny said softly with crews that have no chance to survive. The war had entered a new phase. 
It was now a war of attrition, where the enemy could hit them any time and only had to succeed once to rack up a terrible butcher's bill. We'll have to be on guard every hour of every day, Jack was heard to mutter. 65. Two days later, the old Earth fleet arrived above Alwa. With the Wasp in dock, Chris had no forward lounge to meet with all her skippers. She briefly considered having the Princess Royal grow one, but quickly dropped that idea. Her adjustments to the fraternizing rule was quite enough. No need to reintroduce alcohol to the fleet as well. She'd connected Admiral Benson and Mother MacReady, and in two shakes, Canopus Station now had a very nice officer's club. As Chris crossed the brow to the station, Captains Tausig and Odell met her. She'd asked for them, and they'd obeyed her gentle order. I'm converting four empty supply ships into two fast warships, Chris began without preamble. They'll have four reactors and twelve rocket motors— Design tells me they'll easily maintain three Gs for as long as needed. One will have all eight of the 18-inch lasers we have left. For forward, for aft. Odell, she'll be your new endeavor. Yes, ma'am, the merchant skipper answered evenly but with no visible reaction. The other will have six of the new 22-inch lasers, three forward, three aft. Phil, we'll name her Hornet. And I take it that she's mine? Yes. He nodded. The last two hornets have been good to me and my crew, though I must admit we've been hard on them. They walked in silence for a moment. As many guns for as aft, Phil finally said. What do you intend? I'm sending you two back to Wardhaven with a cargo of information and biologicals that is critical to our survival effort. At least one of you must get back. Ma'am, do we have to take the ships back? Captain Odell asked. I know that me and my crew don't want to leave you. Chris eyed the two. I'll make it a written order if I have to. Yes, your highness, Phil said. He knew how much Chris hated to be highnessed. Yes, Phil. Chris tried to keep her reasonable voice. This is coming from my highness and your admiral and the viceroy all rolled up into one mean package. Both of you saw what's under that damn pyramid. For the first time, we've got a full physiological study of those bastards. We've got their intent in their own words as well. There's something more. The scientists have found a plant here that all sentient civilization needs. And we can't let the aliens destroy it, or worse, let it fall into aliens' hands. Are you going to tell us what this is? Not now. Not until you leave but you will be carrying boffins and cargo that you cannot let the aliens capture. We've already had this discussion, Phil said. No doubt you've had the same one with her, he said, nodding at Captain Odell. If worse comes to worse, they don't get our ship. They get an expanding ball of gas. That's why I'm sending you two, Chris said. Will we be taking any other people? Odell asked. Chris grimaced. If we have space, I guess we could allow some. Likely, we wouldn't have space enough for everyone who wanted to go. We could hold a lottery for them. Do you really want to send back those who want to go back enough that they'd risk this passage? Phil asked. They wouldn't likely be your best friends. Chris scowled. I need you two to be my ambassadors of goodwill, to tell folks we need more help and we're doing good with what they've sent us. I think we could be that. Odell said. I'm not so sure that the folks who really want out of here would be much help if someone shoved a mic in their face. More likely, they'd grab the first mic they could get their hands on and never let go, Phil said. I may have to rethink sending you with excess passengers, Chris admitted. If we're going to be using the three Gs you mentioned, I'd prefer a light ship, Phil said. Thanks for giving me your thoughts, folks. Always glad to help a long knife out. Phil said with a huge grin. Rear Admiral Yi was waiting for Chris outside the new officers' club. Odell saluted him, but Tausig, being in the presence of a vice admiral, acknowledged him with a nod, then saluted Chris and headed into the club. Chris returned Yi's salute, the OCS cadet she'd been not all that long ago, wondering who was saluting who, 
as Phil and Odell slipped away. I've got good news for you, Admiral, Yi said, handing Chris a package. She opened it to find the flag and shoulder boards of a full four-star admiral. <laughs> You're out of uniform, Yi said with a broad grin. Again, Chris said and sighed. I take it this is still a frocking up? Nothing added to my base pay? She's a long knife she doesn't need the money, was what your king told me. <laughs> that sounds like Grandpa Ray, Chris muttered. Admiral Yi was in earth dress blues. Chris was in dress whites with all her medals and orders. Most were human, but now some were feline. It added quite a bit to her weight. Jack was nowhere in sight, unfortunately. Yi, would you do me the honor of replacing my shoulder boards? Gladly. As he did, he spoke softly for her ears only. There's a major reinforcement fleet building up to ship out here. It's holding for something. Just exactly what that something is, I don't know. And I was specifically told that I didn't want to know, because if I even guessed about it and guessed too close, I would no longer be deployable. So what is your best guess, now that you are deployed? Honestly, I don't know. What I do know is that there are three humongous ships taking shape in orbit over Wardhaven, Pitts Hope, and Savannah. No one can tell you what's in them that makes them need to be so huge, but I can tell you there are Aitichi crawling all over them right beside the humans. He paused to grin at Chris. At least, that is what I hear. Aitichi, Chris said with a raised eyebrow. I swear, the demilitarized zone is more like a transit zone these days. We ship them the specs for smart metal. What they paid for it is likely what's going on around those three monster ships. But you don't know what that is. Really, Admiral, I haven't a clue. I was told that when it gets here, you'll fall in love with it. But until it's here, they don't want to risk anything's being captured. Well, that's nice to hear, Chris said. Now... Want to tell me why our radar and lasers are being so attenuated when they sweep your ships? Oh, that's a surprise of our own. I'm surprised you didn't ask me on the way in. If it's a secret surprise, would you want it on the radio? Right, well, quantum computers have been slowing down itty-bitty bits of light for years to speed up their computing. Ever wondered if we could slow down laser beams, spread them around, and maybe send them back the way they came? The thought has crossed my mind, Chris said. I understand the small quanta of light in computing are a whole lot more manageable than an 18-inch laser beam. That's been the thinking for centuries, but back on Earth, we've had some of our best research centers and universities working on the concept. You know, not all the smart people are out on the rim, no matter what you've heard. Chris knew that the Rim Worlds prided themselves on their lead in most scientific and technological advances for the last hundred years or so. She'd never visited Earth and never had a taste of its chauvinism. Hopefully the Admiral would not be a problem, but he was still talking. We made a major breakthrough last year, just as we were designing this class of warships. My command is coated with hundred-millimeter-thick, specially doped and grown crystals— once we go to Defensive Condition 5, our whole hull is covered with that stuff, and you can't get a laser range finder to locate us, and not a lot of radar will bounce off us. And if one of those bastards you've had trouble with out here should hit us with a laser weapon, you better believe they're going to be in for one hell of a surprise. Interesting, Chris said, trying to stay non-committal. That's wonderful because I'm about to brief you on just how bad it is out there. Worse than us having to save your bacon from a suicide attacks before we even got to Alwa? That wasn't exactly how Chris would have put it, but she tried not to let her irritation seep into her words. That's just the battlefield prep. The Earth Admiral just kept grinning. Well, we came out here looking for a fight. It looks like we came to the right place. Chris could agree with that. <laughs> you most certainly did. 66. A ten hut. Admiral on deck, 
seemed to place a special emphasis on Admiral. This was an officer's club, and as such, honors were neither required nor expected. Still, the entire room was on its feet, even the civilians. Chris didn't stand them at ease, but began the long walk to the front of the room, where Penny and Jack waited for her at a table below four large screens. It might as well have been the forward lounge, but the forward lounge gussied up to be the king's officer's club. The long bar was to Chris's right. Paintings were on the walls and battle flags hung from the ceiling. It was exactly the way the forward lounge had looked to receive the king. The only thing missing were pictures of King Raymond and his old commands. Added were two huge motherships painted above the screens, with bright red slashes through them. Someone was keeping score. The place was a whole lot larger. Each of the 80-plus frigates was represented by its captain, XO, engineering officer, skipper of the Marine Detachment, and science lead. Though most of the scientists were civilians, the new arrivals from Earth all sported a uniformed lieutenant commander in that slot. For the fleet auxiliaries and merchant ships, there were a captain, second officer, and chief engineer, some in Navy uniform, others in merchant marine colors, a few wore rough civilian clothes. Chris was halfway to the front when the applause began. Chris had no idea where it started or why some of the Navy types concluded they could clap their hands at attention, However it began, the applause filled the room. Maybe Chris spotted the origin of the clapping. A table close to hers held Granny Rita, Ada, the chief of ministries for the Alwa colonial government, and several more humans and Elwins. Granny Rita tossed Chris a wink as she kept on clapping. Chris reached her own table. Jack greeted her with a grin and, Congratulations. Chris threw him a smile and turned to face her new team. She took them in as some of them got their first solid look at that damn long knife, who now commanded them and would determine if they lived or died. On her dress whites, they saw not only the shoulder boards of a full admiral, but most of the highest honors their planets could bestow. No doubt they also spotted awards that no human had ever worn before. As you were, Chris said, in a commanding voice that carried. The room fell silent as if a switch had been turned off. The officers were seated at long tables by divisions. Still, many of them had been circulating. No doubt the newcomers wanted the word on how things were out here. No doubt battle-hardened skippers had been passing the word of what the new arrivals would need to do to get ship-shape and up to Alwa sector battle standards. Some officers needed time to scurry back to their seats. Chris waited until the last was seated. Welcome to Alwa. I'm glad you could come. Drew the usual soft chuckle. The first drink is on me. No doubt you new arrivals from Earth have had a chance to taste an Alwa special. It's bloody undrinkable, came from somewhere in the back of the room. It's what we've all been drinking and will drink until they start harvesting the new crops next month on Alwa. Alwa needs defenders, but Alwans were on the ragged edge of survival when we got here. We're staying one step ahead of starvation, planting crops, bringing new lands under cultivation, getting reinforcements, and plowing more land. Chris paused to let that sink in. It wasn't what anyone expected, but it's what we've got. We are making do. She addressed that to the tables with the oldest hands. They rumbled their agreement back. However, tonight we're lucky. Our new allies, the Sasquans, have provided us with a delicious, or so I'm told, beer. The second drink is on the Sasquans. You may call them felines. You may call them tigers. Don't call them kittens to their face. They have long claws. The feline admiral, arms spread wide, claws extended, and her interpreter, stood up and received their own round of applause. It might have been shorter than Chris's, but it sounded much more enthusiastic. I will begin our briefing tonight the way I always do. Old hands may think they can sleep through it, don't. Halfway through, it gets very new and horribly interesting. Chris turned to the screens as they came to life, showing the huge mothership hovering before Pat Ron 10's tiny corvettes. Then the Hellburners did their work.
The view did not end there, but showed the slaughter of the battleships. The screens quickly switched to upfront and personal shots of the two fights the Wasp had been in, first with the three, then the one. As they blinked out, the screens went dark, but quickly showed the green pips on black space as the most recent battle here in Alwa space took place in fast-forward mode. It finished with the gigantic mothership blowing itself to dust. Now we begin the new stuff, Chris said. Somebody wake up whoever is snoring. The room enjoyed the joke. This is the planet we went out to visit the one Commander Pasley and the Endeavor found. It has been sterilized down to the microbe level, Chris said, as a view of the ravaged planet came up. We wondered who did it. My computer hijacked a lander and used it to study the central weight on a temporary elevator that was used to spew all this planet's water and air into space. It didn't originate there. The scene changed. Here is the planet it came from. Notice the battle damage, Chris said, as rock strikes were highlighted in circles and the glass plane came in view. That pyramid was made of stone from the first planet you saw, and yes, it's large enough to stand out from space. The view switched to walk them down the entrance hall of the pyramid and right into the horrors. We think that was the king of the sterilized planet, the king and his entire family. There had been some scuffling, a few coughs in the room. Now it was dead silent. The camera took the viewers for a quick walk down Horror Lane. Here are samples from every planet they sterilized. There are 412 of them, including this one. The view settled on the sole figure from the planet Chris had found and surveyed during the daring voyage of discovery. In the last hundred thousand years, they plundered 412 planets. In the last 200, they wiped out five. In 100,000 years, this vicious plague of space raiders has grown from one ship to at least 30, maybe 50. Chris paused, eyeing the screen. So far, we've killed two of them. Chris turned back to her officers. In the Sasquan system, we found the survivors of the first mothership we blew up. They were licking their wounds, rebuilding themselves, no doubt, before they set out to slaughter the felines. We blew away their attack. She turned back to the screens as they showed the enemy adjusting their deployment from 22 in line ahead to three divisions of seven or eight. To those of you who have fought them, they are becoming more tactically flexible. They learn. We must learn faster. That got a rumble of agreement. Now came the view of dead bodies floating in the blackened-out space station. Rather than surrender, they killed themselves. All except one group. The view showed the old woman and the children, knives at their throats. From off stage, Chris's voice said, Fire! And sleepy darts sprouted in several small arms, legs, and in the old woman's chest. We stopped them from their final act of defiance, but the woman was not grateful. Now the view was of the old woman strapped to a bed. The room listened as she ranted. All the ships will come now that the torch has been sent to them. It is you that will be buried in a flood of ships. We have more ships than you can count. Our women are most fruitful. We will destroy you. The room fell silent as the woman was sedated and lolled back on her pillow. Again, Chris turned back to her officers. What's the old saying? You do a good job at a tough assignment. Your reward is a harder one. We've blown away two of them. It looks like we now get all of them. Chris let her eyes sweep around the room. Here and there, some blanched. One woman took a long pull on her Alwa special. <laughs> Not so bad when you really need a drink, huh? But what she saw most were eyes going hard, lips going tight and determined, warriors putting on their war face. These men and women had volunteered to come all the way across the galaxy to face a tough enemy. That the enemy was mad took nothing away from them, and maybe for some, 
added that extra spice that humans had so often longed for. A fight against terrible odds for all that they loved. Chris forged her next words from hardened steel. I swear that not one more head will be added to that horror show. What say you? Yes, was a primal roar, almost enough to bowl her over. Bowl over a damn long knife. Tomorrow at 1600 hours, the fleet will sail on its first training exercise. Those of you who are new may ask those who have fought my kind of battle what changes you will need to make to your ships between now and then. Vice Admiral Kitano, you will take the fleet out. Without missing a beat, Rear Admiral Katana was on her feet. Aye, aye, Admiral. May I ask why you aren't taking the fleet out, ma'am? I've got a battle dirt side with the Alwa Association of Associations, Chris said. So I'll have to let you have all the fun. By the way, I've got some shoulder boards you may want to borrow. Chris went on before Katano could react. I'm authorized to promote three vice admirals, Vice Admiral Katano is the first. No doubt the rumor mill will tell you who the next two are well before I cut the orders in three days, after I get back from the fun and games on Alwa. Chris left them laughing. 67. Getting a meeting with the Association of Associations was never an easy process, of late, it had gotten nearly impossible for anyone to agree on anything, even to meet. Chris found she'd have to wait for two days for the association to assemble. After one day of going over food production reports that looked good, and incidents reports of Alwa on Alwa blood, and even Alwa on human attacks, Chris decided she knew all she needed to know. That evening, Jack drove her to Joe's Paradise Cove in time for supper. Next morning, they sat on the beach, feeling the warm sun on their bare skin, and stared at the ever-the-same, ever-changing ocean. So much has changed since we first came here, Chris muttered. Jack nodded. We've lost a lot of clothes since that first time, he said with a sort of leer. Do you still love me? Chris asked. Now Jack got serious. You mean, with you and me going about our jobs all day long and sometimes into the night, have I somehow forgotten how much love I have for you? Chris felt vulnerable, almost little girlish, as she admitted, yes. Jack leaned over, enveloped her in his arms, and kissed her, seriously kissed her. One thing led to another, and a long while later, Chris found herself looking up at Jack and him looking down at her. Should I take that as a yes? You still love me? If you have any doubt about it, let me say, yes, I really do love you. And nothing is ever going to change that. Chris looked into his eyes and saw reflected back at her a love that was eternal. I promise you, Jack, someday we are going to have a job. Me in one office, you in the next one. We'll have lunch together every noon and supper at night. <laughs> Maybe we'll even have a little one to feed French fries to. That would be nice, Jack admitted. But that is not a promise I will hold you to, Chris Longknife. You and I both know we go where we are sent. You will not have to hold me to that promise. I will hold myself to it. No one, not even Grandpa, his royal ass majesty, will keep me from that job. He kissed her, and they began to make love slowly this time. There was nothing in the galaxy but the two of them, at least for a little while. 68. The Association of Associations was to meet at noon. Chris was there well ahead of time. The plaza where the Alwyns met was open, as was necessary to accommodate their endless shuffling about, Chris had two tables set up. At one, she held center place with Jack to her right and Granny Rita and Ada seated in comfortable chairs of smart metal to her left. The other table was shared by the two felines with four ostriches from the south. Again, smart metal adapted itself nicely to allow the two cats stools that let their tails twitch as they eyed the birds not too obviously as prey. 
the ostriches had a kind of nest for each of them. They sat there as the rooster strutted in, putting on minor displays and, in general, waiting for the acting pro-tem leader. It had been years since they'd actually elected someone to call them to order. Now they passed the lead position from one to another, according to some plan Granny Rita confessed she could not decipher. Straight Tongue and his crew from the Alwa's Sharp Eye View Network arrived a bit after Chris. Their cameras today were much smaller than the ones Chris had first been interviewed with. The mic the producer pinned to Chris's shirt was downright dinky compared to what Chris had talked into a few months before. Things were changing on Alwa. That was a problem for some and a joy for others. Whoever the leader was, he finally crowed and things got as quiet as a meeting of Alwyn roosters ever gets. Behind her, straight tongue talked into his mic. Nellie translated. The heavy one, Viceroy for her crowing leader, Chris Longknife, crowing leader in her own right, has petitioned to speak before the Association of Associations. We are bringing it to you live. My translator is working fine, Chris. You talk to the humans, I'll cover the birds. As Chris stood, two marines ushered in a cylinder. Doc Mead and Medical Whites followed right behind them. I have showed you the battle that saved your planet, Chris began. A large white wall behind the speaker showed a hologram of the destruction of the first mothership. My feed of the battle is going out live and in high def through the network, Nellie reported. You know that we, heavy ones, and many of your own, fought the next alien mothership that came to ravage your planet. Now the picture changed to show ostriches manning lasers, humans, ostriches, and roosters working together to launch a hellburner, and the second mothership blowing itself up. I have found the aliens' homeworld. I have found their holiest of holies. I have walked it with my own feet and seen what they crow about. The picture changed to show the contents of the pyramid. Here they bring one sample of the people of every planet they plunder. Here they bring a pile of heads. That is all that remains of the life on 412 planets. Around Chris, the roosters came to a dead halt. Not one moved. Not one made a sound. All looked at the wall and the pictures on it. They said they didn't really believe what they didn't see with their own eyes. From the looks of what Chris was seeing on them, some Alwyns were making the connection. If the sight of what they put in their holiest of holies is not enough, I have an alien to crow to you here. Now, Dr. Mead. The cylinder folded back to show a bed. The gray-haired woman slept on it. I remind viewers, was whispered by straight tongue, that the aliens look exactly like the heavy people who have lived among us since our grandfather's times. However, they are very different. I am told that the two cannot mate and bear an egg. Awaken her, Chris ordered. Doc Mead did something with her instruments and the woman stirred. The doctor did more and the woman rolled over and sat up on the edge of the bed. Her eyes widened as she took in the view. Vermin! You are all vermin, she shouted. Nellie translated for everyone present and watching over the net. I present you with an alliance of three sentient races, Chris said evenly, as Nellie translated in Bug-Eyed Monster. They say to one and all that you will not add their heads to your house of horrors beneath that pyramid. You are vermin, the woman spat. Chris, the network is getting all this and my translation. Good, Nellie. You are all nothing but shit-eating vermin and you will all die. The woman stormed on. The Enlightened One has sent the torch to all the ships. Together we are more numerous than the stars. Our women are fruitful. We bear many warriors and workers. We will drown you in your own blood and no one will ever remember your name. The woman was off her bed now and strutting around the plaza. Before her, roosters in her way got out of it. Those not stood stark still. Chris, there's a risk these damn Alwyns will surrender right here and now to her, Granny Rita said on Nellie Net. 
Chris stepped out to face the alien woman, almost chest to chest. The ostriches will like that. I have fought you five times, Chris said curtly as Nellie translated for all. Five times I have destroyed your people. Rather than face me, your so-called great enlightened one took poison. You were ready to kill yourself once you had roared your empty threats at me. Chris turned her back on the woman and faced the roosters. You say you will drown us in our blood, but we have blown your ships to gas. It is you who have no one to remember you ever lived. The woman screamed. Chris whirled to find the alien charging her arms out, fingers grasping for Chris's throat. Two pops sounded, and two sleepy darts appeared in the side of the woman facing Jack. He held his service automatic in the proper two-handed stance. The woman collapsed face first into the dirt of the plaza. She skidded to a halt with her arms still out, fingers twitching as if they might still clutch Chris's throat. Chris turned around slowly, addressing her words to the association. Three cameras were carrying this, three much smaller ones. That is your enemy, Chris shouted. Will you cower before the likes of her? Or will you fight with me? You must decide. Chris paused. No, I am wrong. You may not cower before her. To her, you are only something to kill. Will you line up to fight with me? Or will you line up to be slaughtered like chicks before her and those like her? Chris returned to her seat. One of the roosters shouted, The association has a proposal before it. Yes, it is from a heavy one, but it is a proposal. I call for a vote. We must discuss this, the pro tem said. What is there to discuss? With her, we fight. With this monster, we die. I call for a vote. More voices were raised calling for the vote. I've never seen this before, Granny Rita said on net. There's no movement. There is no talking among themselves. They are just standing there alone and calling for a vote. The times they are a-changing, Chris answered. The vote was taken. It was unanimous. Another first. Even Straight Tongue remarked on that. 69. Chris remembered all too well from her days following father around on the campaign stump that the meeting was never over when it finished. There were interviews to give. Chris promised Straight Tongue that the heavy people would fight for the Alwyns like a son hunted with his father, like a younger brother hunted at his older brother's side. She was none too sure the analogy was going in the right direction, but it pleased the Alwyns around her. Zara introduced her admiral to the sharp eye viewers, and in a way introduced her to Chris. Admiral Furza says we will fight beside you to the last drop of our blood. So saying, the admiral raised her right fist to the camera and used a claw on her left hand to draw blood. The Alwyn seemed half impressed, half startled by the gesture. Chris was in dress whites with long sleeves, so sharing blood was out. None of the roosters stepped forward to offer their arm. Finally, one of the ostriches offered his arm. He pecked it until blood flowed and held it out so the two species could mingle their blood. I didn't see that one coming, Granny Rita said, coming up beside Chris. You weren't the only one, Chris agreed. Doc Mead came forward to slap a bandage on both cuts. She had a carefully neutral look on her face, but Chris could almost hear the mother's voice scolding, Children! The doc did get close to Chris's ear. You're going to have to quit sleepy darting that old woman, especially after I've just woken her from a sedated nap. Her heart can't take much more of this. She gave the performance I expected, Chris said. We shouldn't need that again. Which turned out to be not quite so. With bandaged arm, the ostrich they had flown up on a transport plane for the show presented himself with his spouse. We wish to speak for our association of the slow-flowing river valley. We all wish to invite you to come to speak to us about this war. We have a range we would like to talk about settling some of your heavy people on 
to live among us. We can offer you the entire river valley. We can hunt farther away. If you grow crops there, we can help you. And no doubt they'd love to get some of the consumer items that working for the humans brought. Chris, that valley they are talking about is just a couple of ridgelines over from the valley with the plants, fish, and bats we're not supposed to talk a lot about, Granny Rita put in on Nellie Net. It's just a bit short of the islands full of bird guano that we're shipping up here. If folks don't mind riding down there on those boats, we could get a triangle trade started. Chris offered to come address their association. She asked if she needed to bring the alien. The ostriches glanced over at where she slept fitfully and declined. Everyone saw what we just saw, or will see it on tonight's news, the one with the bandaged arm said. Once is enough, the female beside him assured her. Chris would have loved to escape to the beach with Jack, but the fleet was ready for another sortie. This time it needed its admiral present. Chris excused herself and followed the Marines with the sleeping alien back to the longboat. 70. The wasp was in dockyard hands and likely to stay there for some time. Couldn't you at least have kept the eight ships separate? Benson asked as he reported to Chris upon her return from a hard day dirt side. I had a fight on my hands. Chris pointed out. I needed four patched-together warships more than I needed eight wrecks. Well, while you may have gotten yourself something you could fight, what you did was totally scramble those eight ships' basic matrices. If you ask me, you'd be better off just sucking this metal into a holding tank to use to patch the other ships with human space smart metal. We could start all over again with eight new ships. Say we use our smart metal and pour it around new reactors and 22-inch lasers. I bet Drago would love that. No doubt he would. How long will it take? The yard manager shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine, but for what it's worth, I've already told Amber to get your flag quarters ready on the P-Royal. So it was that Chris found herself again in the comfortable quarters of her flag bridge on the Princess Royal. At the moment, the screens running around her bulkheads showed her new order of battle. With Jack at her side, she studied it. Two divisions of four ships made up a squadron of eight under a commodore. Two squadrons could make a task force under a rear admiral. Two task forces could make up a task fleet of 32 war wagons commanded by one of her new vice admirals. The only who gets what. It looks nice and simple if I go by the numbers, Chris said. I've got 12 squadrons. They fold into three task fleets under three vice admirals. Only which squadrons go into which fleets, Jack said. He had such a wonderful ability to put into words what was nagging at her gut. Chris sighed. I've got four squadrons with combat experience, but their ships are all the old 20-inch frigates. The six squadrons with those nifty new 22-inchers have never been shot at. They have never dodged and weaved the way you have to to survive the way I fight. And who will fight best alongside whom? Jack added. Yeah, do I show some respect for local alliances back home or just dump ships where I think best? I've already done that, merging the Helvetican ships into other squadrons to bring them up to strength. Jack nodded. I'll accept Miyoshi's bet round three. He's still down one. Chris nodded, her mind already racing. I'll need to keep ships grouped by their support ships. Jack nodded. Are you feeling the headache I'm feeling just looking at this? Where'd you hide the painkillers? I'll get you one. Please do. I don't usually complain about cramps. But between this pain in my head and that pain in my belly, I could use something. Going to bite my head off? Have I ever? Nope but the last couple of days have been a bit more of a pain in the ass than usual. In a moment, Jack returned with two capsules and water. The first two vice admirals are easy. I already gave Kitano her third star. Miyoshi is easily my second pick. He's been good to us, Jack said. He didn't have to take us aboard the Mutsu when you called. He's getting his third star because he fought his battle well, not because he saved my head from the chopping block. 
I know. So who gets the third? Hawkins is from Wardhaven. Bethia is from Savannah. Both are battle experienced, but they're both from the U.S., as is Kitano. Do I go with two U.S. task fleet commanders, even though we're only putting up a third of the ships? Who else is there? No one else is battle experienced. Chris nodded, but something told her it wouldn't be that easy. Earth just gave us three squadrons, she pointed out. That's only one squadron shy of a task fleet, and they are all 22 inchers. Chris brought Jack up to date on the new Earth armor. Interesting, if it works, Jack said. Chris started moving squadrons around on her board. If I gave Yi the third star and built a task fleet around the Earth contingent, would that make him happy enough to give up one squadron of 22-inch frigates with their fancy armor? I'd swap in the two 20-inch squadrons from Skanda and Savannah, but Thea would be Rear Admiral commanding that task force. That might work, Jack said. The Earth Battle Fleet would have one battle-tested squadron, and if ye listened to Bethia, he might save himself some time adapting to our way of fighting. Then, if I give Miyoshi both the Musashi squadron of 20 inchers and the Yamato squadron of 22 inchers, we'd have another. And in the New Eden squadron of 22 inchers and the Esperanto and Hispania squadron of 20 inchers, that would give us another well-balanced fleet. And if Kitano had an Earth squadron and the Pitts Hope contingent mounting 22 inchers, you'd be pairing them with the battle-experienced 20 inchers of old Batron 1 and 2, what's left of them, Jack muttered. Chris nodded. Of course, right now, Batron 1 was pretty much the Princess Royal that she was riding in at the moment, and the new Resistance, until Benson worked a miracle of spinning up new ships for the crews that had followed Chris into that hellish alien world and back, Amber's fleet would be a bit short. Chris looked it all over and found it good. Still, before she spoke, she ambled over to her desk and knocked on its wood. That looks good. As good as we're going to get. I don't want to sound unusually optimistic, but it doesn't look like anything can go wrong with this. Later, she wished she'd knocked a whole lot harder. This has been an Audible Studios production of Tenacious, written by Mike Shepard, performed by Dina Perlman, producer Mike Charzik. Copyright 2014 by Mike Mosco. Production copyright 2014 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.